Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein. Copyright 1961 by Robert A. Heinlein. This unabridged recording of the reading of Stranger in a Strange Land was published by arrangement with Spectrum Literary Agency and was produced in 1996 by Blackstone Audiobooks Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audiobooks. This book is read by Christopher Hurt. This book is 438 pages long. The following material appears on the book's dust jacket. Name, Valentine Michael Smith. Ancestry, human. Origin, Mars. Here is Heinlein's masterpiece, the brilliant, spectacular, and incredibly popular novel that grew from a cult favorite to a bestseller to a classic in a few short years. It is the story of Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars who taught humankind grokking and water sharing, and love. Notice, all men, gods, and planets in this story are imaginary. Any coincidence of names is regretted. R.A.H. Dedication for Robert Cornog, Frederick Brown, Philip Jose Farmer. Part 1. His Maculate Origin. Chapter 1. Once upon a time there was a Martian named Valentine Michael Smith. The first human expedition to Mars was selected on the theory that the greatest danger to man was man himself. At that time, eight Terran years after the founding of the first human colony on Luna, an interplanetary trip made by humans had to be made in free-fall orbits. From Terra to Mars, 258 Terran days, the same for return, plus 455 days waiting at Mars while the planets crawled back into positions for the return orbit. Only by refueling at a space station could the envoy make the trip. Once at Mars, she might return, if she did not crash, if water could be found to fill her reaction tanks, if a thousand things did not go wrong. Eight humans, crowded together for almost three Terran years, had better get along much better than humans usually did. An all-male crew was vetoed as unhealthy and unstable. Four married couples was considered optimum, if necessary specialties could be found in such combination. The University of Edinburgh, prime contractor, subcontracted crew selection to the Institute for Social Studies. After discarding volunteers useless through age, health, mentality, training, or temperament, the Institute had 9,000 likely candidates. The skills needed were astrogator, medical doctor, cook, machinist, ship's commander, semantician, chemical engineer, electronics engineer, physicist, geologist, biochemist, biologist, atomics engineer, photographer, hydroponicist, rocketry engineer. There were hundreds of combinations of eight volunteers possessing these skills. There turned up three such combinations of married couples. But in all three cases, the psychodynamicists who evaluated factors for compatibility threw up their hands in horror. The prime contractor suggested lowering the compatibility figure of merit. The Institute offered to return its one dollar fee. The machines continued to review data, changing through deaths, withdrawals, new volunteers. Captain Michael Brandt, MS, Commander, DF Reserve, pilot and veteran at 30 of the moon run, had an inside track at the Institute, someone who looked up for him names of single female volunteers who might, with him, complete a crew, then paired his name with these to run problems through the machines to determine whether a combination would be acceptable. This resulted in his jetting to Australia and proposing marriage to Dr. Winifred Coburn, a spinster nine years his senior. Lights blinked, cards popped out, a crew had been found. Captain Michael Brandt, commanding. Pilot, astrogator, relief cook, relief photographer, rocketry engineer. Dr. Winifred Coburn Brandt, 41, semantician, practical nurse, stores officer, historian. Mr. Francis X. Seney, 28, executive officer, second pilot, astrogator, astrophysicist, photographer. Dr. Olga Kovalik Sini, 29, cook, biochemist, hydroponicist. Dr. Ward Smith, 45, physician and surgeon, biologist. Dr. Mary Jane Lyle Smith, 26, atomics engineer, electronics and power technician. Mr. Sergei Rimsky, 35, 
electronics engineer, chemical engineer, practical machinist, and instrumentation man, cryologist. Mrs. Eleonora Alvarez Rimsky, 32, geologist and selenologist, hydroponicist. The crew had all needed skills, some having been acquired by intensive coaching during the weeks before blastoff. More important, they were mutually compatible. The envoy departed. During the first weeks, her reports were picked up by private listeners. As signals became fainter, they were relayed by Earth's radio satellites. The crew seemed healthy and happy. Ringworm was the worst that Dr. Smith had to cope with. The crew adapted to freefall, and anti-nausea drugs were not needed after the first week. If Captain Brandt had disciplinary problems, he did not report them. The envoy achieved a parking orbit inside the orbit of Phobos and spent two weeks in photographic survey. Then Captain Brandt radioed, We will land at 1200 tomorrow GST, just south of Lake Asoli. No further message was received. Chapter 2 a quarter of an Earth century passed before Mars was again visited by humans. Six years after the envoy went silent, the drone probe Zombie, sponsored by La Société Astronautique Internationale, bridged the void and took up an orbit for the waiting period, then returned. Photographs by the robot vehicle showed a land unattractive by human standards. Her instruments confirmed the thinness and unsuitability of Aryan atmosphere to human life. But the Zombie's pictures showed that the canals were engineering works, and other details were interpreted as ruins of cities. A manned expedition would have been mounted had not World War III intervened. But war and delay resulted in a stronger expedition than that of the lost envoy. Federation ship champion, with an all-male crew of 18 spacemen and carrying 23 male pioneers, made the crossing under Lyle Drive in 19 days. The champion landed south of Lake Soli, as Captain Van Tromp intended to search for the envoy. The second expedition reported daily. Three dispatches were of special interest. The first was, Rocket ship envoy located. No survivors. The second was, Mars is inhabited. The third, Correction to dispatch 23-105. One survivor of envoy located. Chapter 3 Captain Willem van Tromp was a man of humanity. He radioed ahead. My passenger must not be subjected to a public reception. Provide low G shuttle, stretcher and ambulance, and armed guard. He sent his ship surgeon to make sure that Valentine Michael Smith was installed in a suite in Bethesda Medical Center, transferred into a hydraulic bed, and protected from outside contact. Van Tromp went to an extraordinary session of the Federation High Council. As Smith was being lifted into bed, the High Minister for Science was saying testily, Granted, Captain, that your authority as commander of what was nevertheless a scientific expedition gives you the right to order medical service to protect a person temporarily in your charge, I do not see why you now presume to interfere with my department. Why, Smith is a treasure trove of scientific information. I suppose he is, sir. Then why... The science minister turned to the high minister for peace and security. David, will you issue instructions to your people? After all, one can't keep Professor Tiergarten and Dr. Okajima, to mention just two, cooling their heels. The peace minister glanced at Captain Von Tromp. The captain shook his head. Why? demanded the science minister. You admit that he isn't sick? Give the captain a chance, Pierre, the peace minister advised. Well, captain? Smith isn't sick, sir, Captain Von Tromp said. But he isn't well. He has never before been in a one-gravity field. He weighs two and a half times what he is used to, and his muscles aren't up to it. He's not used to earth normal pressure. He's not used to anything, and the strain is too much. Hell's bells, gentlemen. I'm dog-tired myself, and I was born on this planet. The science minister looked contemptuous. If acceleration fatigue is worrying you, let me assure you, my dear captain, that we anticipated that. After all, I've been out myself. I know how it feels. This man, Smith, must... Captain Van Tromp decided that it was time to throw a tantrum. He could excuse it by his own very real fatigue. He felt as if he had just landed on Jupiter. So he interrupted. <laughs> this man Smith, this man. Can't you see that he is not? Eh? Smith is not a man. Huh? Explain yourself, Captain. 
Smith is an intelligent creature with the ancestry of a man, but he is more Martian than man. Until we came along, he had never laid eyes on the man. He thinks like a Martian, feels like a Martian. He's been brought up by a race which has nothing in common with us. They don't even have sex. He's a man by ancestry, a Martian by environment. If you want to drive him crazy and waste that treasure trove, call in your fat-headed professors. Don't give him a chance to get used to this madhouse planet. It's no skin off me. I've done my job. The silence was broken by Secretary General Douglas. And a good job, Captain. If this man or man Martian needs a few days to get adjusted, I'm sure science can wait. So take it easy, Pete. Captain Van Tromp is tired. One thing won't wait, said the Minister for Public Information. Hey, Jock, if we don't show the man from Mars in the stereo tanks pretty shortly, you'll have riots, Mr. Secretary. Hmm. You exaggerate, Jock. Mars stuff in the news, of course. Me decorating the captain and his crew. Tomorrow, I think. Captain Van Trom telling his experiences. After a night's rest, Captain. The minister shook his head. No good, Jock. The public expected them to bring back a real live Martian. Since they didn't, we need Smith and need him badly. Live Martians. Secretary General Douglas turned to Captain Van Tromp. You have movies of Martians? Thousands of feet. There's your answer, Jock. When the live stuff gets thin, trot on the movies. Now, Captain, about extraterritoriality. You say the Martians were not opposed? Well, no, sir. But they were not for it, either. I don't follow you. Captain Van Tromp chewed his lip. Sir, talking with a Martian is like talking with an echo. You don't get argument, but you don't get results. Perhaps you should have brought... What's his name? Your semantician. Or is he waiting outside? Mahmoud, sir. Dr. Mahmoud is not well. Uh, a slight nervous breakdown, sir. Van Tromp reflected that dead drunk was the moral equivalent. Space happy? A little, perhaps. These damned groundhogs. We'll fetch him around when he's feeling himself. I imagine this young man Smith will be of help, too. Perhaps, Van Tromp said doubtfully. This young man Smith was busy staying alive his body unbearably compressed and weakened by the strange shape of space in this unbelievable place, was at last relieved by the softness of the nest in which these others placed him. He dropped the effort of sustaining it and turned his third level to his respiration and heartbeat. He saw that he was about to consume himself. His lungs were beating as hard as they did at home. His heart was racing to distribute the influx, all in an attempt to cope with the squeezing of space. And this, while smothered by a poisonously rich and dangerously hot atmosphere, he took steps. When his heart rate was twenty per minute and respiration almost imperceptible, he watched long enough to be sure that he would not discorporate while his attention was elsewhere. When he was satisfied, he set a portion of his second level on guard and withdrew the rest of himself. It was necessary to review the configurations of these many new events in order to fit them to himself, then cherish and praise them lest they swallow him. Where should he start? When he left home, enfolding these others who were now his nestlings, or at his arrival in this crushed space? He was suddenly assaulted by lights and sound of that arrival, feeling it with mind-shaking pain. No, he was not ready to embrace that configuration. Back, back, back beyond his first sight of these others who were now his own back even before the healing which had followed first grokking that he was not as his nestling brothers, back to the nest itself. None of his thinkings were in earth symbols. Simple English he had freshly learned to speak, less easily than a Hindu used it to trade with a Turk. Smith used English as one might use a code book with tedious and imperfect translation. Now his thoughts abstractions from half a million years of wildly alien culture traveled so far from human experience as to be untranslatable. In the adjoining room, Dr. Thaddeus was playing cribbage with Tom Meacham, Smith's special nurse. Thaddeus had one eye on his dials and meters. When a flickering light changed from 92 pulsations per minute to less than 20, he hurried into Smith's room with Meacham at his heels. The patient floated in the flexible skin of the hydraulic bed. He appeared to be dead. Thaddeus snapped, Get Dr. Nelson, Meacham said. Yes, sir, and added, 
How about shock gear, Doc? Get Dr. Nelson. The nurse rushed out. The intern examined the patient, did not touch him. An older doctor came in, walking with labored awkwardness of a man long in space and not readjusted to high gravity. Well, doctor, patient's respiration, temperature, and pulse dropped suddenly about two minutes ago, sir. What have you done? Nothing, sir. Your instructions? Good. Nelson looked Smith over, studied instruments back of the bed, twins of those in the watch room. Let me know if there is any change. He started to leave. Thaddeus looked startled. But doctor, Nelson said, yes, doctor. What is your diagnosis? Uh, I don't wish to sound off about your patient, sir. I asked for your diagnosis. Very well, sir. Shock. Atypical, perhaps, he hedged. But shock, leading to termination. Nelson nodded. Reasonable. But this isn't a reasonable case. I've seen this patient in this condition a dozen times. Watch. Nelson lifted the patient's arm, let it go. It stayed where he left it. Catalepsy? asked Thaddeus. Call it that if you like. Just keep him from being bothered and call me if there is any change. He replaced Smith's arm. Nelson left. Thaddeus looked at the patient, shook his head, and returned to the watch room. Meacham picked up his cards. Crib? No. Meacham added, Doc, if you ask me, that one is a case for the basket before morning. No one asked you. Go have a cigarette with the guards. I want to think. Meacham shrugged and joined the guards in the corridor. They straightened up, then saw who it was and relaxed. The taller Marine said, What was the excitement? The patient had quintuplets and we were arguing about what to name them. Which one of you monkeys has a butt and a light? The other Marine dug out a pack of cigarettes. How are you for suction? Just middling. Meacham stuck the cigarette in his face. Honest to God, gentlemen, I don't know anything about this patient. What's the idea of these orders about absolutely no women? Is he a sex maniac? All I know is they brought him in from the champion and said he was to have absolute quiet. The champion, the first Marine said. That accounts for it. Accounts for what? It stands to reason. He ain't had any, he ain't seen any, he ain't touched any for months. And he's sick, see? If he was to lay hands on any, they're afraid he'd kill himself. He blinked. I'll bet I would. Smith had been aware of the doctors, but had grokked that their intentions were benign. It was not necessary for the major part of him to be jerked back. At the morning hour, when human nurses slapped patients' faces with cold, wet cloths, Smith returned. He speeded up his heart, increased his respiration, and took note of his surroundings, viewing them with serenity. He looked the room over, noting with praise all details. He was seeing it for the first time, as he had been incapable of enfolding it when he had been brought there. This room was not commonplace to him. There was nothing like it on all Mars, nor did it resemble the wedge-shaped metal compartments of the champion. Having relived the events linking his nest to this place, he was now prepared to accept it, commend it, and in some degree to cherish it. He became aware of another living creature, a granddaddy Longlegs was making a journey down from the ceiling, spinning as it went. Smith watched with delight and wondered if it were a nestling man. Dr. Archer Frame, the intern who had relieved Thaddeus, walked in at that moment. Good morning, he said. How do you feel? Smith examined the question. The first phrase he recognized as a formal sound, requiring no answer. The second was listed in his mind with several translations, if Dr. Nelson used it, it meant one thing. If Captain Van Tromp used it, it was a formal sound. He felt that dismay which so often overtook him in trying to communicate with these creatures, but he forced his body to remain calm and risked an answer. Feel good. Good, the creature echoed. Dr. Nelson will be along in a minute. Feel like breakfast? All symbols were in Smith's vocabulary, but he had trouble believing that he had heard rightly. He knew that he was food, but he did not feel like food, nor had he any warning that he might be selected for such honor. He had not known that the food supply was such that it was necessary to reduce the corporate group. He was filled with mild regret, since there was still so much to grok of new events, but no reluctance. 
but he was excused from the effort of translating an answer by the entrance of Dr. Nelson. The ship's doctor inspected Smith and the array of dials, then turned to Smith. Bowels move? Smith understood this. Nelson always asked it. No. We'll take care of that. But first you eat. Orderly, fetch that tray. Nelson fed him three bites, then required him to hold the spoon and feed himself. He was tiring, but gave him a feeling of gay triumph, for it was his first unassisted action since reaching this oddly distorted space. He cleaned the bowl and remembered to ask, Who is this? so that he could praise his benefactor. What is this, you mean? Nelson answered. It's a synthetic food jelly, and now you know as much as you did before. Finished? All right. Climb out of that bed. Beg pardon? It was an attention symbol which was useful when communication failed. I said get out of there. Stand up. Walk around. Sure, you're weak as a kitten, but you'll never put on muscle floating in that bed. Nelson opened a valve. Water drained out. Smith restrained a feeling of insecurity, knowing that Nelson cherished him. Shortly, he lay on the floor of the bed with the watertight cover wrinkled around him. Nelson added, Dr. Frame, take his other elbow. With Nelson to encourage and both to help, Smith stumbled over the rim of the bed. Steady, now stand up, Nelson directed. Don't be afraid. We'll catch you if necessary. He made the effort and stood alone, a slender young man with underdeveloped muscles and overdeveloped chest. His hair had been cut in the champion and his whiskers removed and inhibited. His most marked feature was his bland, babyish face, set with eyes which would have seemed at home in a man of ninety. He stood alone, trembling slightly, then tried to walk. He managed three shuffling steps and broke into a sunny, childlike smile. Good boy, Nelson applauded. He tried another step, began to tremble, and suddenly collapsed. They barely managed to break his fall. Damn, Nelson fumed. He's gone into another one. Here, help me lift him into bed. No, fill it first. Frame cut off the flow when the skin floated six inches from the top. They lugged him into it, awkwardly, because he had frozen into fetal position. Get a collar pillow under his neck, instructed Nelson. And call me if you need me. We'll walk him again this afternoon. In three months, he'll be swinging through the trees like a monkey. There's nothing really wrong with him. Yes, doctor, Frame answered doubtfully. Oh, yes, when he comes out of it, teach him to use the bathroom. Have the nurse help you. I don't want him to fall. Yes, sir. Um, any particular method? I mean, how? Eh? Show him. He won't understand much that you say, but he's bright as a whip. Smith ate lunch without help. Presently, an orderly came in to remove his tray. The man leaned over. Listen, he said in a low voice. I've got a fat proposition for you. Beg pardon? A deal, a way for you to make money fast and easy. Money? What is money? Never mind the philosophy. Everybody needs money. I'll talk fast because I can't stay long. It's taken a lot of fixing to get me here. I represent peerless features. We'll pay 60000 for your story. And it won't be a bit of trouble to you. We've got the best ghostwriters in the business. You just answer questions. They put it together. He whipped out a paper. Just sign this. Smith accepted the paper, stared at it, upside down. The man muffled an exclamation. Lordy! Don't you read English? Smith understood this enough to answer. No. Well, here, I'll read it. Then you put your thumbprint in the square and I'll witness it. I, the undersigned, Valentine Michael Smith, sometimes known as the Man from Mars, do grant and assign to Peerless Features Limited all in exclusive rights in my true fact story to be titled I Was a Prisoner on Mars in exchange for... Orderly! Dr. Frame was in the door. The paper disappeared into the man's clothes. Coming, sir. I was getting this tray. What were you reading? Nothing. I saw you. This patient is not to be disturbed. They left. Dr. Frame closed the door behind them. Smith lay motionless for an hour, but try as he might, he could not grok it at all. Chapter 4 
Gillian Boardman was a competent nurse, and her hobby was men. She went on duty that day as supervisor of the floor where Smith was. When the grapevine said that the patient in suite K-12 had never seen a woman in his life, she did not believe it. She went to pay a call on the strange patient. She knew of the no female visitors rule, and while she did not consider herself to be a visitor, she sailed past without attempting to use the guarded door. Marines had a stuffy habit of construing orders literally. Instead, she went into the adjacent watch room. Dr. Thaddeus looked up. Well, if it ain't dimples. Hi, honey, what brings you here? This is part of my rounds. What about your patient? Don't worry your head, honey child. He's not your responsibility. See your order book. I read it. I want to look at him. In one word? No. Oh, Tad, don't go regulation. He gazed at his nails. If I let you put your foot inside that door, I'd wind up in Antarctica. I wouldn't want Dr. Nelson even to catch you in this watch room. She stood up. Is Dr. Nelson likely to pop in? Not unless I send for him. He's sleeping off low-G fatigue. Then what's the idea of being so duty-struck? That's all, nurse. Very well, doctor. She added, stinker. Jill, a stuffed shirt, too. He sighed. Still okay for Saturday night? She shrugged. I suppose a girl can't be fussy these days. She went back to her station, picked up the pass key. She was balked, but not beaten, as suite K-12 had a door joining it to the room beyond, a room used as a sitting room when the suite was occupied by a high official. The room was not then in use. She let herself into it. The guards paid no attention, unaware that they had been flanked. She hesitated at the door between the two rooms, feeling the excitement she used to feel when sneaking out of student nurses' quarters. She unlocked it and looked in. The patient was in bed. He looked at her as the door opened. Her first impression was that here was a patient too far gone to care. His lack of expression seemed to show the apathy of the desperately ill. Then she saw that his eyes were alive with interest. She wondered if his face was paralyzed. She assumed her professional manner. Well, how are we today? Feeling better? Smith translated the questions. The inclusion of both of them in the query was confusing. He decided that it might symbolize a wish to cherish and grow close. The second part matched Nelson's speech forms. Yes, he answered. Good. Aside from his odd lack of expression, she saw nothing strange about him. And if women were unknown to him, he was managing to conceal it. Is there anything I can do? She noted that there was no glass on the bedside shelf. May I get you water? Smith spotted at once that this creature was different from the others. He compared what he was seeing with pictures Nelson had shown him on the trip from home to this place, pictures intended to explain a puzzling configuration of this people group. This, then, was woman. He felt both oddly excited and disappointed. He suppressed both in order that he might grok deeply, with such success that Dr. Thaddeus noticed no change in the dials next door. But when he translated the last query, he felt such a surge of emotion that he almost let his heartbeat increase. He caught it and chided himself for an undisciplined nestling. Then he checked his translation. No. He was mistaken. This woman creature had offered him water. It wished to grow closer. With great effort, scrambling for adequate meanings, he attempted to answer with due ceremoniousness. I thank you for water. May you always drink deep. Nurse Boardman looked startled. Why, how sweet. She found a glass, filled it, and handed it to him. He said, you drink. Wonder if he thinks I'm trying to poison him, she asked herself. But there was a compelling quality to his request. She took a sip, whereupon he took one also, after which he seemed content to sink back, as if he had accomplished something important. Jill told herself that, as an adventure, this was a fizzle. She said, Well, if you don't need anything, I must get on with my work. She started for the door. He called out, No. She stopped. Eh? Don't go away. Well, I'll have to go pretty quickly. She came back. 
Is there anything you want? He looked her up and down. You are woman. The question startled Jill Boardman. Her impulse was to answer flippantly, but Smith's grave face and oddly disturbing eyes checked her. She became aware emotionally that the impossible fact about this patient was true. He did not know what a woman was. She answered carefully, Yes, I am a woman. Smith continued to stare. Jill began to be embarrassed, to be looked at by a male she expected, but this was like being examined under a microscope. She stirred. Well, I look like a woman, don't I? I do not know, Smith answered slowly. How does woman look? What makes you woman? Well, for pity's sake. This conversation was further out of hand than any she had had with a male since her twelfth birthday. You don't expect me to take off my clothes and show you. Smith took time to examine these symbols and try to translate them. The first group he could not grok at all. It might be one of those formal sounds these people used. Yet it had been spoken with force, as if it might be a last communication before withdrawal. Perhaps he had so deeply mistaken right conduct in dealing with a woman creature that it might be ready to discorporate. He did not want the woman to die at that moment, even though it was its right and possibly its obligation. The abrupt change from rapport of water ritual to a situation in which a newly won water brother might be considering withdrawal or discorporation would have thrown him into panic had he not been consciously suppressing such disturbance. But he decided that if it died now, he must die at once also. He could not grok it any otherwise, not after giving of water. The second half contained symbols he had encountered before. He grokked imperfectly the intention, but there seemed to be a way to avoid this crisis by acceding to the suggested wish. Perhaps if the woman took its clothes off, neither of them need discorporate. He smiled happily. Please. Jill opened her mouth, closed it. She opened it again. Well, I'll be darned. Smith could grok emotional violence and knew that he had offered a wrong reply. He began to compose his mind for discorporation, savoring and cherishing all that he had been and seen, with a special attention to this woman creature. Then he became aware that the woman was bending over him, and he knew somehow that it was not about to die. It looked into his face. Correct me if I am wrong, it said. But were you asking me to take my clothes off? The inversions and abstractions required careful translation, but Smith managed it. Yes, he answered, hoping that it would not stir up a new crisis. That's what I thought you said. Brother, you aren't ill. The word brother, he considered first. The woman was reminding him that they had been joined in water. He asked the help of his nestlings that he might measure up to whatever this new brother wanted. I am not ill, he agreed. Though I'm darned if I know what is wrong with you. I won't peel down. And I've got to leave. It straightened up and turned toward the side door, then stopped and looked back with a quizzical smile. You might ask me again real prettily under other circumstances. I'm curious to see what I might do. The woman was gone. Smith relaxed and let the room fade away. He felt sober triumph that he had somehow comported himself so that it was not necessary for them to die. But there was much to grok. The woman's last speech had contained symbols new to him, and those which were not new had been arranged in fashions not easily understood. But he was happy that the flavor had been suitable for communication between Water Brothers, although touched with something disturbing and terrifyingly pleasant. He thought about his new brother, the woman creature, and felt odd tingles. The feeling reminded him of the first time he had been allowed to be present at a discorporation, and he felt happy without knowing why. He wished that his brother, Dr. Mahmoud, were here. There was so much to grok, so little to grok from. Jill spent the rest of her watch in a daze. The face of the man from Mars stayed in her mind, and she mulled over the crazy things he had said. No, not crazy. She had done her stint in psychiatric wards and felt certain that his remarks had not been psychotic. She decided that innocent was the term. 
then decided that the word was not adequate. His expression was innocent. His eyes were not. What sort of creature had a face like that? She had once worked in a Catholic hospital. She suddenly saw the face of the man from Mars surrounded by the headdress of a nursing sister, a nun. The idea disturbed her. There was nothing female about Smith's face. She was changing into street clothes when another nurse stuck her head into the locker room. Phone, Jill. Jill accepted the call, sound without vision, while she dressed. Is this Florence Nightingale? A baritone voice asked. Speaking. That you, Ben? The stalwart upholder of the freedom of the press is in town. Little one, are you busy? What do you have in mind? I have in mind buying you a steak, plying you with liquor, and asking you a question. The answer is still no. Not that question. Oh, you know another one? Tell me. Later. I want you softened up first. Real steak? Not syntho? Guaranteed. Stick a fork in it and it will moo. You must be on an expense account, Ben. That's irrelevant and ignoble. How about it? You've talked me into it. Roof on the medical center, ten minutes. She put the suit she had changed into back into her locker and put on a dress kept there for emergencies. It was demure, barely translucent, with bustle and bust pads so subdued that they merely recreated the effect she would have produced wearing nothing. Jill looked at herself with satisfaction and took the bounce tube up to the roof. She was looking for Ben Caxton when the roof orderly touched her arm. There's a car paging you, Miss Boardman, that Talbot saloon. Thanks, Jack. She saw the taxi spotted for takeoff with its door open. She climbed in and was about to hand Ben a backhanded compliment when she saw that he was not inside. The taxi was on automatic. Its door closed and it took to the air, swung out of the circle and sliced across the Potomac. It stopped on a landing flat over Alexandria, and Caxton got in. It took off again. Jill looked him over. My, aren't we important? Since when do you send a robot to pick up your women? He patted her knee and said gently, Reasons, little one. I can't be seen picking you up. Well, and you can't afford to be seen with me, so simmer down. It was necessary. Hmm. Which one of us has leprosy? Both of us, Jill. I'm a newspaperman. I was beginning to think you were something else. And you are a nurse at the hospital where they are holding the man from Mars. Does that make me unfit to meet your mother? Do you need a map, Jill? There are more than a thousand reporters in this area, plus press agents, axe grinders, Winchells, Lippmans, and the stampede that arrived when the champion landed. Every one of them has been trying to interview the man from Mars, and none has succeeded. Do you think it would be smart for us to be seen leaving the hospital together? I don't see that it matters. I'm not the man from Mars. He looked her over. You certainly aren't, but you are going to help me see him, which is why I didn't pick you up. Huh? Ben, you've been out in the sun without your hat. They've got a marine guard around him. So they have. So we talk it over. I don't see what there is to talk about. Later. Let's eat. Now you sound rational. Would your expense account run to the new Mayflower? You are on an expense account, aren't you? Caxton frowned. Jill... I wouldn't risk a restaurant closer than Louisville. It would take this hack two hours to get that far. How about dinner in my apartment? Said the spider to the fly. Ben, I'm too tired to wrestle. Nobody asked you to. King's X. Cross my heart and hope to die. I don't like that much better. If I'm safe with you, I must be slipping. Well, all right. King's X. Caxton punched buttons. The taxi, which had been circling under a hold instruction, woke up and headed for the apartment hotel where Ben lived. He punched a phone number and said to Jill, How much time do you want to get liquored up, Sugarfoot? I'll tell the kitchen to have the steaks ready. Jill considered it. Ben, your mousetrap has a private kitchen. Of sorts, I can grill a steak. I'll grill the steak. Hand me the phone. She gave orders, stopping to make sure that Ben liked endive. The taxi dropped them on the roof, and they went down to his flat. It was old-fashioned. It's one luxury, a live grass lawn in the living room. Jill stopped, slipped off her shoes, stepped barefooted into the living room, and wiggled her toes among the cool green blades. She sighed. My, that feels good. My feet have hurt ever since I entered training. Sit down. No, I want my feet to remember this tomorrow. Suit yourself. He went into his pantry and mixed drinks. Presently she followed and became domestic. Steak was in the package lift. With it were pre-baked potatoes. 
She tossed the salad, handed it to the refrigerator, set up a combination to grill the steak and heat the potatoes, but did not start the cycle. Ben, doesn't this stove have remote control? He studied the setup, flipped a switch. Jill, what would you do if you had to cook over an open fire? I'd do darn well. I was a Girl Scout. How about you, smarty? They went to the living room. Jill sat at his feet, and they applied themselves to martinis. Opposite his chair was a stereovision tank disguised as an aquarium. He switched it on. Guppies and tetras gave way to the face of the well-known Winchell, Augustus Greaves. It can be stated authoritatively, the image was saying, that the man from Mars is being kept under drugs to keep him from disclosing these facts. The administration would find it extremely... Caxton flipped it off. Gus, old boy, he said pleasantly, you don't know a darn thing more than I do. He frowned. Though you might be right about the government keeping him under drugs. No, they aren't, Jill said suddenly. Eh? How's that little one? The man from Mars isn't under hypnotics. Having blurted more than she had meant to, she added, He's got a doctor on continuous watch, but there aren't any orders for sedation. Are you sure? You aren't one of his nurses? No. Uh, matter of fact, there's an order to keep women away from him and some tough marines to make sure of it. Caxton nodded. So I heard. Fact is, you don't know whether they are drugging him or not. Jill bit her lip. She would have to tell on herself to back up what she had said. Ben, you wouldn't give me away. How? Any way at all. Hmm, that covers a lot, but I'll go along. All right, pour me another. He did so. Jill went on. I know they don't have the man from Mars hopped up, because I talked with him. Caxton whistled. I knew it. When I got up this morning, I said to myself, Go see Jill. She's the ace up my sleeve. Honey lamb, have another drink. Have six. Here, take the pitcher. Not so fast. Whatever you like. May I rub your poor tired feet, lady? You are about to be interviewed. How? No, Ben, you promised. You quote me and I'll lose my job. Hmm. How about from a usually reliable source? I'd be scared. Well, are you going to let me die of frustration and eat that steak by yourself? Oh, I'll talk, but you can't use it. Ben kept quiet. Jill described how she had outflanked the guards. He interrupted. Say, could you do that again? Huh? I suppose so, but I won't. It's risky. Well, could you slip me in that way? Look, I'll dress like an electrician, coveralls, union badge, toolkit. You slip me the key, and... No! Huh? Look, baby girl, be reasonable. This is the greatest human interest story since Columbo conned Isabella into hocking her jewels. The only thing that worries me is that I may find another electrician. The only thing that worries me is me, Jill interrupted. To you, it's a story. To me, it's my career. They take away my cap, my pin, and ride me out of town on a rail. Hmm. There is that. There sure is that. Lady, you are about to be offered a bribe. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein Continued Cassette 1, Side 2 Lady, you are about to be offered a bribe. How big? It'll take quite a chunk to keep me in style the rest of my life in Rio. Well, you can't expect me to outbid Associated Press or Reuters. How about a hundred? What do you think I am? We settled that. We're dickering over the price. A hundred and fifty? Look up the number of Associated Press. That's a lamb. Capital ten nine thousand. Jill, will you marry me? That's as high as I can go. She looked startled. What did you say? Will you marry me? Then when they ride you out of town on a rail, I'll be waiting at the city line and take you away from your sordid existence. You'll come back here and cool your toes in my grass, our grass, and forget your ignominy. But you've darn well got to sneak me into that room first. Then you almost sound serious. If I phone for a fair witness, will you repeat that? Caxton sighed. Send for a witness. She stood up. Ben... She said softly, I won't hold you to it. She kissed him. Don't joke about marriage to a spinster. I wasn't joking. I wonder. 
Wipe off the lipstick and I'll tell you everything I know, then we'll consider how you can use it without getting me ridden on that rail. Fair enough? Fair enough. She gave him a detailed account. I'm sure he wasn't drugged. I'm equally sure that he was rational. Although he talked in the oddest fashion and asked the darndest questions, it would be odder still if he hadn't talked oddly. Huh? Jill, we don't know much about Mars, but we do know that Martians are not human. Suppose you were popped into a tribe so far back in the jungle that they had never seen shoes. Would you know the small talk that comes from a lifetime in a culture? That's a mild analogy. The truth is at least 40 million miles, stranger. Jill nodded. I figured that out. That's why I discounted his odd remarks. I'm not dumb. No, you're real bright. For a female. Would you like this martini in your hair? I apologize. Women are smarter than men. That is proved by our whole setup. Gimme. I'll fill it. She accepted peace offerings and went on. Then that order about not letting him see women, it's silly. He's no sex fiend. No doubt they don't want to hand him too many shocks at once. He wasn't shocked. He was just interested. It wasn't like having a man look at me. If you had granted that request for a viewing, you might have had your hands full. I don't think so. I suppose they've told him about male and female. He just wanted to see how women are different. Vive la différence, Caxton answered enthusiastically. Don't be vulgar. Me? I was being reverent. I was giving thanks that I was born human and not Martian. Be serious. I was never more serious. Then be quiet. He wouldn't have given me any trouble. You didn't see his face. I did. What about his face? Jill looked puzzled. Then, have you ever seen an angel? You, cherub? Otherwise not. Well, neither have I. But that is how he looked. He had old, wise eyes and a completely placid face. A face of unearthly innocence. She shivered. Unearthly is the word, Ben answered slowly. I'd like to see him. Then why are they keeping him shut up? He wouldn't hurt a fly. Caxton fitted his fingertips together. Well, they want to protect him. He grew up in Mars' gravity. He's probably weak as a cat. But muscular weakness isn't dangerous. Myasthenia gravis is much worse, and we manage all right with that. They want to keep him from catching things, too. He's like those experimental animals in Notre Dame. He's never been exposed. Sure, sure, no antibodies. But from what I hear around the mess hall, Dr. Nelson, the surgeon and the champion, took care of that on the trip back. Mutual transfusions until he had replaced about half his blood tissue. Can I use that, Jill? That's news. Just don't quote me. They gave him shots for everything but housemaid's knee, too. But then to protect him from infection doesn't take armed guards. Hmm. Jill, I've picked up a few tidbits you may not know. I can't use them because I've got to protect my sources. But I'll tell you, just don't talk. I won't. It's a long story. Want a refill? No, let's start the steak. Where's the button? Right here. Well, push it. Me? You offered to cook dinner. Ben Caxton, I will lie here and starve before I will get up to push a button six inches from your finger. As you wish. He pressed the button. But don't forget who cooked dinner. Now, about Valentine Michael Smith. There is grave doubt as to his right to the name Smith. Huh? Honey, your pal is the first interplanetary bastard of record. The hell you say? Please, be ladylike. You remember anything about the envoy? Four married couples. Two couples were Captain and Mrs. Brandt, Doctor and Mrs. Smith. Your friend with the face of an angel is the son of Mrs. Smith by Captain Brandt. How do they know? And who cares? It's pretty sniveling to dig up scandal after all this time. They're dead. Let them alone. As to how they know. There probably never were eight people more thoroughly measured and typed. Blood typing, RH factor, hair and eye color, all those genetic things. You know more about them than I do. It is certain that Mary Jane Lyle Smith was his mother and Michael Brandt his father. It gives Smith a fine heredity. His father had an IQ of 163, his mother 170, and both were tops in their fields. As to who cares... Ben went on. A lot of people care, and more will once this shapes up. Ever heard of the Lyle Drive? Of course, that's what the champion used. And every spaceship these days. Who invented it? I don't... Wait a minute. You mean she? Hand the lady a cigar. 
Dr. Mary Jane Lyle Smith. She had it worked out before she left, even though development remained to be done. So she applied for basic patents and placed it in trust. Not a non-profit corporation, mind you. Then assigned control and interim income to the Science Foundation. So eventually the government got control. But your friend owns it. It's worth millions, maybe hundreds of millions. I couldn't guess. They brought in dinner. Caxton used ceiling tables to protect his lawn. He lowered one to his chair and another to Japanese height so that Jill could sit on the grass. Tender, he asked. Honorful, she answered. Thanks. Remember, I cooked. Ben, she said after swallowing. How about Smith being, uh, I mean, illegitimate? Can he inherit? He's not illegitimate. Dr. Mary Jane was at Berkeley. California laws deny the concept of bastardy. Same for Captain Brandt, as New Zealand has civilized laws. While in the home state of Dr. Ward Smith, Mary Jane's husband, a child born in wedlock is legitimate come hell or high water. We have here, Jill, a man who is the legitimate child of three parents. Huh? Now wait, Ben, he can't be. I'm not a lawyer, but you sure ain't. Such fictions don't bother a lawyer. Smith is legitimate different ways in different jurisdictions, even though a bastard in fact. So he inherits. Besides that, while his mother was wealthy, his fathers were well-to-do. Brandt plowed most of his scandalous salary as a pilot on the moon run into lunar enterprises. You know how that stuff boomed. They just declared another stock dividend. Brandt had one vice, gambling. But the bloke won regularly and invested that, too. Ward Smith had family money. Smith is heir to both. Phew! That ain't half, honey. Smith is heir to the entire crew. Huh? All eight signed a gentleman adventurer's contract, making them mutually heirs to each other, all of them, and their issue. They did it with care, using as models contracts in the 16th and 17th centuries that had stood up against every effort to break them. These were high-powered people. Among them, they had quite a lot. Happened to include considerable Lunar Enterprises stock, too, besides what Brandt held. Smith might own a controlling interest, or at least a key block. Jill thought about the childlike creature who had made such a touching ceremony of a drink of water and felt sorry for him. Caxton went on. I wish I could sneak a look at the envoy's log. They recovered it, but I doubt if they'll release it. Why not, then? It's a nasty story. I got that much before my informant sobered up. Dr. Ward Smith delivered his wife by cesarean section, and she died on the table. What he did next shows that he knew the score. With the same scalpel, he cut Captain Brandt's throat, then his own. Sorry, hon. Jill shivered. I'm a nurse. I'm immune to such things. You're a liar, and I love you for it. I was on police beat three years, Jill. I never got hardened to it. What happened to the others? If we don't break the bureaucrats loose from that log, we'll never know. And I'm a starry-eyed newsboy who thinks we should. Secrecy begets tyranny. Ben, he might be better off if they gypped him out of his inheritance. He's very, um, uh, unworldly. The exact word, I'm sure. Nor does he need money. The man from Mars will never miss a meal. Any government and a thousand-odd universities and institutions would be delighted to have him as a permanent guest. He'd better sign it over and forget it. It's not that easy. Jill, you know the famous case of General Atomics versus Larkin et al.? Uh, you mean the Larkin decision? I had it in school, same as everybody. What's it got to do with Smith? Think back. The Russians sent the first ship to the moon. It crashed. The United States and Canada combined to send one. It gets back, but leaves nobody on the moon. So while the United States and the Commonwealth are getting set to send a colonizing one under the sponsorship of the Federation, and Russia is mounting the same deal on their own, General Atomics steals a march by boosting one from an island, leased from Ecuador, and their men are there sitting pretty and looking smug when the Federation vessel shows up, followed by the Russian one. So General Atomics, a Swiss corporation, American-controlled, claimed the moon. The Federation couldn't brush them off and grab it. The Russians wouldn't have held still. So the High Court ruled that a corporate person, a mere legal fiction, could not own a planet. The real owners were the men who maintained occupation, Larkin and Associates. So they recognized them as a sovereign nation and took them into the Federation, with melon slicing for those on the inside and concessions to General Atomics and its daughter corporation, Lunar Enterprises. This did not please anybody, and the Federation High Court was not all powerful then, but it was a compromise everybody could swallow. It resulted in rules for colonizing planets, all based on the Larkin decision, and intended to avoid bloodshed. Worked, too. World War III did not result from conflict over space travel and such. 
so the Larkin decision is law and applies to Smith. Jill shook her head. I don't see the connection. Think, Jill. By our laws, Smith is a sovereign nation and sole owner of the planet Mars. Chapter 5 Jill looked round-eyed. Too many martinis, Ben. I would swear you said that patient owns Mars. He does. He occupied it the required period. Smith is the planet Mars, king, president, sole civic body, what you will. If the champion had not left colonists, Smith's claim might have lapsed, but it did. And that continues occupation even though Smith came to Earth. But Smith doesn't have to split with them. They are mere immigrants until he grants them citizenship. Fantastic, but legal. Honey, you see why people are interested in Smith and why the administration is keeping him under a rug? What they are doing isn't legal. Smith is also a citizen of the United States and of the Federation. It's illegal to hold a citizen, even a convicted criminal, incommunicado anywhere in the Federation. Also, it has been an unfriendly act all through history to lock up a visiting monarch, which he is, and not to let him see people, especially the press, meaning me. You still won't sneak me? Huh? You've got me scared silly, Ben. If they had caught me, what would they have done? Mm, nothing rough. Locked you in a padded cell with a certificate signed by three doctors and allowed you mail on alternate leap years. I'm wondering what they're going to do to him. What can they do? Well, he might die from G fatigue, say. You mean murder him? Tut, tut, don't use nasty words. I don't think they will. In the first place, he's a mine of information. In the second place, he's a bridge between us and the only other civilized race we have encountered. How are you on the classics? Ever read H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds? A long time ago in school. Suppose the Martians turn out nasty. They might, and we have no way of guessing how big a club they swing. Smith might be the go-between who could make the first interplanetary war unnecessary. Even if this is unlikely, the administration can't ignore it. The discovery of life on Mars is something that, politically, they haven't figured out yet. Then you think he is safe? For the time being. The Secretary General has to guess right. As you know, his administration is shaky. I don't pay attention to politics. You should. It's barely less important than your own heartbeat. I don't pay attention to that, either. Don't talk when I'm orating. The patchwork majority headed by Douglas could slip apart overnight. Pakistan would bolt at a nervous cough. There would be a vote of no confidence, and Mr. Secretary General Douglas would go back to being a cheap lawyer. The man from Mars can make or break him. Are you going to sneak me in? I'm going to enter a nunnery. Is there more coffee? I'll see. They stood up. Jill stretched and said, Oh, my ancient bones. Never mind coffee, Ben. I've got a hard day tomorrow. Run me home, will you? Or send me home. That's safer. Okay. Though the evening is young. He went into his bedroom came out carrying an object the size of a small cigarette lighter. You won't sneak me in? Cheap, Ben. I want to, but never mind. It is dangerous, and not just to your career. He showed her the object. Will you put a bug on him? Huh? What is it? The greatest boon to spies since the Mickey Finn. A micro-miniaturized recorder. The wire is spring-driven, so it can't be spotted by a snooper circuit. The insides are packed in plastic. You could drop it out of a cab. The power is about as much radioactivity as in a watch dial, but shielded. The wire runs 24 hours, then you slide out a spool and stick in another. The spring is part of the spool. Will it explode? She asked nervously. You could bake it in a cake. Then you've got me scared to go into his room. You can go into the room next door, can't you? I suppose so. This thing has donkey's ears. Fasten the concave side against a wall. Tape will do, and it picks up everything in the room beyond. I'm bound to be noticed if I duck in and out of that room. Ben, his room has a wall in common with a room on another corridor. Will that do? Perfect. You'll do it. Um, give it to me. I'll think it over. Caxton polished it with his handkerchief. Put on your gloves. Why? Possession is good for a vacation behind bars. Use gloves, and don't get caught with it. You think of the nicest things? Want to back out? Jill let out a long breath. No. Good girl. A light blinked. He glanced up. That must be your cab. I rang for it when I went to get this. Oh. Now find my shoes, will you? Don't come to the roof. The less I'm seen with you, the better. 
as you wish. As he straightened up from putting her shoes on, she took his head in both hands and kissed him. Dear Ben, no good can come of this, and I hadn't realized you were a criminal. But you're a good cook as long as I set the combination. I might marry you if I can trap you into proposing again. The offer remains open. Do gangsters marry their malls, or is it frails? She left hurriedly. Jill placed the bug easily. The patient in the room in the next corridor was bedfast. Jill often stopped to gossip. She stuck it against a wall over a closet shelf while chattering about how the maids just never dusted the shelves. Changing spools the next day was easy. The patient was asleep. She woke while Jill was perched on a chair. Jill diverted her with a spicy ward rumor. Jill sent the exposed wire by mail, as the postal system seemed safer than a cloak-and-dagger ruse. But her attempts to insert a third spool... She muffed. She waited for the patient to be asleep, but had just mounted the chair when the patient woke. Oh, hello, Miss Boardman. Jill froze. Hello, Mrs. Fritchley, she managed to answer. Have a nice nap? Fair, the woman answered peevishly. My back aches. I'll rub it. Doesn't help. Why are you always fiddling in my closet? Is something wrong? Jill tried to re-swallow her stomach. Mice. She answered, Mice! Oh, I'll have to have another room. Jill tore the instrument loose and stuffed it into her pocket, jumped down. Now, now, Mrs. Fritchley, I was just looking to see if there were mouse holes. There aren't. You're sure? Quite sure. Now let's rub the back. Easy over. Jill decided to risk the empty room, which was part of K-12, the suite of the man from Mars. She got the pass key only to find the room unlocked, and holding two more Marines, the guard had been doubled. One looked around as she opened the door. Looking for someone? No. Don't sit on the bed, boys, she said crisply. If you need chairs, we'll send for them. The guard got reluctantly up. She left, trying to conceal her trembling. The bug was still in her pocket when she went off duty. She decided to return it to Caxton, once in the air and headed toward Ben's apartment. She breathed easier. She phoned him in flight. Caxton speaking. Jill, Ben, I want to see you. He answered slowly. I don't think it's smart. Ben, I've got to. I'm on my way. Well, okay, if that's how it's got to be. Such enthusiasm. Now look, hon, it isn't that I... Bye. She switched off, calmed down, and decided not to take it out on Ben. They were playing out of their league. At least she was. She should have left politics alone. She felt better when she snuggled into his arms. Ben was such a dear. Maybe she should marry him. When she tried to speak, he put a hand over her mouth, whispered, Don't talk. I may be wired. She nodded, got out the recorder, handed it to him. His eyebrows went up, but he made no comment. Instead, he handed her a copy of the afternoon post. Seen the paper? He said in a natural voice. You might glance at it while I wash up. Thanks. As she took it, he pointed to a column, then left, taking with him the recorder. The column was Ben's own. The Crow's Nest by Ben Caxton Everyone knows that jails and hospitals have one thing in common. They can be very hard to get out of. In some ways, a prisoner is less cut off than a patient. A prisoner can send for his lawyer, demand a fair witness, invoke habeas corpus, and require the jailer to show cause in open court. But it takes only a no-visitors sign ordered by one of the medicine men of our peculiar tribe to consign a hospital patient to oblivion more thoroughly than ever was the man in the iron mask. To be sure, the patient's next of kin cannot be kept out, but the man from Mars seems to have no next of kin. The crew of the ill-fated envoy had few ties on Earth. If the man in the iron mask, pardon me, I mean the man from Mars, has any relative guarding his interests, a few thousand reporters have been unable to verify it. Who speaks for the man from Mars? Who ordered an armed guard placed around him? What is his dread disease that no one may glimpse him nor ask him a question? I address you, Mr. Secretary General. The explanation about physical weakness and G fatigue won't wash. If that were the answer, a 90-pound nurse would do as well as an armed guard. Could this disease be financial in nature? Or, let's say it softly, is it political? There was more of the same. 
Jill could see that Ben was baiting the administration, trying to force them into the open. She felt that Caxton was taking serious risk in challenging the authorities, but she had no notion of the size of the danger, nor what form it might take. She thumbed through the paper. It was loaded with stories on the champion, pictures of Secretary General Douglas pinning medals, interviews with Captain Van Tromp and his brave company, pictures of Martians and Martian cities. There was little about Smith, merely a bulletin that he was improving slowly from the effects of his trip. Ben came out and dropped sheets of onion skin in her lap. Here's another newspaper. He left again. Jill saw that the newspaper was a transcription of what her first wire had picked up. It was marked first voice, second voice, and so on. But Ben had written in names wherever he had been able to make attributions. He had written across the top, all voices are masculine. Most items merely showed that Smith had been fed, washed, massaged, and that he had exercised under supervision of a voice identified as Dr. Nelson, and one marked Second Doctor. One passage had nothing to do with care of the patient. Jill reread it. Dr. Nelson, how are you feeling, boy? Strong enough to talk? Smith, yes. Dr. Nelson, a man wants to talk to you. Smith, pause. Who? Caxton had written, all of Smith's speeches are preceded by pauses. Nelson, this man is our great untranscribable, guttural word, Martian. He is our oldest old one. Will you talk with him? Smith, very long pause. I am great happy. The old one will talk, and I will listen and grow. Nelson, no, no, he wants to ask you questions. Smith, I cannot teach an old one. Nelson, the old one wishes it. Will you let him ask you questions? Smith, yes. Background noises. Nelson, this way, sir. I have Dr. Mahmood standing by to translate. Jill read, new voice. Caxton had scratched this out and written in, Secretary General Douglas, three exclamation points. Secretary General, I won't need him. You say Smith understands English? Nelson, well, yes and no, Your Excellency. He knows a number of words, but as Mahmood says, he doesn't have any cultural context to hang them on. It can be confusing. Secretary General. Oh, we'll get along, I'm sure. When I was a youngster, I hitchhiked all through Brazil without a word of Portuguese when I started. Now, if you will introduce us, then leave us alone. Nelson. Sir, I had better stay with my patient. Secretary General. Really, doctor? I'm afraid I must insist. Sorry. Nelson. And I'm afraid that I must insist. Sorry, sir. Medical ethics. Secretary General, interrupting. As a lawyer, I know something of medical jurisprudence, so don't give me that medical ethics mumbo-jumbo. Did this patient select you? Nelson, not exactly. But, Secretary General, has he had the opportunity to choose physicians? I doubt it. His status is ward of the state. I am acting as next of kin de facto, and you will find de jure as well. I wish to interview him alone. Nelson, long pause, then very stiffly. If you put it that way, Your Excellency... I withdraw from the case. Secretary General, don't take it that way, doctor. I'm not questioning your treatment. But you wouldn't try to keep a mother from seeing her son alone now, would you? Are you afraid I might hurt him? Nelson, no, but... Secretary General, then what is your objection? Come now, introduce us and let's get on with it. The fussing may be upsetting your patient. Nelson, Your Excellency, I will introduce you. Then you must select another doctor for your... ward... Secretary General, I'm sorry, Doctor, I really am. I can't take that as final. We'll discuss it later. Now, if you please. Nelson, step over here, sir. Son, this is the man who wants to see you, our great old one. Smith, untranscribable. Secretary General, what did he say? Nelson, a respectful greeting. Mahmood says it translates... I am only an egg. More or less that, anyway. It's friendly. Son, talk man talk. Smith? Yes. Nelson? And you had better use simple words if I may offer a last advice. Secretary General? Oh, I will. Nelson? Goodbye, Your Excellency. Goodbye, son. Secretary General? Thanks, Doctor. 
See you later. Secretary General continued. How do you feel? Smith. Feel fine. Secretary General. Good. Anything you want, just ask for it. We want you to be happy. Now I have something I want you to do for me. Can you write? Smith. Write. What is write? Secretary General. Well, your thumbprint will do. I want to read a paper to you. This paper has a lot of lawyer talk, but stated simply it says you agree that in leaving Mars you have abandoned, I mean, given up any claims that you may have there. Understand me? You assign them in trust to the government. Smith, no answer. Secretary General, well, let's put it this way. You don't own Mars, do you? Smith, longish pause. I do not understand. Secretary General, hmm, let's try again. You want to stay here, don't you? Smith, I do not know. I was sent by the old ones. Long, untranscribable speech. Sounds like a bullfrog fighting a cat. Secretary General, damn it, they should have taught him more English by now. See here, son, you don't have to worry. Just let me have your thumbprint at the bottom of this page. Let me have your right hand. No, don't twist around that way. Hold still. I'm not going to hurt you. Doctor. Dr. Nelson. Second doctor. Yes, sir. Secretary General. Get Dr. Nelson. Second doctor. Dr. Nelson? But he left, sir. He said you took him off the case. Secretary General. Nelson said that? Damn him. Well, do something. Give him artificial respiration. Give him a shot. Don't just stand there. Can't you see the man is dying? Second doctor. I don't believe there's anything to be done, sir. Just let him alone until he comes out of it. That's what Dr. Nelson always did. Secretary General. Blast Dr. Nelson. The Secretary General's voice did not appear again, nor that of Dr. Nelson. Jill could guess, from gossip she had picked up, that Smith had gone into one of his cataleptiform withdrawals. There were two more entries. One read, No need to whisper, he can't hear you. The other read, Take that tray away. We'll feed him when he comes out of it. Jill was rereading it when Ben reappeared. He had more onion skin sheets, but he did not offer them. Instead, he said, Hungry? Starved. Let's go shoot a cow. He said nothing while they went to the roof and took a taxi, still kept quiet during the flight to Alexandria platform where they switched cabs. Ben picked one with a Baltimore number. Once in the air, he set it for Hagerstown, Maryland, then relaxed. Now we can talk. Ben, why the mystery? Sorry, pretty foots. I don't know that my apartment is bugged, but if I can do it to them, they can do it to me. Likewise, while it isn't likely that a cab signaled from my flat would have an ear in it, still I might have. The special service squads are thorough. But this cab, he patted its cushions. They can't gimmick thousands of cabs. One picked at random should be safe. Jill shivered. Ben, you don't think they would... She let it trail off. Don't I now? You saw my column. I filed that copy nine hours ago. You think the administration will let me kick it in the stomach without kicking back? But you have always opposed this administration. That's okay. This is different. I have accused them of holding a political prisoner. Jill, a government is a living organism. Like every living thing, its prime characteristic is the instinct to survive. You hit it, it fights back. This time I've really hit it, he added. But I shouldn't have involved you. I'm not afraid. Not since I turned that gadget back to you. You're associated with me. If things get rough, that could be enough. Jill shut up. The notion that she, who had never experienced worse than a spanking as a child and an occasional harsh word as an adult, could be in danger, was hard to believe. As a nurse, she had seen the consequences of ruthlessness, but it could not happen to her. Their cab was circling for a landing before she broke the moody silence. Then, suppose this patient dies. What happens? Huh? He frowned. That's a good question. If there are no other questions, class is dismissed. Don't be funny. Hmm. Jill, I've been awake nights trying to answer that. Here are the best answers I have. If Smith dies, his claim to Mars vanishes. Probably the group the champion left on Mars starts a new claim, and almost certainly the administration worked out a deal before they left Earth. The champion is a Federation ship, 
but it is possible that such a deal leaves all strings in the hands of Secretary General Douglas. That could keep him in power a long time. On the other hand, it might mean nothing at all. Huh? Why? The Larkin decision might not apply. Luna was uninhabited, but Mars is, by Martians. At the moment, Martians are a legal zero, but the High Court might take a look at the political situation and decide that human occupancy meant nothing on a planet inhabited by non-humans. Then rights on Mars would have to be secured from the Martians. But Ben, that would be the case anyhow. This notion of a single man owning a planet, it's fantastic. Don't use that word to a lawyer. Straining at gnats and swallowing camels is a required course in law schools. Besides, there is precedent. In the 15th century, the Pope deeded the Western Hemisphere to Spain and Portugal, and nobody cared that the real estate was occupied by Indians with their own laws, customs, and property rights. His grant was effective, too. Look at a map and notice where Spanish is spoken and where Portuguese is spoken. Yes, but, Ben, this isn't the 15th century. It is to a lawyer, Jill. If the High Court rules that the Larkin decision applies, Smith is in a position to grant concessions which may be worth millions, more likely billions. If he assigns his claim to the administration, then Secretary Douglas controls the plums. Then, why should anybody want that much power? Why does a moth fly toward light? But Smith's financial holdings are almost as important as his position as nominal King Emperor of Mars. The High Court could knock out his squatter's rights, but I doubt if anything could shake his ownership of the Lyle Drive and a chunk of lunar enterprises. What happens if he dies? A thousand alleged cousins would pop up, of course, but the Science Foundation has fought off such money-hungry vermin for years. It seems possible that, if Smith dies without a will, his fortune reverts to the state. Do you mean the Federation or the United States? Another question to which I have no answer. His parents come from two countries of the Federation, and he was born outside them all. And it will make a crucial difference to some people who votes that stock and licenses those patents. It won't be Smith. He won't know a stock proxy from a traffic ticket. It is likely to be whoever can grab him and hang on. I doubt if Lloyd's would ensure his life. He strikes me as a poor risk. The poor baby. The poor, poor infant. Chapter 6 The restaurant in Hagerstown had atmosphere, tables scattered over a lawn leading down to a lake, and more tables in the boughs of three enormous trees. Jill wanted to eat in a tree, but Ben bribed the maitre d'hôtel to set up a table near the water, then ordered a stereo tank placed by it. Jill was miffed. Ben, why pay these prices if we can't eat in the trees and have to endure that horrible jitterbox? Patience, little one. Tables in trees have microphones. They have to have them for service. This table is not gimmicked, I hope, as I saw the waiter take it from a stack. As for the tank, not only is it un-American to eat without stereo, but the racket will interfere with a directional mic, if Mr. Douglas's investigators are taking an interest. Do you really think they're shadowing us, Ben? Jill shivered. I'm not cut out for a life of crime. Pish and likewise tush. When I was on the general synthetic scandals, I never slept twice in one place and ate nothing but packaged food. You get to like it. Stimulates the metabolism. My metabolism doesn't need it. All I require is one elderly, wealthy patient. Not going to marry me, Jill? After my future husband kicks off, yes. Or maybe I'll be so rich I can keep you as a pet. How about starting tonight? After he kicks off. During the dinner... The musical show, which had been banging their eardrums, stopped. An announcer's head filled the tank. He smiled and said, NWNW New World Networks and its sponsor, Wise Girl Malthusian Lozenges, is honored to surrender time for a history-making broadcast by the Federation government. Remember, friends, every wise girl uses wise girls. Easy to carry, pleasant to take, guaranteed no fail, and approved for sale without prescription under public law 1312. Why take a chance on old-fashioned, unesthetic, harmful, unsure methods? Why risk losing his love and respect? The lovely lupine announcer glanced aside and hurried the commercial. I give you the wise girl who in turn brings you the Secretary General. The 3D picture cut to a young woman, so sensuous, so mammalian, so seductive, as to make any male unsatisfied with local talent. She stretched and wiggled and said in a bedroom voice, I... Always use wise girl. The picture dissolved and an orchestra played Hail to Sovereign Peace. Ben said, Do you use wise girl? None of your business. Jill looked ruffled and added, 
It's a quack nostrum. Anyhow, what makes you think I need it? Caxton did not answer. The tank had filled with the fatherly features of Secretary General Douglas. Friends, he began, fellow citizens of the Federation, I have tonight a unique honor and privilege. Since the triumphant return of our trailblazing champion, he continued to congratulate the citizens of Earth on their successful contact with another planet, another race. He managed to imply that the exploit was the personal accomplishment of every citizen, that any one of them could have led the expedition had he not been busy with serious work and that he, Secretary Douglas, had been their humble instrument to work their will. The notions were never stated baldly, the assumption being that the common man was the equal of anyone, and better than most, and that good old Joe Douglas embodied the common man. Even his must cravat and cowlicked hair had a just folks quality. Ben Caxton wondered who had written it. Jim Sanforth, probably. Jim had the slickest touch of any of Douglas's staff in selecting loaded adjectives to tickle and soothe. He had written commercials before he went into politics and had no compunctions. Yes, that bit about the hand that rocks the cradle was Jim's work. Jim was the type who would entice a young girl with candy. Turn it off, Jill demanded. Quiet, pretty foots. I must hear this. And so, friends, I have the honor to bring you our fellow citizen, Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars. Mike, we know you are tired and have not been well. But will you say a few words to your friends? The stereo scene cut to a semi-close of a man in a wheelchair. Hovering over him was Douglas, and on the other side was a nurse, stiff, starched, and photogenic. Jill gasped. Ben whispered, Keep quiet. The smooth baby face of the man in the chair broke into a shy smile. He looked at the camera and said, Hello, folks. Excuse me for sitting down. I'm still weak. He seemed to speak with difficulty, and once the nurse took his pulse. In answer to questions from Douglas, he paid compliments to Captain Van Tromp and his crew, thanked everyone for his rescue, and said that everyone on Mars was terribly excited over contact with Earth, and that he hoped to help in welding friendly relations between the two planets. The nurse interrupted, but Douglas said gently, Mike, do you feel strong enough for one more question? Sure, Mr. Douglas. If I can answer it. Mike, what do you think of the girls here on Earth? Gee. The baby face looked awestruck and ecstatic and turned pink. The scene cut to head and shoulders of the secretary, Douglas. Mike asked me to tell you, he went on in fatherly tones, that he will be back to see you as soon as he can. He has to build up his muscles, you know. Possibly next week, if the doctors say he is strong enough. The scene shifted to wise girl lozenges, and a playlet made clear that a girl who did not use them was not only out of her mind, but a synth, though, in the hay. Men would cross the street to avoid her. Ben switched channels, then turned to Jill and said moodily, Well, I can tear up tomorrow's column. Douglas has him under his thumb. Ben. Huh? That's not the man from Mars. What? Baby, are you sure? Oh, it looked like him, but it was not the patient I saw in that guarded room. Ben pointed out that dozens of persons had seen Smith, guards, interns, male nurses, the captain and crew of the champion, probably others. Quite a few of them must have seen this newscast. The administration would have to assume that some of them would spot a substitution. It did not make sense. Too great a risk. Jill simply stuck out her lower lip and insisted that the person on stereo was not the patient she had met. Finally, she said angrily, Have it your own way. Men. Now, Jill, please take me home. Ben went for a cab. He did not order one from the restaurant, but selected one from the landing flat of a hotel across the way. Jill remained chilly on the flight back. Ben got out the transcripts and reread them. He thought a while and said, Jill. Yes, Mr. Caxton. I'll mister you. Look, Jill, I apologize. I was wrong. And what leads you to this conclusion? He slapped the papers against his palm. This. Smith could not have shown this behavior yesterday, and then given that interview tonight, he would have flipped his controls, gone into one of those trance things. I am gratified that you have finally seen the obvious. Jill, will you kindly kick me, then let up? Do you know what this means? It means they used an actor to fake it. I told you an hour ago. 
Sure, an actor and a good one, carefully typed and coached. But it implies more than that. As I see it, there are two possibilities. The first is that Smith is dead. And dead? Jill was suddenly back in that curious water-drinking ceremony and felt the strange, warm, unworldly flavor of Smith's personality. Felt it with unbearable sorrow. Maybe, in which case this ringer will stay alive as long as they need him. Then the ringer will die, and they will ship him out of town with a hypnotic injunction so strong he would choke up with asthma if he tried to spill it. Or maybe even a lobotomy. But if Smith is dead, we can forget it. We'll never prove the truth. So let's assume he's alive. Oh, I hope so. What is Hecuba to you, or you to Hecuba? Caxton misquoted. If he is alive, it could be that there's nothing sinister about it. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 2, Side 1 If he is alive, it could be that there's nothing sinister about it. After all, public figures do use doubles. Perhaps in two or three weeks our friend Smith will be in shape to stand the strain of public appearance. Then they will trot him out. But I doubt it like hell. Why? Use your head. Douglas has already failed one attempt to squeeze out of Smith what he wants, but Douglas can't afford to fail, so I think he will bury Smith deeper than ever. And we will never see the true man from Mars. Kill him? Jill said slowly. Why be rough? Lock him in a private nursing home and never let him learn anything. Oh, dear. Then what are we going to do? Caxton scowled. They own the bat and ball and are making the rules, but I am going to walk in with a fair witness and a tough lawyer and demand to see Smith. Maybe I can drag it into the open. I'll be right behind you. Like mischief, you will. As you pointed out, it would ruin you professionally. But you need me to identify him. Face to face, I can tell a man who was raised by non-humans from an actor pretending to be such. But if anything goes wrong, you are my ace in the hole. A person who knows that they are pulling hanky-panky and has access to the inside of Bethesda Center. Honey, if you don't hear from me... You are on your own. Then they wouldn't hurt you. I'm fighting out of my weight, youngster. Ben, I don't like this. Look, if you get in to see him, what are you going to do? I'll ask him if he wants to leave the hospital. If he says yes, I'm going to invite him to come with me. In the presence of a fair witness, they won't dare stop him. Uh, then what? He does need medical attention, Ben. He's not able to take care of himself. Caxton scowled again. I've been thinking of that. I can't nurse him. We could put him in my flat. And I could nurse him. We'll do it, Ben. Slow down. Douglas would pull some rabbit out of his hat and Smith would go back to Pokey. And so would both of us, maybe. He wrinkled his brow. I know one man who might get away with it. Who? Ever heard of Jubal Harshaw? Huh? Who hasn't? That's one of his advantages. Everybody knows who he is. It makes him hard to shove around. Being both a doctor of medicine and a lawyer, he is three times as hard to shove. But most important, he is so rugged and individualist that he would fight the whole Federation with just a pocket knife if it suited him. And that makes him eight times as hard. I got acquainted with him during the disaffection trials. He is a friend I can count on. If I can get Smith out of Bethesda, I'll take him to Harshaw's place in the Poconos. And then just let those jerks try to grab him. Between my column and Harshaw's love for a fight, we'll give him a bad time. Chapter 7 Despite a late evening, Jill relieved his floor nurse ten minutes early. She intended to obey Ben's order to stay out of his attempt to see the man from Mars, but she planned to be close by. Ben might need reinforcements. There were no guards in the corridor. Trays, medications, and two patients for surgery kept her busy for two hours. She had only time to check the door to suite K-12. It was locked, as was the door to the sitting room. She considered sneaking in through the sitting room, now that the guards were gone, but had to postpone it. She was busy. Nevertheless, she kept close check on everyone who came onto her floor. Ben did not show up, and discreet questions asked of her assistant on the switchboard assured her that neither Ben nor anyone had gone into suite K-12 while Jill was elsewhere. It puzzled her. Ben had not set a time, but he had intended to storm the Citadel early in the day. Presently, she just had to snoop. During a lull, she knocked at the door of the watchroom, stuck her head in, and pretended surprise. 
Oh, good morning, doctor. I thought Dr. Frame was in here. The physician at the watch desk smiled as he looked her over. I haven't seen him, nurse. I'm Dr. Brush. Can I help? At the typical male reaction, Jill relaxed. Nothing special. How is the man from Mars? Eh? She smiled. It's no secret to the staff, doctor. Your patient? She gestured at the inner door. Huh? He looked startled. Did they have him here? Isn't he here now? Not by six decimal places. Mrs. Rose Bankerson, Dr. Garner's patient. We brought her in early this morning. Really? What happened to the man from Mars? I haven't the faintest. Say, did I really just miss seeing Valentine Smith? He was here yesterday. Some people have all the luck. Look what I'm stuck with. He switched on the peeping Tom above his desk. Jill saw in it a waterbed. Floating in it was a tiny old woman. What's her trouble? Mm. Nurse, if she didn't have money to burn, you might call it senile dementia. As it is, she is in for rest and a checkup. Jill made small talk, then pretended to see a call light. She went to her desk, dug out the night log. Yes, there it was. V.M. Smith, K-12, transfer. Below that was Rose S. Bankerson, Mrs. Red K-12. Diet kitchen instructed by Dr. Garner. No orders. Floor not responsible. Why had they moved Smith at night? To avoid outsiders, probably. But where had they taken him? Ordinarily, she would have called reception. But Ben's opinions, plus the phony broadcast, had made her jumpy. She decided to wait and see what she could pick up on the grapevine. But first... Jill went to the floor's public booth and called Ben. His office told her that Mr. Caxton had left town. She was startled speechless. Then pulled herself together and left word for Ben to call. She called his home. He was not there. She recorded the same message. Ben Caxton had wasted no time. He retained James Oliver Cavendish. While any fair witness would do, the prestige of Cavendish was such that a lawyer was hardly necessary. The old gentleman had testified many times before the high court, and it was said that the wills locked up in his head represented billions. Cavendish had received his training in total recall from the great Dr. Samuel Renshaw and his hypnotic instruction as a fellow of the Rhine Foundation. His fee for a day was more than Ben made in a week. But Ben expected to charge it to the post syndicate. The best was none too good for this job. Caxton picked up the junior Frisbee of Biddle, Frisbee, Frisbee, Biddle and Reed. Then they called for witness Cavendish. The spare form of Mr. Cavendish, wrapped in the white cloak of his profession, reminded Ben of the Statue of Liberty and was almost as conspicuous. Ben had explained to Mark Frisbee what he intended to try, and Frisbee had pointed out that he had no rights before they called for Cavendish. Once in the fair witness's presence, they conformed to protocol and did not discuss what he might see and hear. The cab dropped them on Bethesda Center. They went down to the director's office. Ben handed in his card and asked to see the director. An imperious female asked if he had an appointment. Ben admitted that he had none. Then your chance of seeing Dr. Bromer is very slight. Will you state your business? Tell him, Caxton said loudly so that bystanders would hear. That Caxton of the Crow's Nest is here with a lawyer and a fair witness to interview Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars. She was startled, but recovered, and said frostily, I shall inform him. Will you be seated, please? Thanks, I'll wait here. Frisbee broke out a cigar. Cavendish waited with the calm patience of one who has seen all manner of good and evil. Caxton jittered. At last, the Snow Queen announced, Mr. Berquist will see you. Berquist. Gil Berquist? I believe his name is Mr. Gilbert Berquist. Caxton thought about it. Gil Berquist was one of Douglas's platoon of stooges, executive assistants. I don't want Berquist, I want the director. Bud Berquist was coming out, hand shoved out, greeters grin on his face. Benny Caxton, how are you, chum? Still peddling the same old hoak? He glanced at the witness. Same old hoak. What are you doing here, Gil? If I ever manage to get out of public service, I'm going to get me a column, too. Phone in a thousand words of rumor and loaf the rest of the day. I envy you, Ben. I said, what are you doing here, Gil? 
I want to see the director, then see the man from Mars. I didn't come here for your high-level brush-off. Now, Ben, don't take that attitude. I'm here because Dr. Bromer has been driven frantic by the press, so the Secretary General sent me to take over the load. Okay. I want to see Smith. Ben, old boy, every reporter, special correspondent, feature writer, commentator, freelance, and sob sister wants that. Polly Peepers was here 20 minutes ago. She wanted to interview him on Love Life Among the Martians. Berquist threw up both hands. I want to see Smith. Do I or don't I? Ben, let's go where we can talk over a drink. You can ask me anything. I don't want to ask you anything. I want to see Smith. This is my attorney, Mark Frisby. As was customary, Ben did not introduce the fair witness. We've met, Berquist acknowledged. As your father, Mark? Sinus is giving him fits. About the same. This foul climate. Come along, Ben. You too, Mark. Hold it, said Caxton. I want to see Valentine Michael Smith. I'm representing the Post Syndicate and indirectly representing 200 million readers. Do I see him? If not, say so out loud and state your legal authority for refusing. Berquist sighed. Mark... Will you tell this keyhole historian that he can't burst into a sick man's bedroom? Smith made one appearance last night, against his physician's advice. The man is entitled to peace and quiet and a chance to build up his strength. There are rumors, Caxton stated, that the appearance last night was a fake. Berquist stopped smiling. Frisbee, he said coldly, do you want to advise your client concerning slander? Take it easy, Ben. I know the law on slander, Gill. But whom am I slandering? The man from Mars or somebody else? Name a name. I repeat, he went on, raising his voice, that I have heard that the man interviewed on 3D last night was not the man from Mars. I want to see him and ask him. The crowded reception hall was very quiet. Berquist glanced at the fair witness, then got his expression under control and said smilingly, Ben, it's possible that you have talked yourself into an interview as well as a lawsuit. Wait a moment. He disappeared, came back fairly soon. I arranged it, he said wearily, though you don't deserve it, Ben. Come along. Just you. Mark, I'm sorry, but we can't have a crowd. Smith is a sick man. No, said Caxton. Huh? All three or none of us. Ben, don't be silly. You're receiving a very special privilege. Tell you what, Mark can come and wait outside, but you don't need him. Berquist nodded toward Cavendish. The witness seemed not to hear. Maybe not, but my column will state tonight that the administration refused to permit a fair witness to see the man from Mars. Berquist shrugged. Come along. Ben, I hope that slander suit clobbers you. They took the elevator out of deference to Cavendish's age, then rode a slide away past laboratories, therapy rooms, ward after ward. They were stopped by a guard who phoned ahead and were at last ushered into a physio data display room used for watching critically ill patients. This is Dr. Tanner, Berquist announced. Doctor, Mr. Caxton and Mr. Frisby. He did not, of course, introduce Cavendish. Tanner looked worried. Gentlemen, I must warn you of one thing. Don't do or say anything that might excite my patient. He is in an extremely neurotic condition and falls very easily into a state of pathological withdrawal. A trance, if you choose to call it that. Epilepsy? asked Ben. A layman might mistake it for that. It is more like catalepsy. Are you a specialist, doctor? Psychiatry? Tanner glanced at Berquist. Yes, he admitted. Where did you do your advanced work? Berquist said, Ben, let's see the patient. You can quiz Dr. Tanner afterwards. Okay. Tanner glanced over his dials, then flipped a switch and stared into a peeping Tom. He unlocked a door and led them into an adjoining bedroom, putting a finger to his lips. The room was gloomy. We keep it semi-darkened because his eyes are not accustomed to our light levels, Tanner explained in a hushed voice. He went to a hydraulic bed in the center of the room. Mike, I've brought some friends to see you. Caxton pressed closer. Floating, half concealed by the way his body sank into the plastic skin and covered to his armpits by a sheet, was a young man. He looked at them, but said nothing. His smooth, round face was expressionless. 
So far as Ben could tell, this was the man on stereo the night before. He had a sick feeling that little Jill had tossed him a live grenade, a slander suit that might bankrupt him. You are Valentine Michael Smith? Yes. The man from Mars? Yes. You were on stereo last night? The man did not answer. Tanner said, I don't think he understands. Mike, you remember what you did with Mr. Douglas last night? The face looked petulant. Bright lights hurt. Yes, the lights hurt your eyes. Mr. Douglas had you say hello to people. The patient smiled slightly. Long ride in chair. Okay, agreed Caxton. I catch on. Mike, are they treating you all right? Yes. You don't have to stay here. Can you walk? Tanner said hastily. Now see here, Mr. Caxton. Berquist put a hand on Tanner's arm. I can walk a little tired. I'll see that you have a wheelchair. Mike, if you don't want to stay here, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Tanner shook off Berquist's hand and said, I can't have you interfering with my patient. He's a free man, isn't he? Caxton persisted. Or is he a prisoner? Berquist answered, Of course he's free. Keep quiet, doctor. Let the fool dig his own grave. Thanks, Gil. You heard him, Mike. You can go anywhere you like. The patient glanced fearfully at Tanner. No. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Tanner snapped. Mr. Berquist, this has gone far enough. All right, doctor. Ben, that's enough. Uh, one more question. Caxton thought hard, trying to think what he could squeeze out of it. Apparently, Jill had been wrong. Yet she had not been wrong, or so it seemed last night. One more question, Berquist begrudged. Thanks. Um... Uh, Mike, last night Mr. Douglas asked you some questions. The patient made no comment. Let's see. He asked you what you thought of the girls here on Earth, didn't he? The patient's face broke into a big smile. Gee! Yes, Mike. When and where did you see these girls? The smile vanished. The patient glanced at Tanner, then stiffened. His eyes rolled up and he drew himself into fetal position, knees up, head bent, arms across his chest. Tanner snapped. Get out of here! He moved quickly and felt the patient's wrist. Berquist said savagely, That tears it! Caxton, will you get out, or shall I call the guards? Oh, we're getting out, Caxton agreed. All but Tanner left the room, and Berquist closed the door. Just one point, Gil, Caxton insisted. You've got him boxed up. So just where did he see those girls? Eh? Don't be silly. He's seen lots of girls. Nurses, laboratory technicians, you know. But I don't. I understood he had nothing but male nurses and that female visitors had been rigidly excluded. Eh? Don't be preposterous. Berquist looked annoyed. Then suddenly grinned. You saw a nurse with him on stereo last night. Oh. So I did. Caxton shut up. They did not discuss it until the three were in the air. Then Frisbee remarked, Ben, I don't suppose the Secretary General will sue you. Still, if you have a source for that rumor, we had better perpetuate the evidence. Forget it, Mark. He won't sue. Ben glowered at the floor. How do we know that was the man from Mars? Eh? Come off it, Ben. How do we know? We saw a man about the right age in a hospital bed. We have Berquist's word for it, and Berquist got his start in politics, issuing denials. We saw a stranger, supposed to be a psychiatrist, and when I tried to find out where he had studied, I got euchred out. Mr. Cavendish, did you see anything that convinced you that this bloke was the man from Mars? Cavendish answered, It is not my function to form opinions. I see, I hear. That is all. Sorry. Are you through with me in my professional capacity? Huh? Oh, sure. Thanks, Mr. Cavendish. Thank you, sir. An interesting assignment. The old gentleman took off the cloak that set him apart from ordinary mortals. He relaxed, and his features mellowed.
If I'd been able to bring along a crew member of the champion, Caxton persisted, I could have tied it down. I must admit, remarked Cavendish, that I was surprised at one thing you did not do. Huh? What did I miss? Calluses. Calluses? Surely. A man's history can be read from his calluses. I once did a monograph on them for the witness quarterly. This young man from Mars, since he has never worn our sort of shoes, and has lived in gravity about one-third of ours, should display foot calluses consonant with his former environment. Damn! Mr. Cavendish, why didn't you suggest it? Sir, the old man drew himself up and his nostrils dilated. I am a fair witness, sir, not a participant. Sorry. Caxton frowned. Let's go back. We'll look at his feet, or I'll bust the place down. You will have to find another witness, in view of my indiscretion in discussing it. Ah, uh, yes, there's that. Caxton frowned. Calm down, Ben, advised Frisby. You're in deep enough. Personally, I'm convinced it was the man from Mars. Caxton dropped them, then set the cab to hover while he thought. He had been in once, with a lawyer, with a fair witness. To demand to see the man from Mars a second time in one morning was unreasonable and would be refused. But he had not acquired a syndicated column through being balked. He intended to get in. How? Well, he knew where the putative man from Mars was kept. Get in as an electrician. Too obvious. He would never get as far as Dr. Tanner. Was Tanner a doctor? Medical men tended to shy away from hanky-panky, contrary to their code. Take that ship's surgeon, Nelson. He had washed his hands of the case simply because... Wait a minute. Dr. Nelson could tell whether that young fellow was the man from Mars without checking calluses or anything. Caxton tried to phone Dr. Nelson, relaying through his office, since he did not know where Dr. Nelson was. Nor did Ben's assistant, Osbert Kilgallen, know. But the Post Syndicate's file on important persons placed him in the new Mayflower. A few minutes later, Caxton was talking with him. Dr. Nelson had not seen the broadcast. Yes, he had heard about it. No, he had no reason to think it had been faked. Did Dr. Nelson know that an attempt had been made to coerce Smith into surrendering his rights under the Larkin decision? No, and he would not be interested if it were true. It was preposterous to talk about anyone owning Mars. Mars belonged to Martians. So? Let's propose a hypothetical question, Doctor. If someone were trying to... Dr. Nelson switched off. When Caxton tried to reconnect, a recorded voice stated, The subscriber has suspended service temporarily, if you care to record. Caxton made a foolish statement concerning Dr. Nelson's parentage. What he did next was much more foolish. He phoned the executive palace, demanded to speak to the secretary general. In his years as a snooper, Caxton had learned that secrets could often be cracked by going to the top and there making himself unbearably unpleasant. He knew that twisting the tiger's tail was dangerous. He understood the psychopathology of great power as thoroughly as Jill Boardman did not. But he relied on his position as a dealer in another sort of power, almost universally appeased. What he forgot was that, in phoning the palace from a taxi cab, he was not doing so publicly. Caxton spoke with half a dozen underlings and became more aggressive with each one. He was so busy that he did not notice when his cab ceased to hover. When he did notice, it was too late. The cab refused to obey orders. Caxton realized bitterly that he had let himself be trapped by a means no hoodlum would fall for. His call had been traced, his cab identified, its robot pilot placed under orders of an overriding police frequency, and the cab was being used to fetch him in privately and with no fuss. He tried to call his lawyer. He was still trying when the taxicab landed inside a courtyard, and his signal was cut off by its walls. He tried to leave the cab, found that the door would not open, and was hardly surprised to discover that he was fast losing consciousness. Chapter 8 Jill told herself that Ben had gone off on another scent and had forgotten to let her know, but she did not believe it. Ben owed his success to meticulous attention to human details. He remembered birthdays and would rather have welched on a poker debt than have omitted a bread-and-butter note. No matter where he had gone, nor how urgently, he could have, would have, taken two minutes in the air to record a message to her. He must have left word. 
She called his office at her lunch break and spoke with Ben's researcher and office chief, Osbert Kilgallen. He insisted that Ben had left no message for her, nor had any come in since she had called. Did he say when he would be back? No, but we always have columns on the hook to fill in when one of these things comes up. Well, where did he call you from? Or am I being snoopy? Not at all, Miss Boardman. He did not call. It was a stat print, filed from Paoli Flat in Philadelphia. Jill had to be satisfied with that. She lunched in the nurse's dining room and picked at her food. It wasn't, she told herself, as if anything were wrong, or as if she were in love with the lunk. Hey, Boardman, snap out of the fog. Jill looked up to find Molly Wheelwright, the wing's dietitian, looking at her. Sorry. I said, since when does your floor put charity patients in luxury suites? We don't. Isn't K-12 on your floor? K-12? That's not charity. It's a rich old woman so wealthy that she can pay to have a doctor watch her breathe. Humph. <laughs> she must have come into money awfully suddenly. She's been in the NP ward of the geriatric sanctuary the past 17 months. Some mistake. Not mine. I don't allow mistakes in my kitchen. That tray is tricky. Fat-free diet and a long list of sensitivities plus concealed medication. Believe me, dear, a diet order can be as individual as a fingerprint. Miss Wheelwright stood up. Gotta run, chicks. What was Molly sounding off about? A nurse asked. Nothing. She's mixed up. It occurred to Jill that she might locate the man from Mars by checking diet kitchens. She put the idea out of her mind. It would take days to visit them all. Bethesda Center had been a naval hospital back when wars were fought on oceans, and enormous even then. It had been transferred to health education and welfare and expanded. Now it belonged to the Federation and was a small city. But there was something odd about Mrs. Bankerson's case. The hospital accepted all classes of patients, private, charity, and government. Jill's floor usually had government patients, and its suites were for Federation senators or other high officials. It was unusual for a private patient to be on her floor. Mrs. Bankerson could be overflow, if the part of the center open to the fee-paying public had no suite available. Yes, probably that was it. She was too rushed after lunch to think about it, being busy with admissions. Shortly, she needed a powered bed. The routine would be to phone for one, but storage was in the basement a quarter of a mile away, and Jill wanted it at once. She recalled having seen the powered bed which belonged to K-12 parked in the sitting room of that suite. She remembered telling those Marines not to sit on it. Apparently, it had been shoved there when the flotation bed had been installed. Probably it was still there. If so, she could get it at once. The sitting room door was locked, and she found that her pass key would not open it. Making a note to tell maintenance, she went to the watch room of the suite, intending to find out about the bed from the doctor watching Mrs. Bankerson. The physician was the one she had met before, Dr. Brush. He was not an intern nor a resident, but had been brought in for this patient, so he had said, by Dr. Garner. Brush looked up as she put her head in. Miss Boardman, just the person I need. Why didn't you ring? How's your patient? She's all right, he answered, glancing at the peeping Tom. But I am not. Trouble? About five minutes worth. Nurse, could you spare me that much of your time and keep your mouth shut? I suppose so. Let me use your phone and I'll tell my assistant where I am. No, he said urgently. Just lock that door after I leave and don't open it until you hear me rap shaving a haircut. That's a good girl. All right, sir, Jill said dubiously. Am I to do anything for your patient? No, no, just sit and watch her in the screen. Don't disturb her. Well, if anything happens, where will you be? In the doctor's lounge? I'm going to the men's washroom down the corridor. Now shut up, please. This is urgent. He left, and Jill locked the door. Then she looked at the patient through the viewer and ran her eye over the dials. The woman was asleep, and displays showed pulse strong and breathing even and normal. Jill wondered why a death watch was necessary. Then she decided to see if the bed was in the far room. While it was not according to Dr. Brush's instructions, she would not disturb his patient. She knew how to walk through a room without waking a patient, and she had decided years ago that what doctors did not know rarely hurt them. She opened the door quietly and went in. A glance assured her that Mrs. Bankerson was in the typical sleep of the senile. Walking noiselessly, she went to the sitting room. It was locked, but her pass key let her in. She saw that the powered bed was there. Then she saw that the room was occupied. Sitting in a chair with a picture book in his lap was the man from Mars. Smith looked up and gave her the beaming smile of a delighted baby. Jill felt dizzy. Valentine Smith, here? 
He couldn't be. He had been transferred. The log showed it. Then ugly implications line themselves up. The fake man from Mars on stereo. The old woman ready to die, but in the meantime covering the fact that there was another patient here. The door that would not open to her key. And a nightmare of the meat wagon wheeling out some night with a sheet concealing that it carried not one cadaver, but two. As this rushed through her mind, it carried fear, awareness of peril through having stumbled on to this secret. Smith got clumsily up from his chair, held out both hands, and said, Water, brother. Hello? Uh, how are you? I am well. I am happy. He added something in a strange, choking speech, corrected himself, and said carefully, You are here, my brother. You were away. Now you are here. I drink deep of you. Jill felt herself helplessly split between emotions, one that melted her heart, and icy fear of being caught. Smith did not notice. Instead, he said, See, I walk, I grow strong. He took a few steps, then stopped, triumphant, breathless and smiling. She forced herself to smile. We are making progress, aren't we? You keep growing stronger, that's the spirit. But I must go, I just stopped to say hello. His expression changed to distress. Do not go. Oh, I must. He looked woebegone, then added with tragic certainty, I have hurted you. I did not know. Hurt me? Oh, no, not at all, but I must go, and quickly. His face was without expression. He stated rather than asked, Take me with you, my brother. What? Oh, I can't, and I must go at once. Look, don't tell anyone I was here, please. Not tell them my water brother was here? Yes, don't tell anyone. Uh, I'll come back. You be a good boy and wait, and don't tell anyone. Smith digested this, looked serene. I will wait. I will not tell. Good. Jill wondered how she could keep her promise. She realized now that the broken lock had not been broken, and her eye went to the corridor door and saw why she had not been able to get in. A hand bolt had been screwed to the door. As was always the case, bathroom doors and other doors that could be bolted were arranged to open also by pass key so the patients could not lock themselves in. Here the lock kept Smith in, and a bolt of the sort not permitted in hospitals kept out even those with pass keys. Jill opened the bolt. You wait. I'll come back. I shall waiting. When she got back to the watchroom, she heard the tuck tuck to tuck 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 signal that Brush had said he would use. She hurried to let him in. He burst in, saying savagely, Where were you, nurse? I knocked three times. He glanced suspiciously at the inner door. I saw your patient turn over, she lied quickly. I was arranging her collar pillow. Damn it, I told you simply to sit at my desk. Jill knew suddenly that the man was frightened. She counterattacked. Doctor, she said coldly, your patient is not my responsibility, but since you entrusted her to me, I did what seemed necessary since you questioned it. Let's get the wing superintendent. Huh? No, no. Forget it. No, sir. A patient that old can smother in a waterbed. Some nurses will take any blame from a doctor, but not me. Let's call the superintendent. What? Look, Miss Boardman, I popped off without thinking. I apologize. Very well, doctor, Jill answered stiffly. Is there anything more? Uh, no, thank you. Thanks for standing by for me. Just, well, be sure not to mention it, will you? I won't mention it. You bet your sweet life I won't. But what do I do now? Oh, I wish Ben were in town. She went to her desk and pretended to look over papers. Finally, she remembered to phone for the powered bed she had been after. Then she sent her assistant on an errand and tried to think. Where was Ben? If he were in touch, she would take ten minutes' relief, call him, and shift the worry onto his broad shoulders. But Ben, damn him, was off sky-oodling and letting her carry the ball. Or was he? A fret that had been burrowing in her subconscious finally surfaced. Ben would not have left town without letting her know the outcome of his attempt to see the man from Mars. As a fellow conspirator, it was her right, and Ben always played fair. She could hear in her head something he had said. If anything goes wrong, you are my ace in the hole. Honey, if you don't hear from me, 
You are on your own. She had not thought about it at the time, as she had not believed that anything could happen to Ben. Now she thought about it. There comes a time in the life of every human when he or she must decide to risk his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor on an outcome dubious. Jill Boardman encountered her challenge and accepted it at 3.47 that afternoon. The man from Mars sat down when Jill left. He did not pick up the picture book, but simply waited in a fashion which may be described as patient only because human language does not embrace Martian attitudes. He held still with quiet happiness because his brother had said that he would return. He was prepared to wait without moving, without doing anything, for several years. He had no clear idea how long it had been since he had shared water with this brother. Not only was this place curiously distorted in time and shape, with sequences of sights and sounds not yet grokked, but also the culture of his nest took a different grasp of time from that which is human. The difference lay not in longer lifetimes, as counted in earth years, but in basic attitude. It is later than you think, could not be expressed in Martian, nor could haste makes waste, though for a different reason. The first notion was inconceivable, while the latter was an unexpressed Martian basic, as unnecessary as telling a fish to bathe. But, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, was so Martian in mood that it could be translated more easily than two plus two makes four, which was not a truism on Mars. Smith waited. Brush came in and looked at him. Smith did not move, and Brush went away. When Smith heard a key in the outer door, he recalled that he had heard this sound somewhat before the last visit of his water brother, so he shifted his metabolism in preparation, in case the sequence occurred again. He was astonished when the outer door opened and Jill slipped in, as he had not been aware that it was a door. But he grokked it at once and gave himself over to the joyful fullness which comes only in the presence of one's nestlings, one's water brothers, and, under certain circumstances, in the presence of the old ones. His joy was muted by awareness that his brother did not share it. He seemed more distressed than was possible, save in one about to discorporate because of shameful lack or failure. But Smith had learned that these creatures could endure emotions dreadful to contemplate and not die. His brother Mahmud underwent a spiritual agony five times daily, and not only did not die, but it urged the agony on him as a needful thing. His brother Captain Van Tromp suffered terrifying spasms unpredictably, any one of which should have, by Smith's standards, produced immediate discorporation to end the conflict. Yet that brother was still corporate, so far as he knew. So he ignored Jill's agitation. Jill handed him a bundle. Here, put these on. Hurry. Smith accepted the bundle and waited. Jill looked at him and said, Oh, dear. All right, get your clothes off. I'll help. She was forced to both undress and dress him. He was wearing hospital gown, bathrobe, and slippers, not because he wanted to, but because he had been told to. He could handle them by now, but not fast enough to suit Jill. She skinned him quickly. She being a nurse and he never having heard of the modesty taboo, nor would he have grasped it. They were not slowed by irrelevancies. He was delighted by false skins Jill drew over his legs. She gave him no time to cherish them, but taped the stockings to his thighs in lieu of garter belt. The nurse's uniform she dressed him in, she had borrowed from a larger woman on the excuse that a cousin needed one for a masquerade. Jill hooked a nurse's cape around his neck and reflected that it covered most sex differences, at least she hoped so. Shoes were difficult. They did not fit well, and Smith found walking in this gravity field an effort, even barefooted. But she got him covered and pinned a nurse's cap on his head. Your hair isn't very long, she said anxiously. But it is as long as some girls wear it, and will have to do. Smith did not answer, as he had not fully understood the remark. He tried to think his hair longer, but realized that it would take time. Now, said Jill, listen carefully. No matter what happens, don't say a word. Do you understand? Don't talk. I will not talk. Just come with me. I'll hold your hand. If you know any prayers, pray. Pray? Never mind. Just come along and don't talk. She opened the outer door, glanced outside, and led him into the corridor. Smith found the many strange configurations upsetting in the extreme. He was assaulted by images he could not bring into focus. He stumbled blindly along with eyes and senses almost disconnected to protect himself against chaos. 
She led him to the end of the corridor and stepped on a slide away leading crosswise. He stumbled and would have fallen if Jill had not caught him. A chambermaid looked at them, and Jill cursed under her breath, then was very careful in helping him off. They took an elevator to the roof, Jill being assured that she could never pilot him up a bounce tube. There they encountered a crisis, though Smith was not aware. He was undergoing the keen delight of sky. He had not seen sky since Mars. This sky was bright and colorful and joyful, a typical overcast Washington day. Jill was looking for a taxi. The roof was deserted, as she had hoped since nurses going off duty when she did were already headed home, and afternoon visitors were gone. But the taxis were gone, too. She did not dare risk an airbus. She was about to call a taxi when one headed in for a landing. She called to the roof attendant. Jack, is that cab taken? It's one I called for Dr. Phipps. Oh, dear. Jack, see how quick you can get me one, will you? This is my cousin Madge, works over in South Wing, and she has laryngitis and must get out of this wind. The attendant scratched his head. Well, seeing it's you, Miss Boardman, you take this and I'll call another for Dr. Phipps. Oh, Jack, you're a lamb. Madge, don't talk. I'll thank him. Her voice is gone. I'm going to bake it out with hot rum. That ought to do it. Old-fashioned remedies are best, my mother used to say. He reached into the cab and punched the combination for Jill's home from memory, then helped them in. Jill got in the way and covered up Smith's unfamiliarity with this ceremonial. Thanks, Jack. Thanks loads. The cab took off, and Jill took a deep breath. You can talk now. What should I say? Huh? Oh, whatever you like. Smith thought this over. The scope of the invitation called for a worthy answer, suitable to brothers. He thought of several, discarded them because he could not translate, settled on one which conveyed, even in this strange, flat speech, some of the warm, growing closer brothers should enjoy. Let our eggs share the same nest. Jill looked startled. Huh? What did you say? Smith felt distressed at the failure to respond in kind, and interpreted it as failure on his own part. He realized miserably that time after time he brought agitation to these creatures when his purpose was to create oneness. He tried again, rearranging his sparse vocabulary to enfold the thought differently. My nest is yours, and your nest is mine. This time Jill smiled. Why, how sweet. My dear, I'm not sure I understand you, but that is the nicest offer I've had in a long time. She added, but right now we are up to our ears in trouble, so let's wait, shall we? Smith understood Jill hardly more than Jill understood him, but he caught his water brother's pleased mood and understood the suggestion to wait. Waiting he did without effort. He sat back, satisfied that all was well between himself and his brother, and enjoyed the scenery. It was the first he had seen, and on every side there was richness of new things to try to grok. It occurred to him that the apportation used at home did not permit this delightful viewing of what lay between. This almost led him to a comparison of Martian and human methods not favorable to the old ones, but his mind shied away from heresy. Jill kept quiet and tried to think. Suddenly she noticed that the cab was on the final leg toward her apartment house and realized that home was the last place to go, it being the first place they would look once they figured out who had helped Smith to escape. While she knew nothing of police methods, she supposed that she must have left fingerprints in Smith's room, not to mention that people had seen them walk out. It was even possible, so she had heard, for a technician to read the tape in this cab's pilot and tell what trips it had made and where and when. She slapped the keys and cleared the instruction to go to her apartment house. The cab rose out of the lane and hovered. Where could she go? Where could she hide a grown man who was half idiot and could not even dress himself, and was the most sought-after person on the globe? Oh, if Ben were only here. Ben, where are you? Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 2, Side 2. Where could she hide a grown man who was half idiot and could not even dress himself, and was the most sought-after person on the globe? Oh, if Ben were only here. Ben, where are you? She picked up the phone and rather hopelessly punched Ben's number. Her spirits jumped when a man answered, then slumped when she realized that it was not Ben but his major domo. Oh, sorry, Mr. Kilgallen. This is Jill Boardman. I thought I had called Mr. Caxton's home. 
You did. I have his calls relayed to the office when he is away more than twenty-four hours. Then he is still away? Yes. May I help you? Uh, no. Mr. Kilgallen, isn't it strange that Ben should drop out of sight? Aren't you worried? Eh? Not at all. His message said that he did not know how long he would be gone. Isn't that odd? Not in Mr. Caxton's work, Miss Boardman. Well, I think there is something very odd about his absence. I think you ought to report it. You ought to spread it over every news service in the country, in the world. Even though the cab's phone had no vision circuit, Jill felt Osbert Kilgallen draw himself up. I'm afraid, Miss Boardman, that I must interpret my employer's instructions myself. Uh, if you don't mind my saying so, there is always some good friend phoning Mr. Caxton frantically whenever he's away. Some babe trying to get a hammerlock on him, Jill interpreted angrily, and this character thinks I'm the current one. It squelched any thought of asking Kilgallen for help. She switched off. Where could she go? A solution popped into her mind. If Ben was missing, and the authorities had a hand in it, the last place they would expect to find Valentine Smith would be Ben's apartment, unless they connected her with Ben, which seemed unlikely. They could dig a snack out of Ben's pantry, and she could borrow clothes for her idiot child. She set the combination for Ben's apartment house. The cab picked the lane and dropped into it. Outside Ben's flat, Jill put her face to the hush box and said, Carthago de Lenda est. Nothing happened. Oh, damn, she said to herself. He's changed the combo. She stood there, knees weak, and kept her face away from Smith. Then she again spoke into the hush box. The same circuit actuated the door or announced callers. She announced herself on the forlorn chance that Ben might have returned. Ben, this is Jill. The door slid open. They went inside and the door closed. Jill thought that Ben had let them in, then realized that she had accidentally hit on his new door combination, intended, she guessed, as a compliment. She could have dispensed with the compliment to have avoided that awful panic. Smith stood quietly at the edge of the thick green lawn and stared. Here was a place so new as not to be grokked at once, but he felt immediately pleased. It was less exciting than the moving place they had been in, but more suited for enfolding the self. He looked with interest at the view window at one end, but did not recognize it as such, mistaking it for a living picture like those at home. His suite at Bethesda had no windows, it being in a new wing. He had never acquired the idea of window. He noticed with approval that simulation of depth and movement in the picture was perfect. Some very great artist must have created it. Up to now he had seen nothing to cause him to think that these people possessed art. His grokking of them was increased by this new experience, and he felt warmed. A movement caught his eye. He turned to find his brother removing false skins and slippers from its legs. Jill sighed and wiggled her toes in the grass. Gosh, how my feet hurt. She glanced up and saw Smith watching with that curiously disturbing baby-faced stare. Do it yourself, you'll love it. He blinked. How do? I keep forgetting. Come here, I'll help. She got his shoes off, untaped the stockings, and peeled them off. There, doesn't that feel good? Smith wiggled his toes in the grass, then said timidly, But these live? Sure, it's alive. It's real grass. Ben paid a lot to have it that way. Why, the special lighting circuits alone cost more than I make in a month. So walk around and let your feet enjoy it. Smith missed most of this, but did understand that grass was living beings, and that he was being invited to walk on them. Walk on living things? he asked with incredulous horror. Huh? Why not? It doesn't hurt this grass. It was specially developed for house rugs. Smith was forced to remind himself that a water brother could not lead him into wrongful action. He let himself be encouraged to walk around, and found that he did enjoy it, and the living creatures did not protest. He set his sensitivity for such as high as possible. His brother was right. This was their proper being, to be walked on. He resolved to enfold and praise it, an effort like that of a human trying to appreciate the merits of cannibalism, a custom which Smith found proper. Jill let out a sigh. I must stop playing. I don't know how long we will be safe. Safe? We can't stay here. They may be checking on everything that left the center. She frowned in thought. Her place would not do, this place would not do. And Ben had intended to take him to Jubal Harshaw, but she did not know Harshaw, nor where he lived. 
Somewhere in the Poconos, Ben had said. Well, she would have to find out. She had nowhere else to turn. Why are you not happy, my brother? Jill snapped out of it and looked at Smith. Why, the poor infant didn't know anything was wrong. She tried to look at it from his point of view. She failed, but did grasp that he had no notion that they were running away from... From what? The cops, the hospital authorities? She was not sure what she had done, what laws she had broken. She simply knew that she had pitted herself against the big people, the bosses. How could she tell the man from Mars what they were up against when she herself did not know? Did they have policemen on Mars? Half the time talking to him was like shouting down a rain barrel. Heavens, did they even have rain barrels on Mars? Or rain? Never mind, she said soberly. You just do what I tell you to. Yes. It was an unlimited acceptance, an eternal yay. Jill suddenly felt that Smith would jump out the window if she told him to. And she was correct. He would have jumped, enjoyed every second of the twenty-story drop, and accepted without surprise or resentment discorporation on impact. Nor would he have been unaware that such a fall would kill him. Fear of death was an idea beyond him. If a water brother selected him for such strange discorporation, he would cherish it and try to grok. Well, we can't stand here. I've got to feed us. I've got to get you into different clothes, and we've got to leave. Take those off. She left to check Ben's wardrobe. She selected a travel suit, a beret, shirt, underclothes, shoes, then returned. Smith was snarled like a kitten in knitting. He had one arm prisoned, and his face wrapped in the skirt. He had not removed the cape before trying to take off the dress. Jill said, Oh, dear, and ran to help. She got him loose from the clothes, then stuffed them down the oubliette. She would pay Etta Shear later, and she did not want cops finding them, just in case. You are going to have a bath, my good man, before I dress you in Ben's clean clothes. They've been neglecting you. Come along. Being a nurse, she was inured to bad odors. But, being a nurse, she was fanatic about soap and water, and it seemed that no one had bathed this patient recently. While Smith did not stink, he did remind her of a horse on a hot day. With delight, he watched her fill the tub. There was a tub in the bathroom of Sweet K-12, but Smith had not known its use. Bed baths were what he had had, and not many of those. His trance-like withdrawals had interfered. Jill tested the temperature. All right, climb in. Smith looked puzzled. Hurry, Jill said sharply. Get in the water. The words were in his human vocabulary, and Smith did as ordered. Emotion shaking him. This brother wanted him to place his whole body in the water of life. No such honor had ever come to him. To the best of his knowledge, no one had ever been offered such a privilege. Yet he had begun to understand that these others did have greater acquaintance with the stuff of life, a fact not grokked, but which he must accept. He placed one trembling foot in the water, then the other, slipped down until water covered him completely. Hey! yelled Jill, and dragged his head above water, was shocked to find that she seemed to be handling a corpse. Good Lord, he couldn't drown, not in that time. But it frightened her. She shook him. Smith, wake up. Snap out of it. From far away, Smith heard his brother call and returned. His eyes ceased to be glazed. His heart speeded up. He resumed breathing. Are you all right? Jill demanded. I am all right. I am very happy. My brother, you scared me. Look, don't get under the water again. Just sit up the way you are now. Yes, my brother. Smith added something in a croaking, meaningless to Jill, cupped a handful of water as if it were precious jewels and raised it to his lips. His mouth touched it. Then he offered it to Jill. Hey, don't drink your bath water. Now, I don't want it either. Not drink? His defenseless hurt was such that Jill did not know what to do. She hesitated, then bent her head and touched her lips to the offering. Thank you. May you never thirst. I hope you were never thirsty, too, but that's enough. If you want a drink, I'll get you one. Don't drink any more of this water. Smith seemed satisfied and sat quietly. By now, Jill knew that he had never had a tub bath and did not know what was expected. No doubt she could coach him, but they were losing precious time. Oh, well, it was not as bad as tending disturbed patients in NP wards. Her blouse was wet to the shoulders from dragging Smith off the bottom. 
she took it off and hung it up. She had been dressed for the street and was wearing a little pettiskirt that floated around her knees. She glanced down. Although the pleats were permanized, it was silly to get it wet. She shrugged and zipped it off. It left her in brassiere and panties. Smith was staring with the interested eyes of a baby. Jill found herself blushing, which surprised her. She believed herself to be free of morbid modesty. She recalled suddenly that she had gone on her first bearskin swimming party at fifteen, but this childlike stare bothered her. She decided to put up with wet underwear rather than do the obvious. She covered discomposure with heartiness. Let's get busy and scrub the hide. She knelt beside the tub, sprayed soap on him, and started working it into a lather. Presently, Smith reached out and touched her right mammary gland. Jill drew back hastily. Hey, none of that. He looked as if she had slapped him. Not, he said tragically. Not, she agreed firmly. Then looked at his face and added softly, It's all right. Just don't distract me. I'm busy. Jill cut the bath short, letting water drain and having him stand while she showered him off. Then she dressed while the blast dried him. The warm air startled him, and he began to tremble. She told him not to be afraid, and had him hold the grab rail. She helped him out of the tub. There, you smell better, and I bet you feel better. Feel fine. Good. Let's get clothes on you. She led him into Ben's bedroom. But before she could explain, demonstrate, or assist in getting shorts on him, a man's voice scared her almost out of her senses. Open up in there. Jill dropped the shorts. Did they know anyone was inside? Yes, they must, else they would never have come here. That damned robocab must have given her away. Should she answer or play possum? The shout over the announcing circuit was repeated. She whispered to Smith, Stay here, then went into the living room. Who is it? she called out, striving to keep her voice normal. Open in the name of the law. Open in the name of the law. Don't be silly. Tell me who you are before I call the police. We are the police. Are you Jillian Boardman? Me? I'm Phyllis O'Toole, and I'm waiting for Mr. Caxton. I'm going to call the police and report an invasion of privacy. Miss Boardman, we have a warrant for your arrest. Open up, or it will go hard with you. I'm not Miss Boardman, and I'm calling the police. The voice did not answer. Jill waited, swallowing. Shortly, she felt radiant heat against her face. The door's lock began to glow red, then white. Something crunched, and the door slid open. Two men were there. One stepped in, grinned, and said, That's the babe. Johnson, look around and find him. Okay, Mr. Berquist. Jill tried to be a roadblock. The man called Johnson brushed her aside and went toward the bedroom. Jill said shrilly, Where's your warrant? This is an outrage. Berquist said soothingly, Don't be difficult, sweetheart. Behave yourself, and they might go easy on you. She kicked at his shin. He stepped back nimbly. Naughty, naughty, he chided. Johnson, you find him? He's here, Mr. Berquist. Naked as an oyster. Three guesses what they were up to. Never mind that. Bring him. Johnson reappeared, shoving Smith ahead, controlling him by twisting one arm. He didn't want to come. He'll come. Jill ducked past Berquist, threw herself at Johnson. He slapped her aside. None of that, you little slut. Johnson did not hit Jill as hard as he used to hit his wife before she left him, not nearly as hard as he hit prisoners who were reluctant to talk. Until then, Smith had shown no expression and had said nothing. He had simply let himself be forced along. He understood none of it and had tried to do nothing at all. When he saw his water brother struck by this other, he twisted, got free, and reached toward Johnson. And Johnson was gone. Only blades of grass, straightening up where his big feet had been, showed that he had ever been there. Jill stared at the spot and felt that she might faint. Berquist closed his mouth, opened it, and said hoarsely, What did you do with him? He looked at Jill. Me? I didn't do anything. Don't give me that. You get a trap door or something. Where did he go? Berquist licked his lips. I don't know. He took a gun from under his coat. But don't try your tricks on me. You stay here. I'm taking him. Smith had relapsed into passive waiting. Not understanding what it was about, he had done only the minimum he had to do. But guns he had seen in the hands of men on Mars, and the expression of Jill's face at having one aimed at her, he did not like. He grokked that this was one of the critical cusps in the growth of a being wherein contemplation must bring forth right action in order to permit further growth. He acted. The old ones had taught him well. 
He stepped toward Berquist. The gun swung to cover him. He reached out, and Berquist was no longer there. Jill screamed. Smith's face had been blank. Now it became tragically forlorn as he realized that he must have chosen wrong action at cusp. He looked imploringly at Jill and began to tremble. His eyes rolled up. He slowly collapsed, pulled himself into a ball, and was motionless. Jill's hysteria chopped off. A patient needed her. She had no time for emotion, no time to wonder how men disappeared. She dropped to her knees and examined Smith. She could not detect respiration nor pulse. She pressed an ear to his ribs. She thought that heart action had stopped, but after a long time, she heard a lazy lub dub, followed in four or five seconds by another. The condition reminded her of schizoid withdrawal, but she had never seen a trance so deep, not even in class demonstrations of hypnoanesthesia. She had heard of such death-like states among East Indian fakirs, but had never really believed the reports. Ordinarily, she would not have tried to rouse a patient in such a state, but would have sent for a doctor. These were not ordinary circumstances. Far from shaking her resolve, the last events made her more determined not to let Smith fall back into the hands of the authorities. But ten minutes of trying everything she knew convinced her that she could not rouse him. In Ben's bedroom, she found a battered flight case, too big for hand luggage, too small to be a trunk. She opened it, found it packed with voice writer, toilet kit, and outfit of clothing, everything a busy reporter might need if called out of town. Even a licensed audio link. To patch into phone service, Jill reflected that this packed bag showed that Ben's absence was not what Kilgallen thought it was. But she wasted no time on it. She emptied the bag and dragged it into the living room. Smith outweighed her, but muscles acquired handling patients twice her size enabled her to dump him into the big bag. She had to refold him to close it. His muscles resisted force, but under gentle, steady pressure could be repositioned like putty. She padded the corners with some of Ben's clothes. She tried to punch air holes, but the bag was glass laminate. She decided that he could not suffocate with respiration so minimal and metabolic rate as low as it must be. She could barely lift the packed bag, straining with both hands, and she could not carry it. But it was equipped with red cap casters. They cut ugly scars in Ben's grass rug before she got it to the parquet of the entrance way. She did not go to the roof. Another cab was the last thing she wanted. She went out by the service door in the basement. There was no one there but a young man checking a kitchen delivery. He moved aside and let her roll the bag out onto the pavement. "Hi, sister, what you got in the keister? A body," she snapped. He shrugged. "Ask a jerky question, get a jerky answer. I should learn." Part two, his preposterous heritage. Chapter nine. The third planet from Sol held two hundred thirty thousand more humans this day than yesterday. Among five billion terrestrials, such increase was not noticeable. The Kingdom of South Africa, Federation Associate, was again cited before the High Court for persecution of its white minority. The Lords of Fashion gathered in Rio, decreed that hemlines would go down and navels would be covered. Federation defense stations swung in the sky, promising death to any who disturbed the planet's peace. Commercial space stations disturbed the peace with endless clamor of endless trademarked trade goods. Half a million more mobile homes had set down on the shores of Hudson Bay than had migrated by the same date last year. The Chinese rice belt was declared an emergency malnutrition area by the Federation Assembly. Cynthia Duchess, known as the richest girl in the world, paid off her sixth husband. The Reverend Dr. Daniel Digby, Supreme Bishop of the Church of the New Revelation, Fosterite. Announced that he had nominated the angel Azrael to guide Federation Senator Thomas Boone, and that he expected heavenly confirmation later today. News services carried it as straight news. The Fosterites having wrecked newspaper offices in the past. Mr. and Mrs. Harrison Campbell the sixth had a son and heir by host mother at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, while the happy parents were vacationing in Peru. Dr. Horace Quackenbush, professor of leisure arts at Yale Divinity School, called for a return to faith and cultivation of spiritual values. A betting scandal involved half the professionals of the West Point football squad. Three bacterial warfare chemists were suspended at Toronto for emotional instability. They announced that they would carry their cases to the High Court. The High Court reversed the United States Supreme Court in re-primaries involving Federation assemblymen in the case of Rheinsberg versus the State of Missouri. His Excellency, the Most Honorable Joseph E. Douglas, Secretary General of the World Federation of Free States, 
picked at his breakfast, and wondered why a man could not get a decent cup of coffee. His morning newspaper, prepared by the night shift of his information staff, moved past his eyes at his optimum reading speed in a feedback scanner. The words flowed as long as he looked in that direction. He was looking at it now, but simply to avoid the eyes of his boss across the table. Mrs. Douglas did not read newspapers. She had other ways of finding things out. Joseph? He looked up. The machine stopped. Yes, my dear? You have something on your mind. Eh? What makes you say that, my dear? Joseph, I've coddled you and darned your socks and kept you out of trouble for thirty-five years. I know when something is on your mind. The hell of it is, he admitted. She does know. He looked at her and wondered why he had ever let her bully him into a no-termination contract. She had been his secretary back in the good old days when he had been a state legislator. Their first contract had been a 90-day cohabitation agreement to economize campaign funds by saving on hotel bills. Both had agreed that it was merely a convenience, with cohabitation to be construed simply as living under one roof. And she hadn't darned his socks even then. He tried to remember how it had changed. Mrs. Douglas's biography, Shadow of Greatness, One Woman's Story, stated that he had proposed during ballot counting in his first election, and such was his romantic need that nothing would do but old-fashioned, death-do-us-part marriage. Well, there was no arguing with the official version. Joseph, answer me. Eh? Nothing, my dear, I spent a restless night. I know, when they wake you in the night, don't I know it? He reflected that her suite was fifty yards across the palace from his. How do you know it, my dear? Huh? A woman's intuition. What was the message Bradley brought you? Please, my dear, I've got to finish the news before council meeting. Joseph Edgerton Douglas, don't evade me. He sighed. We've lost sight of that beggar Smith. Smith? You mean the man from Mars? What do you mean, lost sight of? Ridiculous! Be that as it may, my dear, he's gone. Disappeared from his hospital room yesterday. Preposterous. How could he? Disguised as a nurse, apparently. But... Never mind. He's gone. That's the main thing. What muddle-headed scheme are you using to get him back? Well, we have people searching. Trusted ones. Berquist. That garbage head. When you should be using every police officer from the FDS down to truant officers, you send Berquist? But, my dear, you don't see the situation. We can't. Officially, he isn't lost. You see, there's... Well, the other chap, the, uh, official man from Mars. Oh, she drummed the table. I told you that substitution scheme would get us in trouble. But, my dear, you suggested it. I did not, and don't contradict me. Hmm. Send for Berquist. Uh, Berquist is out on his trail. He hasn't reported back yet. Huh? Berquist is halfway to Zanzibar by now. He sold us out. I never did trust that man. I told you when you hired him that... When I hired him? Don't interrupt. That any man who takes money two ways would take it three ways. She frowned. Joseph, the Eastern Coalition is behind this. You can expect a vote of confidence move in the Assembly. Eh? I don't see why. Nobody knows it. Oh, for heaven's sake, everybody will know. The Eastern Coalition will see to that. Keep quiet and let me think. Douglas shut up. He read that the Los Angeles City County Council had petitioned the Federation for aid in their smog problem on the grounds the Ministry of Health had failed to provide something or other. A sop must be thrown to them, as Charlie was going to have a tough time being re-elected with the Fosterites running their own candidate. Lunar Enterprises was up two points at closing. Joseph. Yes, my dear. Our man from Mars is the only one. The one the Eastern Coalition will pop up with is a fake. That is how it must be. Uh, but, my dear, uh, we can't make it stick. What do you mean we can't? We've got to. But we can't. Scientists would spot the substitution at once. I've had the devil's own time keeping them away from him this long. Scientists. But they can, you know. I don't know anything of the sort. Scientists, indeed. Half guesswork and half superstition. They ought to be locked up. They ought to be prohibited by law. Joseph, I've told you repeatedly the only true science is astrology. Well, I don't know, my dear. I'm not running down astrology. You'd better not. After all, it's done for you. But these science professors are pretty sharp. One was telling me the other day about a star that weighs 6,000 times as much as lead. Or was it 60,000? Let me see. Bosh, how could they know a thing like that? Keep quiet, Joseph. We admit nothing. Their man is a fake. 
In the meantime, we make full use of our special service squads and grab him back, if possible, before the Eastern Coalition makes its disclosure. If strong measures are necessary and this Smith person gets shot resisting arrest or something, well, it's just too bad. He's been a nuisance all along. Bagness. Do you know what you are suggesting? I'm not suggesting anything. People get hurt every day. This matter must be cleared up, Joseph, for everybody. The greatest good of the greatest number, as you were always saying. I don't want the lad hurt. Who said anything about hurting him? You must take firm steps, Joseph. It's your duty. History will justify you. Which is more important, to keep things on an even keel for five billion people or to go soft and sentimental about one man who isn't even properly a citizen? Douglas didn't answer. Mrs. Douglas stood up. Well, I can't waste time arguing intangibles. I've got to get Madame Vessant to cast a new horoscope. I didn't give the best years of my life, putting you where you are, to throw it away through lack of backbone. Wipe the egg off your chin. She left. The chief executive of the planet stayed for two more cups of coffee before he felt up to going to the council chamber. Poor old Agnes. He guessed he had been a disappointment to her. And no doubt the change of life wasn't making things easier. Well, at least she was loyal, right to her toes. And we all have shortcomings. She was probably as sick of him as he... No point in that. He straightened up. One damn sure thing, he wasn't going to let them be rough with that Smith lad. He was a nuisance, granted, but rather appealing in a helpless, half-witted way. Agnes should have seen how easily he was frightened. Then she wouldn't talk that way. Smith would appeal to the maternal in her. But did Agnes have any maternal in her? When she set her mouth, it was hard to see it. Oh, shucks, all women had maternal instincts. Science had proved that. Well, hadn't they? Anyhow, damn her guts, he wasn't going to let her push him around. She kept reminding him that she had put him into the top spot, but he knew better. And the responsibility was his alone. He got up, squared his shoulders, and went to council. All day he kept expecting someone to drop the other shoe. But no one did. He was forced to conclude that the fact that Smith was missing was close held in his own staff. Unlikely as that seemed. The secretary general wanted to close his eyes and have the whole horrid mess go away. But events would not let him, nor would his wife. Agnes Douglas did not wait for her husband to act in the case of the man from Mars. Her husband's staff took orders as readily from her as from him, or more readily. She sent for the executive assistant for civil information, as Mr. Douglas's flack was called, then turned to the most urgent need, a fresh horoscope. There was a scrambled private link from her suite to Madame Vessant's studio. The astrologer's plump features came on screen at once. Agnes, what is it, dear? I have a client. Your circuit is hushed? Of course. Get rid of the client. Madame Alexandra Vessant showed no annoyance. Just a moment. Her features faded out, were replaced by the hold signal. A man entered and stood by Mrs. Douglas's desk. She saw that it was James Sanforth, the press agent she had sent forth. Have you heard from Burquist? she demanded. Eh? I wasn't handling that. That's McCrary's pigeon. She brushed it aside. You've got to discredit him before he talks. You think Burquist sold us out? Don't be naive. You should have checked with me before you used him. But I didn't. It was McCrary's job. You were supposed to know what's going on. I... Madame Vassant's face came back on screen. Wait over there, Mrs. Douglas said to Sanforth. She turned to the screen. Allie, dear, I want fresh horoscopes for Joseph and myself right away. Very well. The astrologer hesitated. I can be of greater assistance, dear, if you tell me the nature of the emergency. Mrs. Douglas drummed on the desk. You don't have to know? Of course not. Anyone possessing the necessary rigorous training, mathematical skill, and knowledge of the stars could calculate a horoscope, knowing nothing but the hour and place of birth of the subject. You could learn it if you weren't so terribly busy. But remember, the stars incline, but do not compel. If I'm to make a detailed analysis to advise you in a crisis, I must know in what sector to look. Are we most concerned with the influence of Venus? Or possibly with Mars? Or... Mrs. Douglas decided. With Mars, she interrupted. Allie, I want a third horoscope. Very well. Whose? Uh... Allie, can I trust you? Madame Vassant looked hurt. Agnes, if you do not trust me, you had best not consult me. Others can give you scientific readings. 
I'm not the only student of the ancient knowledge. Professor von Krausmeier is well thought of, even though he is inclined to... She let her voice trail off. Please, please, I wouldn't think of letting anyone else perform a calculation for me. Now listen, no one can hear from your side? Of course not, dear. I want a horoscope for Valentine Michael Smith. Valentine Mike... the man from Mars? Yes, yes. Allie, he's been kidnapped. We've got to find him. Two hours later, Madame Alexandra Vassant pushed back from her desk and sighed. She had had her secretary cancel all appointments. Sheets covered with diagrams and figures and a dog-eared nautical almanac testified to her efforts. Alexandra Vassant differed from some astrologers in that she did attempt to calculate the influences of heavenly bodies, using a paperbacked book titled The Arcane Science of Judicial Astrology and Key to Solomon's Stone, which had belonged to her late husband, Professor Simon Magus, mentalist, stage hypnotist, and illusionist, and student of the Arcanum. She trusted the book as she had trusted him. There was no one who could cast a horoscope like Simon when he was sober. Half the time he had not needed the book. She knew that she would never have that degree of skill. She always used both almanac and manual. Her calculations were sometimes fuzzy. Becky Vesey, as she had been known, had never really mastered multiplication tables and was inclined to confuse sevens with nines. Nevertheless, her horoscopes were eminently satisfactory. Mrs. Douglas was not her only distinguished client. She had been a touch panicky when Mrs. Douglas demanded a horoscope for the man from Mars. She had felt the way she used to feel when some idiot from the audience had retied her blindfold just before the professor was to ask her questions. But she had discovered way back then as a girl that she had a talent for the right answer. She had suppressed her panic and gone on with the show. So she had demanded of Agnes the exact hour, date, and place of birth of the man from Mars, being fairly sure that they were not known. But precise information had been supplied after short delay from the envoy's log. By then she was not panicky had simply accepted the data and promised to call back with the horoscopes. But after two hours of painful arithmetic, although she had completed findings for Mr. and Mrs. Douglas, she had nothing for Smith. The trouble was simple and insuperable. Smith had not been born on earth. Her astrological Bible did not include such an idea. Its anonymous author had died before the first rocket to the moon. She had tried to find a way out of the dilemma on the assumption that principles were unchanged and that she must correct for displacement, but she grew lost in a maze of unfamiliar relationships. She was not sure the signs of the zodiac were the same from Mars, and what could one do without signs of the zodiac? She could as easily have extracted a cube root, that being the hurdle that had caused her to quit school. She got out a tonic she kept for difficult occasions. She took one dose quickly, poured another, and thought about what Simon would have done. Presently she could hear his steady tones. Confidence, kiddo. Have confidence and the yokels will have confidence in you. You owe it to them. She felt much better and started writing the horoscopes for the Douglases. It then turned out to be easy to write one for Smith. She found, as always, that words on paper proved themselves. They were so beautifully true. She was finishing as Agnes Douglas called again. Allie, have you finished? Just completed, Madame Vassant answered briskly. You realize that young Smith's horoscope presented an unusual and difficult problem in the science. Born as he was on another planet, every aspect had to be recalculated. The influence of the sun is lessened, that of Diana is almost missing. Jupiter is thrown into a novel, I should say unique aspect, as I'm sure you see. This required computation of... Allie, never mind that. Do you know the answers? Naturally. Oh, thanks, goodness. I thought you were telling me that it was too much for you. Madame Vassant showed injured dignity. My dear, the science never alters, only configurations alter. The means that predicted the instant and place of the birth of Christ, that told Julius Caesar the moment and method of his death. How could it fail? Truth is truth, unchanging. Yes, of course. Are you ready? Let me switch on recording. Go ahead. Very well. Agnes, this is a most critical period in your life. Never have the heavens gathered in such strong configuration. Above all, you must be calm, not hasty, and think things through. On the whole, the portents are in your favor. Provided you avoid ill-considered action, do not let your mind be distressed by surface appearances. 
She went on giving advice. Becky Vesey always gave good advice and gave it with conviction because she believed it. She had learned from Simon that even when the stars seemed darkest, there was always a way to soften the blow, some aspect the client could use toward happiness. The tense face opposite her in the screen calmed and began nodding agreement as she made her points. So you see, she concluded, the absence of young Smith is a necessity. Under the joint influences of three horoscopes, do not worry, he will return, or you will hear from him, very shortly. The important thing is to take no drastic action. Be calm. Yes, I see. One more point. The aspect of Venus is most favorable and potentially dominant over that of Mars. Venus symbolizes yourself, of course, but Mars is both your husband and young Smith, as a result of the unique circumstances of his birth. This throws a double burden on you, and you must rise to the challenge. You must demonstrate those qualities, calm, wisdom, and restraint, which are peculiarly those of women. You must sustain your husband, guide him through this crisis, and soothe him. You must supply the Earth Mother's calm wells of wisdom. That is your special genius. You must use it. Mrs. Douglas sighed. Allie, you are simply wonderful. I don't know how to thank you. Thank the ancient masters, whose humble student I am. I can't thank them, so I'll thank you. This isn't covered by retainer, Allie. There will be a present. No, Agnes, it is a privilege to serve. And it is my privilege to appreciate service. Allie, not another word. Madame Vassant let herself be coaxed, then switched off feeling warmly content from having given a reading that she just knew was right. Poor Agnes. It was a privilege to smooth her path, make her burdens a little lighter. It made her feel good to help Agnes. It made Madame Vassant feel good to be treated as almost equal by the wife of the Secretary General, although she did not think of it that way, not being snobbish. But young Becky Vesey had been so insignificant that the precinct committeeman could never remember her name even though he noticed her bust. Becky Vesey had not resented it. Becky liked people. She liked Agnes Douglas. Becky Vesey liked everybody. She sat a while, enjoying the warm glow and just a nip more tonic, while her shrewd brain shuffled the bits she had picked up. Presently, she called her stockbroker and instructed him to sell Lunar Enterprises short. He snorted. Allie, that reducing diet is weakening your mind. Listen, Ed. When it's down ten points, cover me, even if it is still slipping. Then when it rallies three points, buy again. Then sell when it gets back to today's closing. There was a long silence. Allie, you know something. Tell Uncle Ed. The stars tell me, Ed. Ed made a suggestion astronomically impossible. All right, if you won't, you won't. Hmm, I never did have sense enough to stay out of a crooked game. Mind if I ride along? Not at all, Ed. Just don't go heavy enough to let it show. This is a delicate situation with Saturn balance between Virgo and Leo. As you say, Allie. Mrs. Douglas got busy at once, happy that Allie had confirmed all her judgments. She gave orders about the campaign to destroy the reputation of the missing Berquist after sending for his dossier. She summoned Commandant Twitchell of the Special Service Squadrons. He left looking unhappy and made life unbearable for his executive officer. She instructed Sanforth to release another man from Mars stereocast with a rumor from a source close to the administration that Smith was about to go, or possibly had gone, to a sanitarium high in the Andes to provide him with climate as much like Mars as possible. Then she thought about how to nail down Pakistan's votes. Presently she called her husband and urged him to support Pakistan's claim to a lion's share of the Kashmir Thorium. Since he had been wanting to, he was not hard to persuade, although nettled by her assumption that he had been opposing it. With that settled, she left to address the Daughters of the Second Revolution on motherhood in the New World. Chapter 10 While Mrs. Douglas was speaking freely on a subject she knew little about, Jubal E. Harshaw, LLB, MD, SCD, Bon Vivant, Gourmet, Sybarite, popular author extraordinary and neo-pessimist philosopher, was sitting by his pool at his home in the Poconos, scratching the gray thatch on his chest and watching his three secretaries splash in the pool. They were all amazingly beautiful. They were also amazingly good secretaries. In Harshaw's opinion, the principle of least action required that utility and beauty be combined. Anne was blonde, Miriam red-headed, and Dorcas dark. 
They ranged, respectively, from pleasantly plump to deliciously slender. Their ages spread over fifteen years, but it was hard to tell which was the eldest. Harshaw was working hard. Most of him was watching pretty girls do pretty things with sun and water. One small, shuttered, sound-proofed compartment was composing. He claimed that his method of writing was to hook his gonads in parallel with his thalamus and disconnect his cerebrum. His habits lent credibility to the theory. A microphone on a table was hooked to a voice writer, but he used it only for notes. When he was ready to write, he used a stenographer and watched her reactions. He was ready now. Front, he shouted. Anne is front, answered Dorcas. I'll take it that splash was Anne. Dive in and get her. The brunette cut the water. Moments later, Anne climbed out, put on a robe, and sat down at the table. She said nothing and made no preparations. Anne had total recall. Harshaw picked up a bucket of ice over which brandy had been poured, took a swig. Anne, I've got a sick-making one. It's about a little kitten that wanders into a church on Christmas Eve to get warm. Besides being starved and frozen and lost, the kitten has, God knows why, an injured paw. All right, start. Snow had been falling since... What pen name? Mm, use Molly Wadsworth. This one is pretty icky. Title it The Other Manger. Start again. He went on talking while watching her. When tears started to leak from her closed eyes, he smiled slightly and closed his own. By the time he finished, tears were running down his cheeks as well as hers, both bathed in catharsis of schmaltz. Thirty, he announced. Blow your nose, send it off, and for God's sake, don't let me see it. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 3, Side 1. Thirty, he announced. Blow your nose, send it off, and for God's sake, don't let me see it. Jubal, aren't you ever ashamed? Nope. Someday I'm going to kick you right in your fat stomach for one of these. I know. Get your fanny indoors and take care of it before I change my mind. Yes, boss. She kissed his bald spot as she passed behind his chair. Harshaw yelled, Fron! And Miriam started toward him. A loudspeaker mounted on the house came to life. Boss! Harshaw uttered one word, and Miriam clucked. He added, Yes, Larry? The speaker answered, There's a dame down here at the gate, and she's got a corpse with her. Harshaw considered this. Is she pretty? Um, uh, yes. Then why are you sucking your thumb? Let her in. Harshaw sat back. Start, he said. City montage, dissolving into medium two-shot interior. A cop is seated in a straight chair, no cap, collar open, face covered with sweat. We see the back of the other figure, depth between us and cop. Figure raises a hand, bringing it back and almost out of the tank. He slaps the cop with a heavy, meaty sound, dubbed. Harshaw glanced up and said, Pick up from there. A car was rolling up the hill toward the house. Jill was driving. A young man was beside her. As the car stopped, the man jumped out as if happy to divorce himself from it. There she is, Jubal. So I see. Good morning, little girl. Larry, where is this corpse? Backseat, boss. Under a blanket. But it's not a corpse, Jill protested. It's... Ben said that you... I mean... She put her head down and sobbed. There, my dear, Harshaw said gently. Few corpses are worth tears. Dorcas, Miriam, take care of her. Give her a drink and wash her face. He went to the back seat, lifted the blanket. Jill shrugged off Miriam's arm and said shrilly, You've got to listen. He's not dead. At least I hope not. He's... Oh, dear. She started to cry again. I'm so dirty and so scared. Seems to be a corpse, Harshaw mused. Body temperature down to air temperature, I judge. Rigor, not typical. How long has he been dead? But he's not. Can't we get him out of there? I had an awful time getting him in. Surely. Larry, help me. And quit looking green. If you puke, you'll clean it up. They got Valentine Michael Smith out and laid him on the grass. His body remained stiff, huddled together. Dorcas fetched Dr. Harshaw's stethoscope, 
set it on the ground, switched it on, and stepped up the gain. Harshaw stuck the headpiece in his ears, started sounding for heartbeat. I'm afraid you're mistaken, he said gently to Jill. This one is beyond my help. Who was he? Jill sighed. Her face was drained of expression, and she answered in a flat voice. He was the man from Mars. I tried so hard. I'm sure you did. The man from Mars? Yes. Ben, Ben Caxton said you were the one to come to. Ben Caxton, eh? I appreciate the confidence. Hush. Harshaw gestured for silence. He looked puzzled, then surprise burst over his face. Hard action. I'll be a babbling baboon. Dorcas upstairs, the clinic, third drawer in the lock, part of the cooler. The code is sweet dreams. Bring the drawer and a one cc hypo. Right away. Doctor, no stimulants. Harshaw turned to Jill. Hey? I'm sorry, sir. I'm just a nurse. But this case is different. I know. Hmm. He's my patient now, nurse. But about 40 years ago, I found out I wasn't God, and 10 years later, I discovered I wasn't even Esculapius. What do you want to try? I want to try to wake him. If you do anything to him, he goes deeper into it. Hmm. Go ahead. Just don't use an axe. Then we'll try my methods. Yes, sir. Jill knelt, started trying to straighten Smith's limbs. Harshaw's eyebrows went up when he saw her succeed. Jill took Smith's head in her lap. Please wake up, she said softly. This is your water, brother. Slowly the chest lifted. Smith let out a long sigh and his eyes opened. He looked up at Jill and smiled his baby smile. He looked around. The smile left him. It's all right, Jill said quickly. These are friends. Friends? All of them are your friends. Don't worry, and don't go away again. Everything is all right. He lay quiet with eyes open, staring at everything. He seemed as content as a cat in a lap. Twenty-five minutes later, both patients were in bed. Jill had told Harshaw before the pill he gave her took hold, enough to let him know that he had a bear by the tail. He looked at the utility car Jill had arrived in. Lettered across, it was... Redding Rentals, Perma-Powered Ground Equipment, Deal with the Dutchman. Larry, is the fence hot? No. Switch it on. Then polish every fingerprint off that heap when it gets dark. Drive over the other side of Redding. Better go almost to Lancaster and leave it in a ditch. Then go to Philadelphia, catch the Scranton shuttle, come home from there. Sure thing, Jubal. Say, is he really the man from Mars? Better hope not. If he is and they catch you before you dump that wagon and connect you with him, they'll quiz you with a blowtorch. I think he is. I scan it. Should I rob a bank on the way back? Probably the safest thing you can do. Okay, boss. Larry hesitated. Mind if I stay overnight in Philly? Suit yourself. But what in God's name can a man do at night in Philadelphia? Harshaw turned away. Front! Jill slept until dinner, awoke refreshed and alert. She sniffed the air from the grill overhead and surmised that the doctor had offset the hypnotic with a stimulant. While she slept, someone had removed her dirty, torn clothes and had left a dinner dress and sandals. The dress was a fair fit. Jill concluded that it must belong to the one called Miriam. She bathed and painted and combed and went down to the living room feeling like a new woman. Dorcas was curled in a chair doing needlepoint. She nodded as if Jill were part of the family, turned back to her fancy work. Harshaw was stirring a mixture in a frosty pitcher. Drink, he said. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. He poured large cocktail glasses to their brims, handed her one. What is it? she asked. My own recipe, one-third vodka, one-third muriatic acid, one-third battery water, two pinches of salt, and add pickled beetle. Better have a highball, Dorcas advised. Mind your business, Harshaw said. Hydrochloric acid aids digestion. The beetle adds vitamins and protein. He raised his glass and said solemnly, Here's to our noble selves. There are damned few of us left. He emptied it. Jill took a sip, then a bigger one. Whatever the ingredients, it seemed to be what she needed. 
well-being spread from her center toward her extremities. She drank about half, let Harshaw add a dividend. Look in on our patient, he asked. No, sir. I didn't know where he was. I checked a few minutes ago, sleeping like a baby. I think I'll rename him Lazarus. Would he like to come down to dinner? Jill looked thoughtful. Doctor, I don't know. Well, if he wakes, I'll know it. He can join us or have a tray. This is Freedom Hall, my dear. Everyone does as he pleases. Then if he does something I don't like, I kick him the hell out. Which reminds me, I don't like to be called doctor. Sir? Oh, I'm not offended. But when they began handing out doctorates for comparative folk dancing and advanced fly fishing, I became too stinking proud to use the title. I won't touch watered whiskey and take no pride in watered-down degrees. Call me Jubal. Oh. But the degree in medicine hasn't been watered down. Time they called it something else so as not to confuse it with playground supervisors. Little girl, what is your interest in this patient? Eh? I told you, Doc... Jubal. You told me what happened. You didn't tell me why. Jill, I saw the way you spoke to him. Are you in love with him? Jill gasped. Why, that's preposterous. Not at all. You're a girl, he's a boy. That's a nice setup. But... No, Jubal, it's not that. I... Well, he was a prisoner, and I thought, or Ben thought, that he was in danger. We wanted to see him get his rights. Hmm... My dear, I'm suspicious of a disinterested interest. You look as if you had a normal glandular balance, so it's my guess that it is either Ben or this poor boy from Mars. You had better examine your motives, then judge which way you are going. In the meantime, what do you want me to do? The scope of the question made it hard to answer. From the time Jill crossed her Rubicon, she had thought of nothing but escape. She had no plans. I don't know. I thought not. On the assumption that you might wish to protect your license, I took the liberty of leaving a message sent from Montreal to your chief of nursing. You asked for leave because of illness in your family, okay? Jill felt sudden relief. She had buried all worry about her own welfare. Nevertheless, down inside was a heavy lump caused by what she had done to her professional standing. Oh, Jubal, thank you, she added. I'm not delinquent in watch standing yet. Today was my day off. Good. What do you want to do? I haven't had time to think. Uh, I should get in touch with my bank and get some money. She paused, trying to recall her balance. It was never large, and sometimes she forgot to... Jubal cut in. If you do, you will have cops pouring out of your ears. And you better stay here until things level off. Uh, Jubal, I wouldn't want to impose on you. You already have. Don't worry, child. There are always freeloaders around here. Nobody imposes on me against my will, so relax. Now, our patient, you said you wanted him to get his rights. You expected my help? Well, Ben said... Ben seemed to think you would help. Ben does not speak for me. I'm not interested in this lad's so-called rights. His claim to Mars, his lawyer's hogwash. As a lawyer myself, I need not respect it. As for the wealth that is supposed to be his, the situation results from other people's passions and our odd tribal customs. He has earned none of it. He would be lucky if they built him of it. But I would not scan a newspaper to find out. If Ben expected me to fight for Smith's rights, you have come to the wrong house. Oh, Jill felt forlorn. I had better arrange to move him. Oh, no. Not unless you wish. But you said... I said I was not interested in legal fictions. But a guest under my roof is another matter. He can stay if he likes. I just wanted to make clear that I had no intention of meddling with politics to suit romantic notions you or Ben Caxton may have. My dear, I used to think I was serving humanity, and I pleasured in the thought. Then I discovered that humanity does not want to be served. On the contrary, it resents any attempt to serve it. So now I do what pleases Jubal Harshaw. He turned away. Time for dinner, isn't it, Dorcas? Is anyone doing anything? Miriam. She put down her needlepoint and stood up. I've never figured out how these girls divide up the work. Boss, how would you know? You never do any. Dorcas patted him on the stomach. But you never miss any meals. A gong sounded. They went in to eat. If Miriam had cooked dinner, 
She had done so with modern shortcuts. She was seated at the foot of the table and looked cool and beautiful. In addition to the secretaries, there was a man slightly older than Larry called Duke, who treated Jill as if she always lived there. Service was by non-android machines, keyed from Miriam's end of the table. The food was excellent, and so far as Jill could tell, none was sent, though. But it did not suit Harshaw. He complained that his knife was dull, the meat was tough, he accused Miriam of serving leftovers. No one seemed to hear him, but Jill was becoming embarrassed on Miriam's account when Anne put down her fork. He mentioned his mother's cooking, she stated. He is beginning to think he is boss again, agreed Dorcas. How long has it been? About ten days. Too long. Anne gathered Dorcas and Miriam by eye. They stood up. Duke went on eating. Harshaw said hastily, Girls, not at meals. Wait until... They moved toward him. A machine scurried out of the way. Anne took his feet, each of the others an arm. French doors slid aside. They carried him out, squawking. The squawks ended in a splash. The women returned, not noticeably must. Miriam sat down and turned to Jill. More salad, Jill? Harshaw returned in pajamas and robe instead of evening jacket. A machine had covered his plate as he was dragged away. It now uncovered it. He went on eating. As I was saying, he remarked, a woman who can't cook is a waste of skin. If I don't start having service, I'm going to swap you all for a dog and shoot the dog. What's dessert, Miriam? Strawberry shortcake. That's more like it. You were all reprieved till Wednesday. After dinner, Jill went into the living room, intending to view a news stereocast, being anxious to find out if she played a part in it. She could find no receiver, nor anything which could conceal a tank. Thinking about it, she could not recall having seen one, nor any newspapers, although there were plenty of books and magazines. No one joined her. She began to wonder what time it was. She had left her watch upstairs, so she looked around for a clock. She failed to find one, then searched her memory and could not remember seeing clock or calendar in any room she had been in. She decided that she might as well go to bed. One wall was filled with books. She found a spool of Kipling's Just So Stories and took it happily upstairs. The bed in her room was as modern as next week, with auto-massage, coffee dispenser, weather control, reading machine, etc. But the alarm circuit was missing. Jill decided that she would probably not oversleep, crawled into bed, slid the spool into the reading machine, lay back and scanned the words streaming across the ceiling. Presently, the control slipped from relaxed fingers. Lights went out. She slept. Jubal Harshaw did not get to sleep as easily. He was vexed with himself. His interest had cooled and reaction set in. Half a century earlier, he had sworn a mighty oath never again to pick up a stray cat, and now so help him by the multiple paps of Venus genetrix he had picked up two at once. No three, if he counted Caxton. That he had broken his oath more times than there were years intervening did not trouble him. He was not hobbled by consistency. Nor did two more pensioners under his roof bother him. Pinching pennies was not in him. In most of a century of gusty living, he had been broke many times, had often been wealthier than he now was. He regarded both as shifts in the weather, and never counted his change. But the foo-for-all that was bound to ensue when the busies caught up with these children disgruntled him. He considered it certain that catch up they would, that naive Jillian infant would leave a trail like a club-footed cow, whereupon people would barge into his sanctuary, asking questions, making demands, and he would have to make decisions and take action. He was convinced that all action was futile. The prospect irritated him. He did not expect reasonable conduct from human beings. Most people were candidates for protective restraint. He simply wished they would leave him alone. All but the few he chose for playmates. He was convinced that, left to himself, he would have long since achieved nirvana, dived into his belly button and disappeared from view like those Hindu jokers. Why couldn't they leave a man alone? Around midnight, he put out his twenty-seventh cigarette and sat up. Lights came on. Front, he shouted at a microphone. Dorcas came in, dressed in robe and slippers. She yawned and said, Yes, boss. Dorcas, the last twenty or thirty years, I've been a worthless, no-good parasite. She yawned again. Everybody knows that. Never mind the flattery. There comes a time in every man's life when he has to stop being sensible. A time to stand up and be counted, strike a blow for liberty, smite the wicked. Um. So quit yawning. 
The time has come. She glanced down. Maybe I'd better get dressed. Yes, get the other girls up, too. We're going to be busy. Throw a bucket of water over Duke and tell him to dust off the babble machine and hook it up in the study. I want the news. Dorcas looked startled. You want stereo vision? You heard me. Tell Duke if it's out of order to pick a direction and start walking. Now get, we've got a busy night. All right, Dorcas agreed doubtfully. But I ought to take your temperature first. Peace, woman! Duke had Harshaw's receiver hooked up in time to let Jubal see a rebroadcast of the second phony interview with the Man from Mars. The commentary included a rumor about moving Smith to the Andes. Jubal put two and two together, after which he was calling people until morning. At dawn, Dorcas brought him breakfast, six eggs beaten into brandy. He slurped them, while reflecting that one advantage of a long life was that eventually a man knew almost everybody of importance and could call on them in a pinch. Harshaw had prepared a bomb, but did not intend to trigger it until the powers that be forced him. He realized that the government could haul Smith back into captivity on grounds that he was incompetent. His snap opinion was that Smith was legally insane and medically psychopathic by normal standards, the victim of a double-barreled situational psychosis of unique and monumental extent, first from being raised by non-humans and second from being pitched into another alien society but he regarded both the legal notion of sanity and the medical notion of psychosis as irrelevant. This human animal had made a profound and apparently successful adjustment to a non-human society, but as a malleable infant. Could he, as an adult with formed habits and canalized thinking, make another adjustment just as radical and much more difficult for an adult? Dr. Harshaw intended to find out. It was the first time in decades he had taken real interest in the practice of medicine. Besides that, he was tickled at the notion of balking the powers that be. He had more than his share of that streak of anarchy which was the birthright of every American. Pitting himself against the planetary government filled him with sharper zest than he had felt in a generation. Chapter 11 Around a minor G-type star, toward one edge of a medium-sized galaxy, planets swung, as they had for billions of years, under a modified inverse square law that shaped space. Four were big enough as planets go to be noticeable. The rest were pebbles, concealed in the fiery skirts of the primary, or lost in black reaches of space. All, as is always the case, were infected with that oddity of distorted entropy called life. On the third and fourth planets, surface temperatures cycled around the freezing point of hydrogen monoxide. In consequence, they had developed life forms similar enough to permit a degree of social contact. On the fourth pebble, the ancient Martians were not disturbed by contact with Earth. Nymphs bounced joyously around the surface, learning to live, and eight out of nine dying in the process. Adult Martians, enormously different in body and mind from nymphs, huddled in fairy, graceful cities, and were as quiet as nymphs were boisterous, yet were even busier, and led a rich life of the mind. Adults were not free of work in the human sense. They had a planet to supervise. Plants must be told when and where to grow. Nymphs who had passed apprenticeships by surviving must be gathered in, cherished, fertilized. The resultant eggs must be cherished and contemplated to encourage them to ripen properly. Fulfilled nymphs must be persuaded to give up childish things and metamorphosed into adults. All these must be done, but they were no more the life of Mars than is walking the dog twice a day, the life of a man who bosses a planet-wide corporation between those walks. Even though to a being from Arcturus III, those walks might seem to be the tycoon's most significant activity, as a slave to the dog. Martians and humans were both self-aware life forms, but they had gone in vastly different directions. All human behavior, all human motivations, all man's hopes and fears were colored and controlled by mankind's tragic and oddly beautiful pattern of reproduction. The same was true of Mars, but in a mirror corollary. Mars had the efficient bipolar pattern so common in that galaxy, but Martians had it in form so different from Terran form that it would be sex only to a biologist, and emphatically not have been sex to a human psychiatrist. Martian nymphs were female. All adults were male. But in each, in function only, not in psychology. 
The man-woman polarity which controlled human lives could not exist on Mars. There was no possibility of marriage. Adults were huge, reminding the first humans to see them of ice boats under sail. They were physically passive, mentally active. Nymphs were fat, furry spheres full of bounce and mindless energy. There was no parallel between human and Martian psychological foundations. Human bipolarity was both binding force and driving energy for all human behavior, from sonnets to nuclear equations. If any being thinks that human psychologists exaggerated this, let it search Terran patent offices, libraries, and art galleries for creations of eunuchs. Mars, geared unlike Earth, paid little attention to the envoy and the champion. The events were too recent to be significant. If Martians had used newspapers, one edition a Terran century would have been ample. Contact with other races was nothing new to Martians. It had happened before would happen again. When a new other race was thoroughly grokked, then, in a Terran millennium or so, would be time for action if needed. On Mars, the currently important event was a different sort. The discorporate old ones had decided almost absent-mindedly to send the nestling human to grok what he could of the third planet, then turned attention back to serious matters. Shortly before, around the time of the Terran Caesar Augustus, a Martian artist had been composing a work of art. It could have been called a poem, a musical opus, or a philosophical treatise. It was a series of emotions arranged in tragic, logical necessity. Since it could be experienced by a human only in the sense in which a man blind from birth might have a sunset explained to him, it does not matter which category it be assigned. The important point was that the artist had accidentally discorporated before he finished his masterpiece. Unexpected discorporation was rare on Mars. Martian taste in such matters called for life to be a rounded whole, with physical death at the appropriate selected instant. This artist, however, had become so preoccupied that he forgot to come in out of the cold. When his absence was noticed, his body was hardly fit to eat. He had not noticed his discorporation and had gone on composing his sequence. Martian art was divided into two categories. That sort created by living adults, which was vigorous, often radical and primitive, and that of the old ones, which was usually conservative, extremely complex, and was expected to show much higher standards of technique. The two sorts were judged separately. By what standards should this opus be judged? It bridged from corporate to discorporate. Its final form had been set throughout by an old one, yet the artist, with the detachment of all artists everywhere, had not noticed the change in his status and had continued to work as if corporate. Was it a new sort of art? Could more such pieces be produced by surprise discorporation of artists while they were working? The old ones had been discussing the exciting possibilities in ruminative rapport for centuries, and all corporate Martians were eagerly awaiting their verdict. The question was of greater interest because it was religious art, in the Terran sense, and strongly emotional. It described contact between the Martian race and the people of the fifth planet, an event that had happened long ago, but which was alive and important to Martians, in the sense in which one death by crucifixion remained alive and important to humans after two Terran millennia. The Martian race had encountered the people of the fifth planet, grokked them completely, and had taken action. Asteroid ruins were all that remained, save that the Martians continued to cherish and praise the people they had destroyed. This new work of art was one of many attempts to grok the whole beautiful experience in all its complexity in one opus. But before it could be judged, it was necessary to grok how to judge it. It was a pretty problem. On the third planet, Valentine Michael Smith was not concerned with this burning issue. He had never heard of it. His Martian keeper and his keeper's water brothers had not mocked him with things he could not grasp. Smith knew of the destruction of the fifth planet, just as any human schoolboy learns of Troy and Plymouth Rock, but he had not been exposed to art that he could not grok. His education had been unique, enormously greater than that of his nestlings, enormously less than that of an adult. His keeper and his keeper's advisors among the old ones had taken passing interest in seeing how much and of what sort this alien nestling could learn. The results had taught them more about the human race than that race had yet learned about itself, for Smith had grokked readily things that no other human being had ever learned. At present, Smith was enjoying himself. He had won a new water brother in Jubal. He had acquired many new friends. 
He was enjoying delightful new experiences in such kaleidoscopic quantity that he had no time to grok them. He could only file them away to be relived at leisure. His brother Jubal told him that he would grok this strange and beautiful place more quickly if he would learn to read. So he took a day off to do so, with Jill pointing to words and pronouncing. It meant staying out of the swimming pool that day, which was a great sacrifice, as swimming, once he got it through his head that it was permitted, was not merely a delight, but almost unbearable religious ecstasy. If Jill and Jubal had not told him to, he would never have come out of the pool at all. Since he was not permitted to swim at night, he read all night long. He was zipping through the Encyclopedia Britannica and sampling Jubal's medicine and law libraries as dessert. His brother Jubal saw him leafing through one of the books, stopped and questioned him about what he had read. Smith answered carefully, as it reminded him of tests the old ones had given him. His brother seemed upset at his answers, and Smith found it necessary to go into meditation. He was sure that he had answered with the words in the book, even though he did not grok them all. But he preferred the pool to the books, especially when Jill and Miriam and Larry and the rest were all splashing each other. He did not learn at once to swim, but discovered that he could do something they could not. He went to the bottom and lay there, immersed in bliss, whereupon they hauled him out with such excitement that he was almost forced to withdraw, had it not been clear that they were concerned for his welfare. Later he demonstrated this for Jubal, remaining on the bottom a delicious time, and tried to teach it to his brother Jill, but she became disturbed and he desisted. It was his first realization that there were things he could do that these new friends could not. He thought about it a long time, trying to grok its fullness. Smith was happy. Harshaw was not. He continued his usual loafing, varied by casual observation of his laboratory animal. He arranged no schedule for Smith, no program of study, no regular physical examinations, but allowed Smith to run wild, like a puppy on a ranch. What supervision Smith received came from Jillian, more than enough in Jubal's grumpy opinion. He took a dim view of males being reared by females. However, Jillian did little more than coach Smith in social behavior. He ate at the table now, dressed himself. Jubal thought he did. He made a note to ask Jill if she still had to assist him. He conformed to the household's informal customs and coped with new experiences on a monkey-see-monkey-do basis. Smith started his first meal at the table using only a spoon, and Jill cut up his meat. By the end of the meal, he was attempting to eat as others ate. At the next meal, his manners were a precise imitation of Jill's, including superfluous mannerisms. Even the discovery that Smith had taught himself to read with the speed of electronic scanning and appeared to have total recall of all that he read did not tempt Jubal Harshaw to make a project of Smith with controls, measurements, and curves of progress. Harshaw had the arrogant humility of a man who has learned so much that he is aware of his own ignorance. He saw no point in measurements when he did not know what he was measuring. But while Harshaw enjoyed watching this unique animal develop into a mimicry copy of a human being, his pleasure afforded him no happiness. Like Secretary General Douglas, Harshaw was waiting for the shoe to drop. Having found himself coerced into action by expectation of action against him, it annoyed Harshaw that nothing happened. Damn it, were Federation cops so stupid that they couldn't track an unsophisticated girl dragging an unconscious man across the countryside? Or had they been on her heels, and now were keeping a stakeout on his place? The thought was infuriating. The notion that the government might be spying on his home, his castle, was as repulsive as having his mail opened. They might be doing that too. Government. Three-fourths parasitic and the rest stupid fumbling. Oh, Harshaw conceded that man, a social animal, could not avoid government any more than an individual could escape bondage to his bowels. But simply because an evil was inescapable was no reason to term it good. He wished that government would wander off and get lost. It was possible, even probable, that the administration knew where the man from Mars was and chose to leave it that way. If so, how long would it go on? And how long could he keep his bomb armed and ready? And where the devil was that young idiot Ben Caxton? Jill Boardman forced him out of his spiritual thumb-twiddling. Jubal? Meh. Oh, it's you, bright eyes. Sorry I was preoccupied. Sit down. Have a drink? 
Uh, no, thank you. Jubal, I'm worried. Normal. That was a pretty swan dive. Let's see another like it. Jill bit her lip and looked about twelve years old. Jubal, please listen. I'm terribly worried. He sighed. In that case, dry yourself off. The breeze is chilly. I'm warm enough. Uh, Jubal, would it be all right if I left Mike here? Harshaw blinked. Certainly. The girls will look out for him. He's no trouble. You're leaving? She didn't meet his eye. Yes. Hmm. You're welcome here. But you're welcome to leave if you wish. Huh? But, Jubal, I don't want to. Then don't. But I must. Play that back. I didn't scan it. Don't you see, Jubal? I like it here. You've been wonderful to us, but I can't stay. Not with Ben missing. I've got to look for him. Harshaw said one earthy word, then added, How do you plan to look for him? She frowned. I don't know, but I can't lie around loafing and swimming with Ben missing. Jillian, Ben is a big boy. You're not his mother nor his wife. You haven't any call to go looking for him, have you? Jill twisted one toe in the grass. No, she admitted. I haven't any claim on Ben. I just know that if I were missing, Ben would look until he found me. So I've got to look for him. Jubal breathed malediction against all gods involved in the foibles of the human race, then said, All right, let's get some logic into it. Do you plan to hire detectives? She looked unhappy. I suppose that's the way to do it. Uh, I've never hired a detective. Are they expensive? Quite. Jill gulped. Would they let me pay, um, uh, in monthly installments? Cash at the stairs is their policy. Quit looking grim, child. I brought that up to dispose of it. I've already hired the best in the business to try to find Ben. There's no need to hawk your future to hire second best. You didn't tell me. No need to. But, Jubal, what did they find out? Nothing, he admitted. So there was no need to put you in the dumps by telling you. Jubal scowled. I had thought you were unnecessarily nervy about Ben. I figured the same as his assistant, that fellow Kilgallen, that Ben had gone yipping off on some trail and would check in when he had the story. He sighed. Now I don't think so. That knothead Kilgallen, he does have a message on file telling him that Ben would be away. My man saw it and sneaked a photograph and checked. The message was sent. Jill looked puzzled. Why didn't Ben send me one too? It isn't like him. Ben's very thoughtful. Jubal repressed a groan. Use your head, Jillian. Just because a package says cigarettes does not prove it contains cigarettes. You got here Friday. The code groups on that stat print show it was filed from Philadelphia. Paoli Station landing flat at 10.30 the morning before, 10.30 a.m. Thursday. It was transmitted and received at once. Ben's office has its own stat printer. All right. You tell me why Ben sent a printed message to his own office during working hours instead of telephoning. Why, I don't think he would. At least I wouldn't. The telephone is the normal. You aren't Ben. I can think of a dozen reasons for a man in Ben's business. To avoid gobbles, to ensure a record in the files of IT&T for legal purposes, to send a delayed message. Lots of reasons. Kilgallen saw nothing odd, and the fact that Ben goes to the expense of a stat printer in his office shows that Ben uses it. However, Jubal went on, that message placed Ben at Paoli Flat at 10.34 on Thursday. Jill, it was not sent from there. But... One moment. Messages are either handed in or telephoned. If handed over the counter, the customer can have a facsimile transmission of handwriting and signature, but if filed by phone, it has to be typed before it can be photographed. Yes, of course. Doesn't that suggest anything, Jill? Jubal, I'm so worried I can't think. Quit breastbeating. It wouldn't have suggested anything to me either. But the pro working for me is a sneaky character. He went to Paoli with a stat print fake from the photograph taken under Kilgallen's nose and with credentials that made it appear that he was Osbert Kilgallen, the addressee. Then with his fatherly manner and sincere face, he conned a young lady into telling things which she should have divulged only under court order. Very sad. Ordinarily, she wouldn't remember one message out of hundreds. 
They go in her ears, out her fingertips, and are gone, save for filed microprints. But this lady is one of Ben's fans. She reads his columns every night. A hideous vice. Jubal blinked. Front. Anne appeared dripping. Remind me, Jubal told her, to write an article on the compulsive reading of news. The theme will be that most neuroses can be traced to the unhealthy habit of wallowing in the troubles of five billion strangers. Title is Gossip Unlimited. No, make that Gossip Gone Wild. Boss, you're getting morbid. Not me, everybody else. See that I write it next week. Now vanish, I'm busy. He turned to Jillian. She noticed Ben's name, thrilled because she was speaking to one of her heroes, but was irked because Ben hadn't paid for vision as well as voice. Oh, she remembers. And she remembers that the service was paid for by cash from a public booth in Washington. In Washington, repeated Jill. Why would Ben call from... Of course, Jubal agreed pettishly. If he's at a booth in Washington, he can have voice and vision with his assistant, cheaper, easier, and quicker than he could phone a message to be sent back to Washington from a hundred miles away. It doesn't make sense. Or it makes just one kind. Hanky-panky. Ben is as used to hanky-panky as a bride is to kisses. He didn't get to be the best winchel in the business through playing his cards face up. Ben is not a winchel. He's a Lippman. Sorry, I'm colorblind in that range. He might have believed that his phone was tapped, but his stat printer was not, or suspected that both were tapped, and used this roundabout relay to convince whoever was tapping him that he was away and would not be back soon. Jubal frowned. In that case, we would do him no favor by finding him. We might endanger his life. Jubal, no. Jubal, yes, he answered wearily. That boy skates close to the edge. That's how he made his reputation. Jill Ben has never tackled a more dangerous assignment. If he disappeared voluntarily, do you want to call attention to the fact? Kilgallen has him covered. Ben's column appears every day. I've made it my business to know. Canned columns? Of course. Or perhaps Kilgallen is writing them. In any case, Ben Caxton is still officially on his soapbox. Perhaps he planned it, my dear, because he was in such danger that he did not dare get in touch even with you. Well? Jillian covered her face. Jubal? I don't know what to do. Snap out of it, he said gruffly. The worst that can happen to him is death, and that we're all in for, in days or weeks or years. Talk to Mike. He regards discorporation as less to be feared than a scolding. Why, if I told Mike we were going to roast him for dinner, he would thank me for the honor with his voice choked with gratitude. I know, Jill agreed in a small voice. But I don't have his philosophical attitude. Nor I, Harshaw agreed cheerfully. But I'm beginning to grasp it. And it is a consoling one to a man my age, a capacity for enjoying the inevitable. Well, I've been cultivating that all my life, but this infant, barely old enough to vote and too unsophisticated to stand clear of the horse cars, has me convinced that I've just reached kindergarten. Jill, you asked if Mike was welcome. Child, I want to keep that boy until I find out what he knows, and I don't. This discorporation thing, it's not the Freudian death wish, none of that, even the weariest river stuff. It's more like Stevenson's glad did I live and gladly die and I lay me down with a will. I suspect that Stevenson was whistling in the dark, enjoying the euphoria of consumption, but Mike has me halfway sold that he knows what he's talking about. I don't know, Jill answered dully. I'm just worried about Ben. So am I, agreed Jubal. Jill, I don't think Ben is hiding. But you said... Sorry. My snoops didn't limit themselves to Ben's office and Paoli flat. On Thursday morning, Ben called at Bethesda Medical Center with a lawyer and a fair witness. James Oliver Cavendish, in case you follow such things. I don't, I'm afraid. No matter. The fact that Ben retained Cavendish shows how serious he was. You don't hunt rabbits with elephant guns. They were taken to see the man from Mars. Chilean gasped, then said, That's impossible. Jill, you're disputing a fair witness. And not just any fair witness. If Cavendish says it, it's gospel. I don't care if he's the Twelve Apostles. He wasn't on my floor last Thursday morning. You didn't listen. I didn't say that they were taken to see Mike. I said they were taken to the man from Mars. The phony one, obviously. That fellow they stereotyped. Oh, of course. And Ben caught them. Jubal looked pained. Little girl... Ben did not catch them. Even Cavendish did not. At least he won't say so. You know how fair witnesses behave. Well, no, I don't. I've never met one. So? Anne! 
Anne was on the springboard. She turned her head. Jubal called out, That house on the hilltop, can you see what color they've painted it? Anne looked, then answered, It's white on this side. Jubal went on to Jill. You see, it doesn't occur to Anne to infer that the other side is white, too. All the king's horses couldn't force her to commit herself, unless she went there and looked, and even then she wouldn't assume that it stayed white after she left. Anne is a fair witness? Graduate, unlimited license, admitted to testify before the high court. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 3, Side 2 Anne is a fair witness? Graduate, unlimited license, admitted to testify before the high court. Sometime ask her why she gave up public practice, but don't plan anything else that day. The wench will recite the whole truth and nothing but the truth, which takes time. Back to Mr. Cavendish. Ben retained him for open witnessing, full disclosure, without enjoining privacy. So when Cavendish was questioned, he answered in boring detail. The interesting part is what he does not say. He never states that the man they saw was not the man from Mars, but not one word indicates that Cavendish accepted the exhibit as being the man from Mars. If you knew Cavendish, this would be conclusive. If Cavendish had seen Mike, he would have reported with such exactness that you and I would know that he had seen Mike. For example, Cavendish reports the shape of this exhibit's ears, and it does not match Mike's ears. QED, they were shown a phony. Cavendish knows it, though he is professionally restrained from giving opinions. I told you they never came near my floor. But it tells us more. This occurred hours before you pulled your jailbreak. Cavendish sets their arrival in the presence of the phony at 9.14 Thursday morning, so the government had Mike under their thumb at that moment. They could have exhibited Mike. Yet they risked offering a phony to the most noted fair witness in the country. Why? Jill answered, You're asking me? I don't know. Ben told me that he intended to ask Mike if he wanted to leave the hospital, and help him if he said yes, which Ben did try, with the phony. So? But, Jubal, they couldn't have known that Ben intended to. And anyhow, Mike wouldn't have left with Ben. Later he left with you? Yes, but I was his water brother, just as you are now. He has this crazy idea that he can trust anyone with whom he has shared a drink of water. With a water brother, he is docile. With anybody else, he is stubborn as a mule. Ben couldn't have budged him. She added, At least, that is the way he was last week. He's changing awfully fast. So he is. Too fast, maybe. I've never seen muscle tissue develop so rapidly. Never mind. Back to Ben. Cavendish reports that Ben dropped him and the lawyer, a chap named Frisbee, at 9.31, and Ben kept the cab. An hour later, he, or somebody who said he was Ben, phoned that message to Paoli Flat. You don't think it was Ben? I do not. Cavendish reported the number of the cab, and my scouts tried to get a look at its daily trip tape. If Ben used his credit card, his charge number should be on the tape, but even if he fed coins into the meter, the tape should show where the cab had been. Well? Harshaw shrugged. The records show that cab in for repairs, and never in use Thursday morning. So either a fair witness misremembered a cab's number, or somebody tampered with the record. He added, Maybe a jury would decide that even a fair witness could misread a number, especially if he had not been asked to remember it. But I don't believe it, not when the witness is James Oliver Cavendish. He would either be certain, or his report would never mention it. Harshaw scowled. Jill, you're forcing me to rub my nose in it. And I don't like it. Granted that Ben could have sent that message, it is most unlikely that he could tamper with the record of that cab, and still less believable that he had reason to. Ben went somewhere, and somebody who could get at the records of a public carrier went to a lot of trouble to conceal where he went, and sent a phony message to keep anyone from realizing that he had disappeared. Disappeared? Kidnapped, you mean? Softly, Jill. Kidnapped is a dirty word. It's the only word. Jubal, how can you sit there when you ought to be shouting it from the... Stop it, Jill. Instead of kidnapped, Ben might be dead. Jillian slumped. Yes, she agreed dully. But we'll assume he is not until we see his bones. Jill, what's the greatest danger about kidnapping? It is a hue and cry. 
because a frightened kidnapper almost always kills his victim. Jillian looked woeful. Harshaw went on gently. I'm forced to say that it is likely that Ben is dead. He has been gone too long. But we've agreed to assume that he is alive. Now you intend to look for him. Jillian, how will you do this without increasing the risk that Ben will be killed by the unknown parties who kidnapped him? Uh, but we know who they are. Do we? Of course. The same people who kept Mike a prisoner, the government. Harshaw shook his head. That's an assumption. Ben has made many enemies with his column, and not all of them are in government. However, Harshaw frowned. Your assumption is all we have to go on. But it's too sweeping. The government is several million people. We must ask ourselves whose toes were stepped on. What individuals? Why, Jubal, I told you, just as Ben told me. The Secretary General himself. No, Harshaw denied. No matter who did what. If it is rough or illegal, it won't be the Secretary General. Even if he benefits, nobody could prove that he even knew it. It is likely he would not know it. Not about rough stuff. Jill, we need to find out which lieutenant in the Secretary General's staff of stooges handled this operation. That isn't as hopeless as it sounds, I think. When Ben was taken to see that phony, one of Douglas's assistants was with him. Tried to talk him out of it, then went with him. It now appears that this same top-level stooge also dropped out of sight last Thursday. I don't think it's coincidence, since he appears to have been in charge of the phony man from Mars. If we find him, we may find Ben. Gilbert Burquist is his name, and I have reason... Burquist? That's the name. I have reason to... Jill, what's the trouble? Don't faint or I'll dunk you in the pool. Jubal, this Burquist... Is there more than one Burquist? Eh? He does seem to be a bit of a bastard. There might be only one. I mean the one on the executive staff. Do you know him? I don't know. But if it is the same one, I don't think there's any use looking for him. Hmm. Talk, girl. Jubal. I'm terribly sorry, but I didn't tell you everything. People rarely do. All right, out with it. Stumbling and stammering, Jillian told about the men who had disappeared. And that's all, she concluded sadly. I screamed and scared Mike, and he went into that trance. And then I had a terrible time getting here. I told you about that. Hmm. Yes. I wish you had told me this, too. She turned red. I didn't think anybody would believe me, and I was scared. Jubal, can they do anything to us? Eh? Jubal seemed surprised. Send us to jail or something. Oh. My dear, it is not a crime to be present at a miracle, nor to work one. But this has more aspects than a cat has hair. Let me think. Jubal held still about ten minutes. Then he opened his eyes and said, I don't see your problem, child. He's probably on the bottom of the pool. He is. So dive in and get him. Bring him to my study. I want to see if he can repeat this. And we don't want an audience. No, we need one. Tell Anne to put on a witness robe. I want her in her official capacity. I want Duke, too. Yes, boss. You're not privileged to call me boss. You're not tax deductible. Yes, Jubal. Hmm. I wish we had somebody who never would be missed. Can Mike do this stunt with inanimate objects? I don't know. We'll find out. Haul him out and wake him up. Jubal blinked. What a way to dispose of... No, I mustn't be tempted. See you upstairs, girl. Chapter 12 A few minutes later, Jill reported to Jubal's study. Anne was there in the white robe of her guild. She glanced up, said nothing. Jill found a chair and kept quiet, as Jubal was dictating to Dorcas. He did not look up, and went on. Under the sprawled body, soaking a corner of the rug and seeping out in a dark red pool on the hearth where it was attracting the attention of two unemployed flies. Miss Simpson clutched at her mouth. Dear me, she said in a distressed voice, Daddy's favorite rug. And Daddy, too, I do believe. End of chapter, Dorcas, and a first installment, mail it off. Git. Dorcas left, taking her shorthand machine and smiling to Jill. Jubal said, Where's Mike? Dressing, answered Jillian. He'll be along soon. Dressing, Jubal repeated peevishly. I didn't say the party was formal. But he has to dress. 
Why, makes no never mind whether you kids wear skin or overcoats. Chase him in. Please, Jubilee's got to learn. Humph! <laughs> You're forcing on him your own narrow-minded middle-class Bible Belt morality. I am not. I'm simply teaching him necessary customs. Customs, morals, is there a difference? Woman, here by the grace of God and an inside straight, we have a personality untouched by the psychotic taboos of our tribe, and you want to turn him into a copy of every fourth-rate conformist in this frightened land. Why not go whole hog, get him a briefcase? I'm not doing anything of the sort. I'm just trying to keep him out of trouble. It's for his own good. Jubal snorted. That's the excuse they gave the tomcat before his operation. Oh. Jill appeared to count ten. She said bleakly, This is your house, Dr. Harshaw, and we are in your debt. I will fetch Michael at once. She stood up. Hold it, Jill. Sir? Sit down and quit trying to be as nasty as I am. You don't have my years of practice. Now let's get something straight. You are not in my debt. Impossible, because I never do anything I don't want to. Nor does anyone, but in my case I know it. So please don't invent a debt that does not exist, or next you will be trying to feel gratitude, and that is the treacherous first step toward complete moral degradation. You grok that? Jill bit her lip, then grinned. I'm not sure what grok means. Nor I. I intend to go on taking lessons from Mike until I do. But I was speaking seriously. Gratitude is a euphemism for resentment. Resentment from most people I do not mind, but from pretty little girls it is distasteful. Why, Jubal, I don't resent you. That's silly. I hope you don't. But you will if you don't root out of your mind this delusion that you are indebted to me. The Japanese have five ways to say thank you, and everyone translates as resentment in various degrees. Would that English had the same built in honesty? Instead, English can define sentiments that the human nervous system is incapable of experiencing. Gratitude, for example. Jubal, you're a cynical old man. I do feel grateful to you, and I shall go on feeling grateful. And you are a sentimental young girl. That makes us a complimentary pair. Let's go to Atlantic City for a weekend of illicit debauchery, just us two. Why, Jubal? You see how deep your gratitude goes? Oh, I'm ready. When do we leave? Hump. We should have left forty years ago. The second point is that you are right. Mike must learn human customs. He must take off his shoes in a mosque, wear his hat in a synagogue, and cover his nakedness when taboo requires, or our shamans will burn him for deviationism. But child, by the myriad aspects of Ariman, don't brainwash him. Make sure he is cynical about it. Uh, I'm not sure I can. Mike doesn't seem to have any cynicism in him. So? Well, I'll lend a hand. Shouldn't he be dressed by now? I'll go see. In a moment, Jill. I explained why I'm not anxious to accuse anyone of kidnapping Ben. If Ben is unlawfully detained, to put it at its sweetest, we have not crowded anyone into getting rid of evidence by getting rid of Ben, if he is alive. He stands a chance of staying alive. But I took other steps the first night you were here. You know your Bible? Uh, not very well. It merits study. It contains practical advice for most emergencies. Every one that doeth evil hateth the light, John something or other, Jesus to Nicodemus. I have been expecting an attempt to get Mike away from us, for it didn't seem likely that you had covered your tracks. But this is a lonely place, and we haven't any heavy artillery. There is one weapon that might balk them. Light, the glaring spotlight of publicity. So I arrange for any ruckus here to have publicity, not just a little that might be hushed up, but great gobs, worldwide and all at once. Details do not matter where cameras are mounted and what linkages have been rigged, but if a fight breaks out here, it will be seen by three networks and hold for release messages will be delivered to a spread of VIPs, all of whom would like to catch our Honorable Secretary General with his pants down. Harshaw frowned. But I can't maintain it indefinitely. When I set it up, my worry was to move fast enough. I expected trouble at once. Now I think we are going to have to force action while I can still keep a spotlight on us. What sort of action, Jubal? I've been fretting about it the past three days. You gave me a glimmering of an approach with that story of what happened in Ben's apartment. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner, Jubal. I didn't think anybody would believe me, and it makes me feel good that you do. I didn't say I believed you. What? But you... I think you told the truth, Jill. But a dream is a true experience of a sort, and so is a hypnotic delusion. But what happens in this room during the next hour will be seen by a fair witness and by cameras which are... 
he pressed a button. Rolling now. I don't think Anne can be hypnotized when she's on duty, and I'll lay odds that cameras can't be. We will find out what kind of truth we're dealing with, after which we can consider how to force the powers that be to drop the other shoe, and maybe figure a way to help Ben, too. Go get Mike. Mike's delay was not mysterious. He had tied his left shoestring to his right, had stood up, tripped himself, fallen flat, and jerked the knots almost hopelessly tight. He spent the rest of the time analyzing his predicament and slowly getting the snarl untied and the strings correctly tied. He was not aware that he had taken long, but was troubled that he had failed to repeat correctly something which Jill had taught him. He confessed his failure, even though he had it repaired when she came to fetch him. She soothed him, combed his hair, herded him in. Harshaw looked up. Hi, son. Sit down. Hi, Jubal. Valentine Michael Smith answered gravely, sat down, waited. Harshaw said, Well, boy, what have you learned today? Smith smiled happily, then answered, as always with a pause. I have today learned to do a one-and-a-half gainer, that is a jumping, a dive, for entering our water, by, I know I saw you. Keep your toes pointed, knees straight, and feet together. Smith looked unhappy. I rightly did not it do. You did it very rightly for a first time. Watch Dorcas. Smith considered this. The water grocks Dorcas. It cherishes him. Her. Dorcas is her, not him. Her, Smith corrected. Then my speaking was false. I have read in Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd edition, published in Springfield, Massachusetts, that the masculine gender includes the feminine gender in speaking. In Hagworth's Law of Contracts, 5th edition, Chicago, Illinois, 1978, on page 1012, it says, Hold it, Harshaw said hastily. Masculine forms do include the feminine when you're speaking in general, but not when talking about a particular person. Dorcas is always she or her, never he or him. I will remember. You had better, or you may provoke Dorcas into proving just how female she is. Harshaw blinked thoughtfully. Jill, is the lad sleeping with you, or one of you? She hesitated, then answered flatly. So far as I know, Mike doesn't sleep. You evaded my question. Then you can assume that I intended to. However, he is not sleeping with me. Hmm. Damn it. My interest is scientific. Mike, what else have you learned? I have learned two ways to tie my shoes. One way is only good for lying down. The other way is good for walking. And I have learned conjugations. I am, thou art, he is, we are, you are, they are, I was, thou wast. Okay, that's enough. What else? Mike smiled delightedly. To yesterday I am learning to drive the tractor, brightly, brightly, and with beauty. Eh? Jubal turned to Jill. When was this? Yesterday while you were napping, Jubal. It's all right. Duke was careful not to let him get hurt. Um, well, obviously he didn't. Mike, have you been reading? Yes, Jubal. What? I have read, Mike recited, three more volumes of the encyclopedia, Mary B. to Mush E., Mush R. to Ozan, P. to Plant I. You have told me not to read too much of the encyclopedia at one reading, so I then stopped. I then read The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet by Master William Shakespeare of London. I then read The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova de saint as translated into English by Arthur Macken. I then read The Art of Cross-Examination by Francis Wellman. I then tried to grok what I would read until Jill told me that I must come to breakfast. And did you grok it? Smith looked troubled. Jubal, I do not know. Something bothering you? I do not grok all fullness of what I read. In the history written by Master William Shakespeare, I found myself full of happiness at the death of Romeo. Then I read on and learned that he had discorporated too soon. Or so I thought I grokked. Why? He was a blithering young idiot. Big pardon? I don't know, Mike. Smith considered this. Then he muttered in Martian and added, I am only an egg. Eh? Hey? You say that when you want to ask a favor, Mike. What is it? Smith hesitated. Then he blurted, 
Jubal, my brother, would please you ask Romeo why he discorporated. I cannot ask him. I am only an egg, but you can. And then you could teach me the grokking of it. Jubal saw that Mike believed that Romeo had been a living person and managed to grasp that Mike expected him to conjure up Romeo's ghost and demand explanations for his conduct in the flesh. But to explain that the Capulets and Montagues had never had corporated existence was another matter. The concept of fiction was beyond Mike's experience. There was nothing on which it could rest. Jubal's attempts to explain were so upsetting to Mike that Jill was afraid that he was about to roll up into a ball. Mike saw how perilously close he was to that necessity, and had learned that he must not resort to this refuge in the presence of friends, because, with the exception of his brother, Dr. Nelson, it caused them emotional disturbance. So he made a mighty effort, slowed his heart, calmed his emotions, and smiled. I will waiting till a grokking comes of itself. Good, agreed Jubal. Hereafter, before you read anything, ask me or Jill or somebody whether or not it is fiction. I don't want you mixed up. I will ask, Jubal. Mike decided that when he did grok this strange idea, he must report the fullness to the old ones, and found himself wondering if the old ones knew about fiction. The incredible idea that there might be something as strange to the old ones as it was to himself was so much more revolutionary than the weird concept of fiction that he put it aside to cool, saved it for meditation. But I didn't, his brother Jubal was saying, call you in to discuss literary forms. Mike, remember the day that Jill took you away from the hospital? Hospital? Mike repeated. I'm not sure, Jubal, Jill interrupted, that Mike knew it was a hospital. Let me try. Go ahead. Mike, you remember where you were, where you lived alone in a room before I dressed you and took you away? Yes, Jill. Then we went to another place, and I undressed you and gave you a bath. Smith smiled in recollection. Yes, it was great happiness. Then I dried you off, and two men came. Smith's smile wiped away. He began to tremble and huddle into himself. Jill said, Mike, stop it. Don't you dare go away. Mike took control of his being. Yes, Jill. Listen, Mike. I want you to think about that time, but you mustn't get upset. There were two men. One of them pulled you out into the living room. The room with the joyful grasses, he agreed. That's right. He pulled you into the room with the grass floor, and I tried to stop him. He hit me. Then he was gone. You remember? You are not angry? What? No, no, not at all. One man disappeared. Then the other pointed a gun at me. And then he was gone. I was frightened, but I was not angry. You are not angry with me now? Mike, dear, I have never been angry with you. Jubal and I want to know what happened. Those two men were there. You did something. And they were gone. What was it you did? Can you tell us? I will tell. The man. The big man hit you. And I frightened, too. So... I... He croaked in Martian, looked puzzled. I do not know words. Jubal said, Mike, can you explain it a little at a time? I will try, Jubal. Something is in front of me. It is a wrong thing and must not be. So I reach out. He looked perplexed. It is an easy thing. Tying shoelaces is much more hard, but the words not are. I am very sorry. He considered it. Perhaps the words are in plants to Ray M, or Ray N to Sar, or Sars to Sork. I will read them tonight and tell you at breakfast. Maybe, Jubal admitted. Just a minute, Mike. He went to a corner and returned with a case which had contained brandy. Can you make this go away? This is a wrong thing? Well, assume that it is. But, Jubal, I must know that it is a wrong thing. This is a box. I do not grok it exists wrongly. Hmm. Suppose I picked this up and threw it at Jill. Smith said with gentle sadness. Jubal, you would not do that to Jill. Uh, 
Damn it, I guess not. Jill, will you throw the box at me? Hard, a scalp wound at least, if Mike can't protect me. Jubal, I don't like the idea. Oh, come on, in the interest of science. And Ben Caxton. But... Jill jumped up, grabbed the box, threw it at Jubal's head. Jubal intended to stand fast, but reflex one. He ducked. Missed me, he said. Confounded I wasn't watching. I meant to keep my eyes on it. He looked at Smith. Mike, is that the... What's the matter, boy? The man from Mars was trembling and looking unhappy. Jill put her arms around him. There, there, it's all right, dear. You did it beautifully. It never touched Jubal. It simply vanished. I guess it did, Jubal admitted, looking around and chewing his thumb. And were you watching? Yes. What did you see? The box did not simply vanish. The process lasted some fraction of a second. From where I'm sitting, it appeared to shrink as if it were disappearing into the distance. But it did not go outside the room. I could see it up to the instant it disappeared. Where did it go? That is all I can report. Hmm. We'll run films later. But I'm convinced. Mike? Yes, Jubal? Where is that box? The box is... Smith paused. Again, I have not words. I am sorry. I'm confused. Son, can you reach in and hold it out? Beg pardon? You made it go away. Now make it come back. How can I? The box is not. Jubal looked thoughtful. If this method becomes popular, it'll change the rules for corpus delecti. I've got a little list. They never will be missed. Mike, how close do you have to be? Beg pardon? If you had been in the hallway and I'd been back by the window, oh, thirty feet, could you have stopped it from hitting me? Smith appeared mildly surprised. Yes. Hmm. Come to the window. Suppose Jill and I were on the far side of the pool and you were here. Could you have stopped the box? Yes, Jubal. Well, suppose Jill and I were down at the gate a quarter of a mile away. Is that too far? Smith hesitated. Jubal, it is not distance. It is not seeing. It is knowing. Hmm. Let's see if I grok it. It doesn't matter how far. You don't even have to see it. If you know that a bad thing is happening, you can stop it. Right? Smith looked troubled. Almost is right. But I'm not long out of the nest, for knowing I must see. An old one does not need eyes to know. He knows, he grocks, he acts. I am sorry. I don't know why you're sorry, Jubal said gruffly. The High Minister for Peace would have declared you top secret ten minutes ago. Beg pardon? Never mind. Jubal returned to his desk, picked up a heavy ashtray. Jill, don't aim at my face. Okay, Mike. Stand in the hallway. Jubal, my brother. Please not. What's the trouble? I want one more demonstration, and this time I won't take my eyes off it. Jubal. Yes, Jill. I grok what is bothering Mike. Well, tell me. We did an experiment where I was about to hurt you with that box. But we are his water brothers, so it upset Mike that I even tried. I think there is something very unmartian about such a situation. Harshaw frowned. Maybe it should be investigated by the Committee on Unmartian Activities. I'm not joking, Jubal. Nor I. All right, Jill. I'll re-rig it. Harshaw handed the ashtray to Mike. Feel how heavy it is, son? See those sharp corners? Smith examined it gingerly. Harshaw went on. I'm going to throw it up and let it hit me in the head as it comes down. Mike stared. My brother, you will now discorporate? Eh? No, no. But it will hurt me unless you stop it. Here we go. Harshaw tossed it straight up within inches of the high ceiling. The ashtray topped its trajectory. Stopped. Harshaw looked at it, feeling stuck in one frame of a motion picture. He croaked. Anne, what do you see? She answered in a flat voice. That ashtray is five inches from the ceiling. I do not see anything holding it up. She added. Jubal, I think that's what I'm seeing, but if my cameras don't show the same thing, I'm going to tear up my license. Um, 
Jill. It floats. Jubal went to his desk and sat down without taking his eyes off the ashtray. Mike, he said, why didn't it disappear? But Jubal, Mike said apologetically, you said to stop it. You did not say to make it go away. When I made the box go away, you wanted it to be again. Have I done wrongly? No. No, you have done exactly right. I keep forgetting that you take things literally. Harshaw recalled insults common in his early years and reminded himself never to use such to Mike. If he told the boy to drop dead or get lost, Harshaw felt certain that the literal meaning would ensue. I am glad, Smith answered soberly. I am sorry I could not make the box be again. I am sorry twice that I wasted food. Then a necessity was. Or so I grokked. Eh? What food? Jill said hastily. He's talking about those men, Jubal. Berquist and the man with him. Oh, yes. Harshaw reflected that he retained unmartian notions of food. Mike, don't worry about wasting that food. I doubt if a meat inspector would have passed them. In fact, he added, recalling the Federation convention about long pig, they would have been condemned as unfit to eat. Besides, it was a necessity. You grokked the fullness and acted rightly. I am much comforted. Mike answered with relief in his voice. Only an old one can always be sure of right action at a cusp, and I have much learning to learn and growing to grow before I may join the old ones. Jubal, may I move it? I am tiring. You want to make it go away? Go ahead. But I cannot. Hey, why not? Your head is no longer under it. I do not grok wrongness in its being where it is. Oh. All right, move it. Harshaw continued to watch, expecting it to float to the spot now over his head and thus regain a wrongness. Instead, the ashtray slanted downward until it was close above his desk, hovered, then came into a landing. Thank you, Jubal, said Smith. Eh? Thank you, son. Jubal picked up the ashtray. It was as commonplace as ever. Yes, thank you. For the most amazing experience I've had since the hired girl took me up into the attic. He looked up. And you trained it, Ryan. Yes. Have you seen levitation before? She hesitated. I've seen what was called telekinesis with dice, but I'm no mathematician and cannot testify that it was telekinesis. Hells, bells, you wouldn't testify that the sun had risen if the day was cloudy. How could I? Somebody might be supplying artificial light above the cloud layer. One of my classmates could apparently levitate objects about the mass of a paper clip, but he had to be three drinks drunk. I was not able to examine it closely enough to testify... Because I'd been drinking, too. You've never seen anything like this? No. Mm. I'm through with you professionally. If you want to stay, hang up your robe and drag up a chair. Thanks, I will. But in view of your lecture about mosques and synagogues, I'll change in my room. Suit yourself. Wake up Duke and tell him I want the cameras serviced. Yes, boss. Don't let anything happen until I get back. Anne headed for the door. No promises. Mike, sit at my desk. Now, can you pick up that ashtray? Show me. Yes, Jubal. Smith reached out and took it in his hand. No, no. I did wrongly? No, it was my mistake. I want to know if you can lift it without touching it. Yes, Jubal. Well, are you tired? No, Jubal. Then what's the matter? Does it have to have a wrongness? No, Jubal. Jubal, Jill interrupted. You haven't told him to. You just asked if he could. Oh. Jubal looked sheepish. Mike, will you please, without touching it, lift that ashtray a foot above the desk? Yes, Jubal. The ashtray raised, floated above the desk. Will you measure, Jubal? Mike said anxiously. If I did wrongly, I will move it. That's fine. Can you hold it? If you get tired, tell me. I will tell. Can you lift something else, too, say this pencil? If you can do it, do it. Yes, Jubal. The pencil ranged itself by the ashtray. By request, Mike added other articles to the floating objects. Anne returned, pulled up a chair, and silently watched. Duke came in carrying a step ladder, glanced, looked a second time, said nothing, and set up the ladder. At last, Mike said uncertainly, I am not sure, Jubal. 
I... He seemed to search for a word. I am idiot in these things. Don't wear yourself out. I can think one more. I hope. A paperweight stirred, lifted, and the dozen odd floating objects all fell down. Mike seemed about to weep. Jubal, I am utmostly sorry. Harshaw patted his shoulder. You should be proud, son. What you just did is... Jubal searched for a comparison within Mike's experience. What you did is harder than tying shoestrings, more wonderful than doing a one-and-a-half gain up perfectly. You did it, uh, brightly, brightly, and with beauty. You grok? Mike looked surprised. I should not feel shame. You should feel proud. Yes, Jubal, he answered contentedly. I feel proud. Good. Mike, I cannot lift even one ashtray without touching it. Smith looked startled. You cannot? No. Can you teach me? Yes, Jubal. You... Smith stopped, looked embarrassed. I again have not words. I will read and read and read until I find words. Then I will teach my brother. Don't set your heart on it. Beg pardon? Mike, don't be disappointed if you do not find the words. They may not be in the English language. Smith considered this. Then I will teach my brother the language of my nest. You may have arrived fifty years late. I have acted wrongly? Not at all. You might start by teaching Jill your language. It hurts my throat, objected Jill. Try gargling aspirin. Jubal looked at her. That's a feeble excuse, nurse. You're hired as research assistant for Martian linguistics, which includes extra duties as may be necessary, and put her on the payroll and be sure it gets in the tax records. She's been doing her share in the kitchen. Shall I date it back? Jubal shrugged. Don't bother me with details. But Jubal, Jill protested, I don't think I can learn Martian. You can try. But what was that about gratitude? Do you take the job? Jill bit her lip. I'll take it. Yes, boss. Smith timidly touched her hand. Jill, I will teach. Jill patted his. Thanks, Mike. She looked at Harshaw. I'm going to learn it just to spite you. He grinned at her. That motive I grok. You'll learn it. Mike, what else can you do that we can't? Smith looked puzzled. I do not know. How could he, protested Jill, when he doesn't know what we can and can't do? Hmm. Yes. And change that title to Assistant for Martian Linguistics, Culture, and Techniques. Jill, in learning their language, you are bound to stumble onto things that are different, really different, and when you do, tell me. And, Mike, if you notice anything which you can do but we don't, tell me. I will tell, Jubal. What things will be these? I don't know, things like you just did. And being able to stay on the bottom of the pool longer than we can. Hmm. Duke. Boss, I've got both hands full of film. You can talk, can't you? I notice the pool is murky. I'm going to add precipitant tonight and vacuum it in the morning. How's the count? It's okay. The water is safe enough to serve at the table. It just looks messy. Let it be. I'll let you know when I want it cleaned. Hell, boss, nobody likes to swim in dishwater. Anybody too fussy can stay dry. Quit jawing, Duke. Film's ready? Five minutes. Good. Mike, do you know what a gun is? A gun, Smith answered carefully, is a piece of ordnance for throwing projectiles by force of some explosive as gunpowder, consisting of a tube or barrel closed at one end, where the... Okay, okay. Do you grok it? I am not sure. Have you ever seen a gun? I do not know. Why, certainly you have, Jill interrupted. Mike, think back to that time we talked about in the room with the grass floor, but don't get upset. One man hit me. Yes. The other pointed something at me. He pointed a bad thing at you. That was a gun. I had think that the word for that bad thing might be gun. Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd Edition, published in... That's fine, son, Harshaw said hastily. Now listen. If someone points a gun at Jill, what will you do? 
Smith paused longer than usual. You will not be angry if I waste food? No. Under those circumstances, no one would be angry at you. But I want to know something else. Could you make the gun go away without making the man go away? Smith considered it. Save the food. Uh, that isn't what I mean. Could you cause the gun to go away without hurting the man? Jubal, he would not hurt. I would make the gun go away. The man, I would just stop. He would feel no pain. He would simply discorporate. The food would not damage. Harshaw sighed. Yes, I'm sure that's the way it would be. But could you cause to go away just the gun, not stop the man, not kill him, just let him go on living? Smith considered it. That would be easier than doing both at once. But, Jubal, if I left him corporate, he might still hurt Jill. Or so I grok it. Harshaw stopped to remind himself that this baby innocent was neither babyish nor innocent, was in fact sophisticated in a culture which he was beginning to realize was far in advance of human culture in mysterious ways, and that these naive remarks came from a superman, or what would do for a superman. He answered Smith, choosing words carefully, as he had in mind a dangerous experiment. Mike, if you reach a uh, cusp, where you must do something to protect Jill. You do it. Yes, Jubal, I will. Don't worry about wasting food. Don't worry about anything else. Protect Jill. Always I will protect Jill. Good. But suppose a man pointed a gun, or simply had it in his hand. Suppose you did not want to kill him, but needed to make the gun go away. Could you do it? Mike paused briefly. I think I grok it. A gun is a wrong thing, but it might be needful for the man to remain corporate. He thought, I can do it. Good, Mike. I'm going to show you a gun. A gun is a wrong thing. A gun is a wrong thing. I will make it go away. Don't make it go away as soon as you see it. Not? Not. I will lift the gun and start to point it at you. Before I can get it pointed at you, make it go away. But don't stop me. Don't hurt me. Don't kill me. Don't do anything to me. Don't waste me as food, either. Oh, I never would, Mike said earnestly. When you discorporate my brother Jubal, I hope to be allowed to eat of you myself, praising and cherishing you with every bite until I grok you in fullness. Harshaw controlled a reflex and answered gravely, Thank you, Mike. It is I who must thank you, my brother. And if it should be that I am selected before you, I hope that you will find me worthy of grokking, sharing me with Jill. You would share me with Jill? Please? Harshaw glanced at Jill, saw that she kept her face serene, reflected that she was probably a rock-steady scrubbed nurse. I will share you with Jill, he said solemnly. But Mike, None of us will be food any time soon. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 4, Side 1 I will share you with Jill, he said solemnly. But Mike, none of us will be food any time soon. I'm going to show you this gun, and you wait until I say. And then be very careful, because I have many things to do before I'm ready to discorporate. I will be careful, my brother. All right. Harshaw opened a drawer. Look in here, Mike. See the gun? I'm going to pick it up. But don't do anything until I tell you. Harshaw reached for the gun. An elderly police special took it out. Get ready. Mike. Now, Harshaw did his best to aim the weapon at Smith. His hand was empty. Jubal found that he was shaking, so he stopped. Perfect, he said. You got it before I had it aimed. I am happy. So am I. Duke, did that get in the camera? Yep. Good. Harshaw sighed. That's all, kids. Run along. Anne said, 
Boss, you'll tell me what the films show? Want to stay and see them? Oh, no, I couldn't. Not the parts I witnessed. But I want to know later whether or not they show that I've slipped my clutches. Okay. Chapter 13 When they had gone, Harshaw started to give orders to Duke. Then said grumpily, What are you looking sour about? Boss, when do we get rid of that ghoul? Ghoul? Why, you provincial lout. Okay, so I'm from Kansas. Never was any cannibalism in Kansas. I'm eating in the kitchen until he leaves. Harshaw said icily. So? Anne can have your check ready in five minutes. It ought not to take more than ten to pack your comic books and your other shirt. Duke had been setting up a projector. He stopped. Oh, it, I didn't mean I was quitting. It means that to me, son. But what the hell? I've eaten in the kitchen lots of times. Of the circumstances. Nobody under my roof refuses to eat at my table because he won't eat with others who eat there. I am an almost extinct breed, an old-fashioned gentleman, which means I can be a cast-iron son of a bitch when it suits me. It suits me right now, which is to say that no ignorant, superstitious, prejudiced bumpkin is permitted to tell me who is fit to eat at my table. I dine with publicans and sinners. That is my business. I do not break bread with Pharisees. Duke said slowly, I ought to pop you one. And I would if you were my age. Don't let that stop you. I may be tougher than you think. If not, the commotion will fetch the others. Do you think you can handle the man from Mars? Him? I could break him in two with one hand. Probably. If you could lay a hand on him. Huh? You saw me try to point a pistol at him. Duke, where's that pistol? Find that pistol, then tell me whether you still think you can break Mike in two. But find the pistol first. Duke went ahead, setting up the projector. Some sleight of hand. The films will show it, Harshaw said. Duke, stop fiddling with that. Sit down. I'll take care of it after you've left. Huh? Jubal, I don't want you touching this projector. You always get it out of whack. Sit down, I said. Duke, I'll bust the damn thing if it suits me. I do not accept service from a man after he is resigned. Hell, I didn't resign. You got nasty and fired me. For no reason. Sit down, Duke, Harshaw said quietly. And let me try to save your life. Or get off this place as fast as you can. Don't stop to pack. You might not live that long. What the hell do you mean? Exactly what I say. Duke, it's irrelevant whether you resigned or were fired. You ended your employment when you announced that you would not eat at my table. Nevertheless, I would find it distasteful for you to be killed on my premises. So sit down and I will do my best to avoid it. Duke looked startled and sat down. Harshaw went on. Are you Mike's water brother? Huh? Of course not. Oh, I've heard such chatter. It's nonsense if you ask me. It is not nonsense and nobody asked you. You aren't competent to have an opinion. Harshaw frowned. Duke, I don't want to fire you. You keep the gadgetry working and save me from annoyance by mechanical buffoonery. But I must get you safely off the place. And then find out who else is not a water brother to Mike. And see that they become such, or send them away too. Jubal chewed his lip. Maybe it would be enough to extract a promise from Mike not to hurt anyone without my permission. Hmm. No, too much horseplay around here. And Mike is prone to misinterpret things. Say if you, or Larry, since you won't be here, picked up Jill and tossed her into the pool. Larry might wind up where that pistol went before I could explain to Mike that Jill was not in danger. Larry is entitled to live his life without having it cut short through my carelessness. Duke, I believe in everyone's working out his own damnation, but that is no excuse to give a dynamite cap to a baby. Duke said slowly, Boss, you've come unzipped. Mike wouldn't hurt anybody. Chuck's his cannibalism talk makes me want to throw up, but don't get me wrong. He's a savage. He doesn't know any better, but he's gentle as a lamb. He would never hurt anybody. You think so? I'm certain. So? You've got guns in your room? I say he's dangerous. It's open season on Martians. Pick a gun, go down to the pool and kill him. Don't worry about the law. I guarantee you'll never be indicted. Go ahead. Do it. Chubal. You don't mean that? No, not really. Because you can't. 
If you tried, your gun would go where my pistol went, and if you heard him, you'd go with it. Duke, you don't know what you're fiddling with. Mike is not gentle as a lamb, and he is not a savage. I suspect we are savages. Ever raised snakes? Uh, no. I did when I was a kid. One winter down in Florida, I caught what I thought was a scarlet snake. Know what they look like? I don't like snakes. Prejudice again, most snakes are harmless, useful, and fun to raise. The scarlet snake is a beauty. Red, black, and yellow, docile, and makes a fine pet. I think this little fellow was fond of me. I knew how to handle snakes, how not to alarm them and not give them a chance to bite. Even the bite of a non-poisonous snake is a nuisance. This baby was my prize. I used to take him out and show him to people, holding him back of his head and letting him wrap himself around my wrist. I got a chance to show my collection to the herpetologist of the Tampa Zoo. I showed him my prize first. He almost had hysterics. My pet was not a scarlet snake. It was a young coral snake, the most deadly snake in North America. Duke, do you see my point? That raising snakes is dangerous? I could have told you. Oh, for Pete's sake. I had rattlesnakes and water moccasins, too. A poison snake is not dangerous, no more than a loaded gun is dangerous. In each case, you must handle it properly. The thing that made that snake dangerous was that I hadn't known what it could do. If in my ignorance I'd handled it carelessly, it would have killed me as casually and innocently as a kitten scratches. That's what I'm trying to tell you about Mike. He seems like an ordinary young male human, rather underdeveloped, clumsy, abysmally ignorant, but bright and docile and eager to learn. But like my snake, Mike is more than he appears to be. If Mike does not trust you, he can be much more deadly than that coral snake. Especially if he thinks you are harming one of his water brothers, such as Jill, or me. Harshaw shook his head. Duke, if you had given way to your impulse to take a poke at me, and if Mike had been standing in that doorway, you would have been dead before you knew it. Much too quickly for me to stop him. Mike would then have been apologetic over having wasted food, namely your beefy carcass, but he wouldn't feel guilty about killing you. That would be a necessity you forced on him, and not important even to you. You see, Mike believes that your soul is immortal. Huh? Well, hell, so do I. But do you? Jubal said bleakly. I wonder. Why, well, certainly I do. Oh, I don't go to church much, but I was brought up right. I've got faith. Good. Though I've never understood how God could expect his creatures to pick the one true religion by faith, it strikes me as a sloppy way to run a universe. However, since you believe in immortality, we need not trouble over the probability that your prejudices will cause your demise. Do you want to be cremated or buried? Oh, for Christ's sake, Jubal, quit trying to get my goat. Not at all. I can't guarantee your safety since you persist in thinking that a coral snake is a harmless scarlet snake. Any blunder may be your last. But I promise I won't let Mike eat you. Duke's chin dropped. Then he answered, explosively, profanely, incoherently. Harshaw listened, then said testily, All right, pipe down. Make any arrangements with Mike you like. Harshaw bent over the projector. I want to see these pictures. Damn, he added. The pesky thing savaged me. You tried to force it. Here. Duke completed the adjustment Harshaw had muffed, then inserted a spool. Neither reopened the question of whether Duke was or was not working for Jubal. The projector was a tabletop tank with adapter to receive solid, sight, sound, four-millimeter film. Shortly, they were watching events leading up to the disappearance of the empty brandy case. Jubal saw the box hurtle toward his head, saw it wink out in midair. And we'll be pleased to know that the cameras back her up. Duke, let's repeat that in slow motion. Okay. Duke spooled back, then announced, This is ten to one. The scene was the same, but slowed down sound was useless. Duke switched it off. The box floated from Jill's hands toward Jubal's head, then ceased to be. But under slow motion, it could be seen shrinking, smaller and smaller until it was no longer there. Duke, can you slow it still more? Just a sec. Something has fouled the stereo. What? Darned if I know it looked all right on the fast run. But when I slowed it, the depth effect was reversed. 
That box went away from us, mighty fast, but it always looked closer than the wall. Swapped parallax, of course, but I never took that cartridge off the spindle. Oh. Hold it, Duke. Run the film from the other camera. Ah, I see. That'll give us a 90-degree cross, and we'll see properly, even if I did jimmy this film. Duke changed cartridges. Sip through the first part, then undercranked on the last part? Go ahead. The scene was unchanged, save for angle. When the image of Jill grabbed the box, Duke slowed action, and again they watched the box go away. Duke cursed. Something fouled the second camera, too. So? It was shooting from the side, so the box should have gone out of frame to one side instead. It went straight away from us again. You saw it? Yes, agreed Jubal. Straight away from us. But it can't. Not from both angles. What do you mean, it can't? It did. Harshaw added, If we had used Doppler radar in place of cameras, I wonder what it would have shown. How should I know? I'm going to take these cameras apart. Don't bother. But, Duke, the cameras are okay. What is 90 degrees from everything else? I'm no good at riddles. It's not a riddle. I could refer you to Mr. A. Square from Flatland, but I'll answer it. What is perpendicular to everything else? Answer. Two bodies, one pistol, and an empty case. What the deuce do you mean, boss? I never spoke more plainly in my life. Try believing the evidence instead of insisting that the cameras must be at fault because what they saw was not what you expected. Let's see the other films. They added nothing to what Harshaw already knew. The ashtray, when near the ceiling, had been out of camera, but its leisurely descent had been recorded. The pistol's image in the tank was small, but so far as could be seen, the pistol had shrunk away into the distance without moving. Since Harshaw had been gripping it tightly when it had left his hand, he was satisfied. If satisfied was the word. Duke, I want duplicate prints of all those. Duke hesitated. I'm still working here? What? Oh, damn it. You can't eat in the kitchen. That's flat. Duke, try to forget your prejudices and listen. I'll listen. When Mike asked for the privilege of eating my stringy old caucus, he was doing me the greatest honor he knows of, by the only rules he knows, what he learned at his mother's knee, so to speak. He was paying me his highest compliment and asking a boon. Never mind what they think in Kansas. Mike uses values taught him on Mars. I'll take Kansas. Well, admitted Jubal, so will I. But it is not free choice for me, nor you, nor Mike. It is almost impossible to shake off one's earliest training. Duke, can you get it through your skull that if you had been brought up by Martians, you would have the same attitude toward eating and being eaten that Mike has? Duke shook his head. I won't buy it, Jubal. Sure about most things, it's just Mike's hard luck that he wasn't brought up civilized, but this is different. This is an instinct. Instinct. Dreck. But it is. I didn't get training at my mother's knee not to be a cannibal. Hell, I've always known it was a sin, a nasty one. But well, the thought turns my stomach. It's basic instinct. Jubal groaned. Duke, how could you learn so much about machinery and never learn anything about how you yourself tick? Your mother didn't have to say, mustn't eat your playmates, dear, that's not nice, because you soaked it up from our culture, and so did I. Jokes about cannibals and missionaries, cartoons, fairy tales, horror stories, endless things. Shucks, son, it couldn't be instinct. Cannibalism is historically a most widespread custom in every branch of the human race. Your ancestors, my ancestors, everybody. Your ancestors, maybe. Hmm. Duke... Didn't you tell me you had some Indian blood? Huh? Yeah, an eighth. What of it? Then, while both of us have cannibals in our family trees, chances are that yours are many generations closer. Because, why, you bald-headed old... Simmer down. Ritual cannibalism was common among Aboriginal American cultures. Look it up. Besides that, as North Americans, we stand a better than even chance of having a touch of Congo without knowing it. And there you are again.
But even if we were Simon pure North European stock, a silly notion, casual bastardy is far in excess of that ever admitted, but if we were, such ancestry would merely tell us which cannibals we are descended from, because every branch of the human race has cannibalism. Duke, it's silly to talk about a practice being against instinct when hundreds of millions have followed it. But, all right, I should know better than to argue with you, Jubal. You twist things. But suppose we did come from savages who didn't know any better. What of it? We're civilized now, or at least I am. Jubal grinned, implying that I am not. Son, aside from my own condition reflex against munching a roast haunch of... Well, you, for example, aside from that trained-in prejudice, I regard our taboo against cannibalism as an excellent idea. Because we are not civilized. Huh? If we didn't have a taboo so strong that you believed it was instinct... I can think of a long list of people I wouldn't trust with my back turned, not with the price of beef what it is today, eh? Duke grudged a grin. I wouldn't take a chance on my ex-mother-in-law. Or how about our charming neighbor on the south who was so casual about other people's livestock during hunting season? Want to bet that you and I wouldn't wind up in his freezer? But Mike I trust, because Mike is civilized. Huh? Mike is utterly civilized, Martian style. Duke, I've talked enough with Mike to know that Martian practice isn't dog-eat-dog dog or Martian-eat-Martian. Martian. They eat their dead instead of burying them or burning them or exposing them to vultures. But the custom is formalized and deeply religious. A Martian is never butchered against his will. In fact, murder doesn't seem to be a Martian concept. A Martian dies when he decides to, having discussed it with friends and received consent of his ancestors' ghosts to join them. Having decided to die, he does so, as easily as you close your eyes. No violence, no illness, not even an overdose of sleeping pills. One second he is alive, and, well, the next second he's a ghost. Then his friends eat what he no longer has any use for, grokking him, as Mike would say, and praising his virtues as they spread the mustard. The ghost attends the feast. It is a bar mitzvah or confirmation service by which the ghost attains the status of old one, an elder statesman, as I understand it. Duke made a face. God, what superstitious junk! To Mike, it's a solemn but joyful religious ceremony. Duke snorted. Jubal, you don't believe that stuff about ghosts. It's just cannibalism combined with rank superstition. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I find these old ones hard to swallow, but Mike speaks of them the way we talk about last Wednesday. As for the rest, Duke, what church were you brought up in? Duke told him. Jubal went on. I thought so. In Kansas, most people belong to yours, or to one enough like it that you have to look at the sign to tell the difference. Tell me, how did you feel when you took part in the symbolic cannibalism that plays so paramount a part in your church's rituals? Duke stared. What the devil do you mean? Jubal blinked solemnly back. Were you a member, or simply went to Sunday school? Huh? Well, certainly I was a member. I still am, though I don't go much. I thought perhaps you weren't entitled to receive it. Well, you know what I'm talking about if you stop to think. Jubal stood up. I shan't argue differences between one form of ritual cannibalism and another. Duke, I can't spend more time trying to shake you loose from prejudice. Are you leaving? If you are, I'd better escort you off the place. Or do you want to stay? Stay and eat with the rest of us cannibals. Duke frowned. Reckon I'll stay. I'll wash my hands of it. You saw those movies. If you're bright enough to pound sand, you figured out that this man Martian can be dangerous. Duke nodded. I'm not as stupid as you think, Jubal. But I won't let Mike run me off the place, he added. You say he's dangerous, but I'm not going to stir him up. Shucks, Jubal. I like the little dope, most ways. Hmm. Damn it, you still underestimate him, Duke. See here, if you feel friendly toward him, the best thing you can do is to offer him a glass of water. Understand me? Become his water brother. Ah, uh, I'll think about it. But, Duke, don't fake it. If Mike accepts your offer, he'll be dead serious. 
He'll trust you utterly. So don't do it unless you are willing to trust him and stand by him no matter how rough things get. Either all out or don't do it. I understood that. That's why I said I'll think about it. Okay. Don't take too long making up your mind. I expect things to get very rough soon. Chapter 14 In Laputa, according to Lemuel Gulliver, no person of importance listened or spoke without help of a climanole, or flapper in English translation, as such servant's duty was to flap the mouth and ears of his master with a bladder whenever, in the opinion of the servant, it was desirable for his master to speak or listen. Without the consent of his flapper, it was impossible to converse with any Laputian of the master class. The flapper system was unknown on Mars. Martian old ones would have as little use for flappers as a snake has for shoes. Martians still corporate could have used flappers, but did not. The concept ran contrary to their way of living. A Martian needing a few minutes or years of contemplation simply took it. If a friend wished to speak with him, the friend would wait. With eternity to draw on, there could be no reason for hurrying. Hurry was not a concept in Martian. Speed, velocity, simultaneity, acceleration, and other abstractions of the pattern of eternity were part of Martian mathematics, but not of Martian emotion. Contrarywise, the unceasing rush of human existence came not from mathematical necessities of time, but from the frantic urgency implicit in human sexual bipolarity. On the planet Terra, the flapper system developed slowly. Time was when any Terran sovereign held public court, so that the lowliest might come before him without intermediary. Traces of this persisted long after kings became scarce. An Englishman could cry herald, although none did, and the smarter city bosses still left their doors open to any gandy dancer or bindle stiff far into the twentieth century. A remnant of the principle was embalmed in Amendments 1 and 9 of the United States Constitution, although superseded by the Articles of World Federation. By the time the champion returned from Mars, the principle of access to the sovereign was dead, in fact, regardless of the nominal form of government, and the importance of a personage could be told by the layers of flappers cutting him off from the mob. They were known as executive assistants, private secretaries, secretaries to private secretaries, press secretaries, receptionists, appointment clerks, etc. But all were flappers, as each held arbitrary veto over communication from the outside. These webs of officials resulted in unofficials who flapped the great man without permission from official flappers, using social occasions or backdoor access or unlisted telephone numbers. These unofficials were called golfing companion, kitchen cabinet, lobbyist, elder statesman, five percenter, and so forth. The unofficials grew webs, too, until they were almost as hard to reach as the great man, and secondary unofficials sprang up to circumvent the flappers of primary unofficials. With a personage of foremost importance, the maze of unofficials was as complex as the official phalanxes surrounding a person merely very important. Dr. Jubal Harshaw, professional clown, amateur subversive, and parasite by choice, had an almost Martian attitude toward hurry. Being aware that he had but a short time to live, and having neither Martian nor Kansan faith in immortality, he purposed to live each golden moment as eternity without fear, without hope, with sybaritic gusto. To this end he required something larger than Diogenes' tub, but smaller than Kubla's pleasure dome. His was a simple place, a few acres kept private with electrified fence, a house of fourteen rooms or so with running secretaries and other modern conveniences. To support his austere nest and rabble staff, he put forth minimum effort for maximum return, because it was easier to be rich than poor. Harshaw wished to live in lazy luxury, doing what amused Harshaw. He felt aggrieved when circumstances forced on him a necessity for hurry, and would never admit that he was enjoying himself. This morning, he needed to speak to the planet's chief executive. He knew that the flapper system made such contact all but impossible. Harshaw disdained to surround himself with flappers suitable to his own rank. He answered his telephone himself if he happened to be at hand, because each call offered odds that he could be rude to some stranger for daring to invade his privacy without cause. Cause by Harshaw's definition. He knew that he would not find such conditions at the executive palace. Mr. Secretary General would not answer his own phone. But Harshaw had years of practice in outwitting human customs. He tackled the matter cheerfully after breakfast. 
His name carried him slowly through several layers of flappers. He was sufficiently a narrow-gauge VIP that he was never switched off. He was referred from secretary to secretary and wound up speaking to an urbane young man who seemed willing to listen endlessly, no matter what Harshaw said, but would not connect him with the Honorable Mr. Douglas. Harshaw knew that he would get action if he claimed to have the man from Mars with him, but he did not think that the result would suit him. He calculated that mention of Smith would kill any chance of reaching Douglas while producing reaction from subordinates, which he did not want. With Caxton's life at stake, Harshaw could not risk failure through a subordinate's lack of authority or excess of ambition. But this soft brush-off tried his patience. Finally, he snarled, Young man, if you have no authority, let me speak to someone who has. Put me through to Mr. Berquist. The stooge suddenly lost his smile, and Jubal thought gleefully that he had at last pinked him. So he pushed on. Well, don't just sit there. Get Gill on your inside line and tell him you've kept Jubal Harshaw waiting. The face said woodenly, We have no Mr. Berquist here. I don't care where he is, get him. If you don't know Gil Berquist, ask your boss. Mr. Gilbert Berquist, personal assistant to Mr. Douglas. If you work around the palace, you've seen Mr. Berquist. Thirty-five, six feet and 180 pounds, sandy hair, thin on top, smiles a lot and has perfect teeth. If you don't dare disturb him, dump it in your boss's lap. Quit biting your nails and move. The young man said, Please hold on. I will inquire. I certainly will. Get me Gil. The image was replaced by an abstract pattern. A voice said, Please wait while your call is completed. This delay is not charged to your account. Please relax while... Soothing music came up. Jubal sat back and looked around. Anne was reading out of the telephone's vision angle. On his other side, the man from Mars was also out of pickup and was watching stereo vision and listening via earplugs. Jubal reflected that he must have that obscene babble box returned to the basement. What you got, son? he asked, reached over and turned on the speaker. Mike answered. I don't know, Jubal. The sound confirmed what Jubal had feared. Smith was listening to a fosterite service. The shepherd was reading church notices. Junior Spirit in Action team will give a demonstration, so come early and see the fur fly. Our team coach, Brother Hornsby, has asked me to tell you boys to fetch only your helmets, gloves, and sticks. We aren't going after sinners this time. However, the little cherubim will be on hand with their first aid kits in case of excessive zeal. The shepherd paused and smiled broadly. And now wonderful news, my children. A message from Angel Ramsay for Brother Arthur Renwick and his good wife Dorothy. Your prayer has been approved, and you will go to heaven at dawn Thursday morning. Stand up, Art. Stand up, Dottie. Take a bow. Camera made reverse cut, showing the congregation and centering on Brother and Sister Renwick. To wild applause and shouts of hallelujah, Brother Renwick was responding with a boxer's handshake, while his wife blushed and smiled and dabbed at her eyes beside him. Camera cut back as the shepherd held up his hand for silence. He went on briskly. The bon voyage party starts at midnight and doors will be locked at that time. So get here early, and let's make this the happiest revelry our flock has ever seen. We're all proud of Art and Dottie. Funeral services will be held 30 minutes after dawn with breakfast immediately following for those who have to get to work early. The shepherd suddenly looked stern, and camera zoomed in until his head filled the tank. After our last bon voyage, the sexton found an empty pint bottle in one of the happiness rooms of a brand distilled by sinners. As passed and done, the brother who slipped, confessed, and paid penance sevenfold, even refusing the usual cash discount. I'm sure he won't backslide. But stop and think, my children. Is it worth risking eternal happiness to save a few pennies on an article of worldly merchandise? Always look for that happy, holy seal of approval with Bishop Digby's smiling face on it. Don't let a sinner palm off on you something just as good. Our sponsors support us. They deserve your support. Brother Art... I'm sorry to have to bring up such a subject. That's okay, Shepherd. Pour it on at a time of such great happiness. But we must never forget that... Jubal switched off the speaker's circuit. Mike, that's not anything you need. Not? Uh... Shucks, the boy's going to have to learn about such things. All right, go ahead. But talk to me later. Yes, Jubal. Harsha was about to add advice to offset Mike's tendency to take literally anything he heard. 
But the telephone's hold music went down and out, and the screen filled with an image, a man in his forties whom Jubal labeled as Cop. Jubal said aggressively, You aren't Gil Berquist. What is your interest in Gilbert Berquist? Jubal answered with pained patience, I wish to speak to him. See here, my good man, are you a public employee? The man hesitated. Yes, you must, I must, nothing. I'm a citizen and my taxes help pay your wages. All morning I've been trying to make a simple phone call and I've been passed from one butterfly brain bovine to another, every one of them feeding out of the public trough. And now, you. Give me your name, job title, and pay number, then I'll speak to Mr. Berquist. You didn't answer my question. Come, come, I don't have to. I'm a private citizen. You are not, and the question I asked, any citizen may demand of any public servant, O'Kelly v. State of California, 1972. I demand that you identify yourself, name, job, number. The man answered tonelessly. You are Dr. Jubal Harshaw. You were calling from... So that's what took so long? That was stupid. My address can be obtained from any library, post office, or telephone information. As to who I am, everyone knows. Everyone who can read. Can you read? Dr. Harshaw, I am a police officer, and I require your cooperation. What is your reason? Pooh, sir, I'm a lawyer. A citizen is required to cooperate with police under certain conditions only, for example, during hot pursuit, in which case the police officer may still be required to show credentials. Is this hot pursuit, sir? Are you about to dive through this blasted instrument? Second, a citizen may be required to cooperate within reasonable and lawful limits in the course of police investigation. This is an investigation. Of what, sir? Before you may require my cooperation, you must identify yourself, satisfy me as to your bona fides, state your purpose, and if I so require, cite the code and show that reasonable necessity exists. You have done none of these. I wish to speak to Mr. Berquist. The man's jaw muscles were jumping, but he answered, I'm Captain Heinrich of the Federation SS Bureau. The fact that you reached me by calling the Executive Palace should be proof that I am who I say I am. However, he took out a wallet, flipped it open, and held it to his pickup. Harshaw glanced at the ID. Very well, Captain, he growled. Will you now explain why you are keeping me from speaking with Mr. Berquist? Mr. Berquist is not available. Then why didn't you say so? Transfer my call to someone of Berquist's rank. I mean, one of the people who work directly with the Secretary General, as Gill does. I don't propose to be fobbed off on some junior assistant flunky with no authority to blow his own nose. If Gill isn't there, then for God's sake, get me someone of equal rank. You have been trying to telephone the Secretary General. Precisely. Very well. You may explain what business you have with the Secretary General. And I may not. Are you a confidential assistant to the Secretary General? Are you privy to his secrets? That's beside the point. That's exactly the point. As a police officer, you know better. I shall explain to some person known to me to be cleared for sensitive material and in Mr. Douglas's confidence, just enough to make sure that the Secretary General speaks to me. Are you sure Mr. Berquist can't be reached? Quite sure. Then it will have to be someone else of his rank. If it's that secret... You shouldn't be calling over a phone. My good captain, since you had this call traced, you know that my phone is equipped to receive a maximum security return call. The SS officer ignored this. Instead, he answered, Doctor, I'll be blunt. Until you explain your business, you aren't going to get anywhere. If you call again, your call will be routed to this office. Call a hundred times or a month from now. Same thing. Until you cooperate. Jubal smiled happily. It won't be necessary now as you have let slip. Unwittingly, or was it intentional? The one datum needed before we act, if we must. I can hold them off the rest of the day, but the code word is no longer Berquist. What the devil do you mean? My dear Captain, please, not over an unscrambled circuit. But uh, you know, or should know, that I am a senior philosophunculist on active duty. Repeat, haven't you studied Amphigory? Gad, what they teach in schools these days. Back to your pinochle game, I don't need you. Jubal switched off, set the phone for ten minutes' refusal, said, Come along, kids, and returned to his loafing spot near the pool. He cautioned Anne to keep her witness robe at hand, told Mike to stay in earshot, and gave Miriam instructions concerning the telephone. Then he relaxed. He was not displeased. 
He had not expected to reach the Secretary General at once. His reconnaissance had uncovered one weak spot in the wall surrounding the Secretary, and he expected that his bout with Captain Heinrich would bring a return call from a higher level. If not, the exchange of compliments with the SS cop had been rewarding in itself, and it left him in a warm glow. Harshaw held that certain feet were made for stepping on, in order to improve the breed, promote the general welfare, and minimize the ancient insolence of office. He had seen at once that Heinrich had such feet. But he wondered how long he could wait. In addition to the pending collapse of his bomb, and the fact that he had promised Jill to take steps on behalf of Caxton, something new was crowding him. Duke was gone. Gone for the day? Gone for good or for bad, Jubal did not know. Duke had been at dinner, had not shown up for breakfast. Neither was noteworthy in Harshaw's household, and no one else seemed to miss Duke. Jubal looked across the pool, watched Mike attempt to perform a dive exactly as Dorcas had just performed it, and admitted to himself that he had not asked about Duke this morning on purpose. The truth was that he did not want to ask the bear what had happened to Algy. The bear might answer. Well, there was only one way to cope with weakness. Mike, come here. Yes, Jubal. The man from Mars got out of the pool and trotted over like an eager puppy. Harshaw looked him over, decided that he must weigh twenty pounds more than he had on arrival. All of it muscle. Mike, do you know where Duke is? No, Jubal. Well, that settled it. The boy didn't know how to lie. Wait, hold it. Jubal remembered Mike's computer-like habit of answering only the question asked. And Mike had not appeared to know where that pesky box was once it was gone. Mike, when did you see him last? I saw Duke go upstairs when Jill and I came downstairs this morning when time to cook breakfast. Mike added proudly, I helped cooking. That was the last time you saw Duke? I am not see Duke since, Jubal. I proudly burned toast. I'll bet you did. You'll make some woman a fine husband if you aren't careful. Oh, I burned it most carefully. Jubal? Huh? Yes, Anne. Duke grabbed an early breakfast and lit out for town. I thought you knew. Well, Jubal temporized. I thought he intended to leave after lunch. Jubal suddenly felt a load lifted. Not that Duke meant anything to him. Of course not. For years he had avoided letting any human being be important to him. But it would have troubled him. A little, anyhow. What statute was violated in turning a man 90 degrees from everything else? Not murder, as long as the lad used it only in self-defense or in the proper defense of another, such as Jill. Pennsylvania laws against witchcraft might apply, but it would be interesting to see how an indictment would be worded. A civil action might lie. Could harboring the man from Mars be construed as maintaining an attractive nuisance? It was likely that new rules of law must evolve. Mike had already kicked the bottom out of medicine and physics, even though the practitioners of such were aware of the chaos. Harshaw recalled the tragedy that relativity had been for many scientists. Unable to digest it, they had taken refuge in anger at Einstein. Their refuge had been a dead end. All that inflexible old guard could do was die and let younger minds take over. His grandfather had told him of the same thing in medicine when germ theory came along. Physicians had gone to their graves calling Pasteur a liar, a fool, or worse, without examining evidence which their common sense told them was impossible. Well, he could see that Mike was going to cause more hurrah than Pasteur and Einstein combined. Which reminded him. Larry, where's Larry? Here, boss, the loudspeaker behind him announced. Down in the shop. Got the panic button? Sure. You said to sleep with it. I do. Bounce up here and give it to Anne. And keep it with your robe. She nodded. Larry answered, Right away, boss. Countdown coming up? Just do it. Jubal found that the man from Mars was still in front of him, quiet as a sculptured figure. Sculpture? Ah, uh, Jubal searched his memory. Michelangelo's David. Yes, even the puppyish hands and feet. The serenely sensual face, the tousled, too long hair. That was all, Mike. Yes, Jubal. But Mike waited. Jubal said, Something on your mind, son. 
about what I was seeing in that goddamn noisy box. You said, but talk to me later. Oh. Harshaw recalled the Fosterite broadcast and winced. Yes, but don't call that thing a goddamn noisy box. It is a stereo vision receiver. Mike looked puzzled. Is it not a goddamn noisy box? I heard you not rightly. It is indeed a goddamn noisy box, but you must call it a stereo vision receiver. I will call it a stereo vision receiver. Why, Jubal? I do not grok. Harshaw sighed. He had climbed these stairs too many times. Any conversation with Smith turned up human behavior which could not be justified logically, and attempts to do so were endlessly time-consuming. I do not grok it myself, Mike, he admitted, but Jill wants you to say it that way. I will do it, Jubal. Jill wants it. Now tell me what you saw and heard, and what you grok of it. Mike recalled every word and action in the babble tank, including all commercials. Since he had almost finished the encyclopedia, he had read articles on religion, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Confucianism, Buddhism, and related subjects. He had grokked none of this. Jubal learned that, A, Mike did not know that the Fosterite service was religious. B, Mike remembered what he had read about religions, but had filed such for future meditation, not having understood them. C, Mike had a most confused notion of what religion meant, although he could quote nine dictionary definitions. D. The Martian language contained no word which Mike could equate with any of these definitions. E. The customs which Jubal had described to Duke as Martian religious ceremonies were not. To Mike, such matters were as matter-of-fact as grocery markets were to Jubal. F. It was not possible to separate in the Martian tongue the human concepts religion, philosophy, and science. And since Mike thought in Martian, it was not possible for him to tell them apart. All such matters were learnings from the old ones. Doubt he had never heard of, nor of research, no Martian word for either. The answers to any questions were available from the old ones, who were omniscient and infallible, whether on tomorrow's weather or cosmic teleology. Mike had seen a weather forecast and had assumed that this was a message from human old ones for those still corporate. He held a similar assumption concerning the authors of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 4, Side 2. Mike had seen a weather forecast and had assumed that this was a message from human old ones for those still corporate. He held a similar assumption concerning the authors of the Encyclopedia Britannica. But last, and worst, to Jubal, Mike had grok the Fosterite service as announcing impending discorporation of two humans to join the human old ones. And Mike was tremendously excited. Had he grokked it rightly? Mike knew that his English was imperfect. He made mistakes through ignorance, being only an egg. But had he grokked this correctly? He had been waiting to meet the human old ones. He had many questions to ask. Was this an opportunity? Or did he require more learnings before he was ready? Jubal was saved by the bell. Dorcas arrived with sandwiches and coffee. Jubal ate silently, which suited Smith, as his rearing had taught him that eating was a time of meditation. Jubal stretched his meal while he pondered, and cursed himself for letting Mike watch stereo. Oh, the boy had to come up against religions. Couldn't be helped if he was going to spend his life on this dizzy planet. But damn it, it would have been better to wait until Mike was used to the cockeyed pattern of human behavior. And not Fosterites, as his first experience... A devout agnostic, Jubal rated all religions, from the animism of Kalahari Bushmen to the most intellectualized faith as equal. But emotionally, he disliked some more than others, and the Church of the New Revelation set his teeth on edge. The Fosterites' flat-footed claim to gnosis through a direct line to heaven, their arrogant intolerance, their football rally and sales convention services, these depressed him. If people must go to church, why the devil couldn't they be dignified like Catholics, Christian scientists, or Quakers? If God existed, concerning which Jubal maintained neutrality, and if he wanted to be worshipped, a proposition which Jubal found improbable, but nevertheless possible in the light of his own ignorance, then it seemed wildly unlikely that a god potent to shape galaxies would be swayed by the whoop de doo nonsense the Fosterites offered as worship. 
But with bleak honesty, Jubal admitted that the Fosterites might own the truth, the exact truth, nothing but the truth. The universe was a silly place at best, but the least likely explanation for it was the no explanation of random chance. The conceit that abstract somethings just happened to be atoms that just happened to get together in ways which just happened to look like consistent laws, and some configurations just happened to possess self-awareness, and that, too, just happened to be the man from Mars and a bald-headed old coot with Jubal inside. Now, he could not swallow the just-happened theory, popular as it was with men who called themselves scientists. Random chance was not a sufficient explanation of the universe. Random chance was not sufficient to explain random chance. The pot could not hold itself. What, then? Least hypothesis deserved no preference. Occam's razor could not slice the prime problem, the nature of the mind of God. Might as well call it that, you old scoundrel. It's an Anglo-Saxon monosyllable, not banned by four letters, and as good a tag for what you don't understand as any. Was there any basis for preferring any sufficient hypothesis over another? When you did not understand a thing? No. Jubal admitted that a long life had left him not understanding the basic problems of the universe. The Fosterites might be right. But, he reminded himself savagely, two things remained, his taste and his pride. If the Fosterites held a monopoly on truth, if heaven were open only to Fosterites, then he, Jubal Harshaw, gentleman, preferred that eternity of pain-filled damnation promised to sinners who refused the new revelation. He could not see the naked face of God, but his eyesight was good enough to pick out his social equals, and those Fosterites did not measure up. But he could see how Mike had been misled. The Fosterite going to heaven at a selected time did sound like the voluntary discorporation, which Jubal did not doubt was the practice on Mars. Jubal suspected that a better term for the Fosterite practice was murder, but such had never been proved and rarely hinted. Foster had been the first to go to heaven on schedule, dying at a prophesied instant. Since then, it had been a Fosterite mark of special grace. It had been years since any coroner had had the temerity to pry into such deaths. Not that Jubal cared. A good Fosterite was a dead Fosterite. But it was going to be hard to explain. No use stalling. Another cup of coffee wouldn't make it easier. Mike, who made the world? Beg pardon? Look around you. All this. Mars, too, the stars, everything. You and me and everybody. Did the old ones tell you who made it? Mike looked puzzled. No, Jubal. Well, have you wondered? Where did the sun come from? Who put the stars in the sky? Who started it? All. Everything. The whole world. The universe. So that you and I are here talking. Jubal paused, surprised at himself. He had intended to take the usual agnostic approach and found himself compulsively following his legal training, being an honest advocate in spite of himself, attempting to support a religious belief he did not hold, but which was believed by most human beings. He found that willy-nilly he was attorney for the orthodoxies of his own race against... he wasn't sure what... an unhuman viewpoint... How do your old ones answer such questions? Jubal, I do not grok that these are questions. I am sorry. Eh? I don't grok your answer. Mike hesitated. I will try, but words are... are not... rightly. Not pudding, not mating... A nowing. World is. World was. World shall be. Now. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be. World without end. Mike smiled happily. You grok it. I don't grok it, Jubal answered gruffly. I'm quoting something uh, an old one said. He decided to try another approach. God the Creator was not the aspect of deity to use as an opening. Mike did not grasp the idea of creation. Well, Jubal wasn't sure that he did either. Long ago he had made a pact with himself to postulate a created universe on even-numbered days, a tail-swallowing eternal and uncreated universe on odd-numbered days. 
since each hypothesis, whole paradoxical, avoided the paradoxes of the other, with a day off each leap year for sheer solipsist debauchery. Having tabled an unanswerable question, he had given no thought to it for more than a generation. Jubal decided to explain religion in its broadest sense and tackle the notion of deity and its aspects later. Mike agreed that learnings came in various sizes, from little learnings that a nestling could grok, on up to great learnings which only an old one could grok in fullness. But Jubal's attempt to draw a line between small learnings and great, so that great learnings would have the meanings of religious questions, was not successful. Some religious questions did not seem to Mike to be questions, such as creation, and others seemed to him to be little questions, with answers obvious to nestlings, such as life after death. Jubal dropped it and passed on to the multiplicity of human religions. He explained that humans had hundreds of ways by which great learnings were taught, each with its own answers and each claiming to be the truth. What is truth? Mike asked. What is truth? asked a Roman judge and washed his hands. Jubal wished that he could do likewise. An answer is truth when you speak rightly, Mike. How many hands do I have? Two hands. I see two hands, Mike amended. Anne glanced up from reading. In six weeks I could make a witness of him. Quiet, Anne. Things are tough enough. Mike, you spoke rightly. I have two hands. Your answer is truth. Suppose you said that I had seven hands. Mike looked troubled. I do not grok that I could say that. No, I don't think you could. You would not speak rightly if you did. Your answer would not be truth. But, Mike, listen carefully. Each religion claims to be truth, claims to speak rightly. Yet their answers are as different as two hands and seven hands. Fosterites say one thing, Buddhists say another, Muslims still another. Many answers, all different. Mike seemed to be making great effort. All speak rightly? Jubal, I do not grok. Nor I. The man from Mars looked troubled, then suddenly smiled. I will ask the Fosterites to ask your old ones, and then we will know, my brother. How will I do this? A few minutes later, Jubal found, to his disgust, that he had promised Mike an interview with some Fosterite big mouth. Nor had he been able to dent Mike's assumption that Fosterites were in touch with human old ones. Mike's difficulty was that he didn't know what a lie was. Definitions of lie and falsehood had been filed in his mind with no trace of grokking. One could speak wrongly only by accident. So he had taken the Fosterite service at its face value. Jubal tried to explain that all human religions claimed to be in touch with old ones one way or another. Nevertheless, their answers were all different. Mike looked patiently troubled. Jubal, my brother, I try... But I do not grok how this can be right speaking. With my people, old ones speak always rightly. Your people? Hold it, Mike. Beg pardon? When you said my people, you were talking about Martians. Mike, you are not a Martian. You are a man. What is man? Jubal groaned. Mike could, he was sure, quote the dictionary definitions, yet the lad never asked a question to be annoying. He asked always for information, and expected Jubal to be able to tell him. I am a man. You are a man. Larry is a man. But Anne is not a man? Um, Anne is a man, a female man, a woman. Thanks, Jubal. Shut up, Anne. A baby is a man? I have seen pictures, and in the goddamn noise, in stereovision. A baby is not shaped like Anne, and Anne is not shaped like you, and you are not shaped like I. But a baby is a nestling man? Uh, yes, a baby is a man. Jubal, I think I grok that my people, Martians, are man. Not shape. Shape is not man. Man is grokking. I speak rightly? Jubal decided to resign from the Philosophical Society and take up tatting. What was grokking? He had been using the word for a week, and he didn't grok it. But what was man? A featherless biped? God's image? 
or a fortuitous result of survival of the fittest in a circular definition? The heir of death and taxes? The Martians seemed to have defeated death, and they seemed not to have money, property, nor government in any human sense, so how could they have taxes? Yet the boy was right. Shape was irrelevant in defining man, as unimportant as the bottle containing the wine. You could even take a man out of his bottle, like that poor fellow whose life those Russians had saved by placing his brain in a vitreous envelope and wiring him like a telephone exchange. God, what a horrible joke. He wondered if the poor devil appreciated the humor. But how, from the viewpoint of a Martian, did man differ from other animals? Would a race that could levitate, and God knows what else, be impressed by engineering? If so, would the Aswan Dam or a thousand miles of coral reef win first prize? Man's self-awareness? Sheer conceit. There was no way to prove that sperm whales or sequoias were not philosophers and poets exceeding any human merit. There was one field in which man was unsurpassed. He showed unlimited ingenuity in devising bigger and more efficient ways to kill off, enslave, harass, and in all ways make an unbearable nuisance of himself to himself. Man was his own grimmest joke on himself. The very bedrock of humor was... Man is the animal who laughs, Jubal answered. Mike considered this. Then I am not a man. Huh? I do not laugh. I have heard laughing, and it frighted me. Then I grokked that it did not hurt. I have tried to learn. Mike threw his head back and gave out a raucous cackle. Jubal covered his ears. Stop! You heard, Mike agreed sadly. I cannot rightly do it, so I am not a man. Wait a minute, son, you simply haven't learned yet, and you'll never learn by trying. But you will, I promise you. If you live among us long enough, one day you will see how funny we are, and you will laugh. I will? You will. Don't worry, just let it come. Why, son, even a Martian would laugh once he grokked us. I will wait, Smith agreed placidly. And while you are waiting, don't doubt that you are man. You are. Man born of woman and born to trouble. And someday you will grok its fullness and laugh, because man is the animal that laughs at himself. About your Martian friends, I do not know. But I grok that they may be man. Yes, Jubal. Harshaw thought that the interview was over and felt relieved. He had not been so embarrassed since a day long ago when his father had explained the birds and the bees and the flowers. Much too late. But the man from Mars was not yet done. Jubal, my brother, you were ask me, who made the world? And I did not have words why I did not grok it rightly to be a question. I have been thinking words. So? You told me, God made the world. No, no, Harshaw said. I told you that while religion said many things, most of them said God made the world. I told you that I did not grok the fullness, but that God was the word that was used. Yes, Jubal, Mike agreed. Word is God. He added, You grok. I must admit I don't grok. You grok, Smith repeated firmly. I am explained. I did not have the word. You grok, and groks, I grok. The grasses under my feet grok in happy beauty, but I needed the word. The word is God. Go ahead. Mike pointed triumphantly at Jubal. Thou art God. Jubal slapped a hand to his face. Oh, Jesus H., what have I done? Look, Mike, take it easy. You didn't understand me. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Just forget what I've said, and we'll start over another day. But thou art God, Mike repeated serenely. That which groks. Anne is God. I am God. The happy grasses are God. Jill groks in beauty always. Jill is God. All shaping and making and creating together. He crooked something in Martian and smiled. All right, Mike, but let it wait. Anne, have you been getting this? You bet I have, boss. Make a tape. I'll have to work on it. I can't let it stand. I must. Jubal glanced up, said, Oh, my God. General quarters, everybody. Anne, set the panic button on dead man, and for God's sake, keep your thumb on it. They may not be coming here. He glanced up again. 
at two air cars approaching from the south. I'm afraid they are. Mike, hide in the pool. Remember what I told you. Down in the deepest part, stay there, hold still. Don't come up until I send Jill. Yes, Jubal. Right now, move. Yes, Jubal. Mike ran the few steps, cut water, and disappeared. He kept his knees straight, toes pointed, feet together. Jill, Jubal called out. Dive in and climb out. You too, Larry. If anybody saw that, I want them confused as to how many are using the pool. Dorcas, climb out fast, child, and dive in again. And, uh, no, you've got the panic button. I can take my cloak and go to the edge of the pool. Boss, do you want to delay on this dead man setting? Uh, thirty seconds. If they land, put on your witness cloak and get your thumb back on the button. Then wait. And if I call you to me, let the balloon go up. I don't dare shout wolf unless... He shielded his eyes. One of them is going to land, and it's got that paddy wagon look. Oh, damn, I thought they would parley. The first car hovered, dropped for a landing in the garden around the pool. The second started circling at low altitude. The cars were squad carriers in size and showed a small insignia, the stylized globe of the Federation. Anne put down the radio relay link, got quickly into professional garb, picked up the link, and put her thumb on the button. The door of the first car opened as it touched, and Jubal charged toward it with the belligerence of a Pekingese. As a man stepped out, Jubal roared, Get that goddamn heap off my rose bushes! The man said, Jubal Harshaw, tell that oaf to raise that bucket and move it back, off the garden and onto the grass. And Coming, boss! Jubal Harshaw, I have a warrant for... I don't care if you've got a warrant for the King of England. Move that junk off my flowers, then so help me. I'll sue you for... Jubal glanced at the man, appeared to see him for the first time. Oh, so it's you, he said with bitter contempt. Were you born, stupid Heinrich, or did you have to study? When did that uniform jackass learn to fly? Please examine this warrant, Captain Heinrich said with careful patience. Then... Get your go-card out of my flower beds or I'll make a civil rights case that will cost you your pension. Heinrich hesitated. Now, Jubal screamed, and tell those yokels getting out to pick up their feet that idiot with the buck teeth is standing on a prize, Elizabeth M. Hewitt. Heinrich turned his head. You men, careful of those flowers. Paskin, you're standing on one. Rogers, raise the car and move back clear of the garden. He turned to Harshaw. Does that satisfy you? Once he moves it, but you'll still pay damages. Let's see your credentials, and show them to the fair witness, and state loud and clear your name, rank, organization, and pay number. You know who I am. I have a warrant to... I have a warrant to part your hair with a shotgun unless you do things legally and in order. I don't know who you are. You look like a stuffed shirt I saw over the telephone. But I don't identify you. You must identify yourself in specified fashion, World Code Paragraph 1602, Part 2, before you may serve a warrant. And that goes for those other apes, too, and that pithecan parasite piloting for you. They are police officers, acting under my orders. I don't know that they are. They might have hired those ill-fitting clown suits at a costumer's. The letter of the law, sir. You've come barging into my castle. You say you are a police officer, and you allege that you have a warrant for this intrusion, but I say you are trespassers until you prove otherwise, which invokes my sovereign right to use force to eject you, which I shall start to do in about three seconds. I wouldn't advise it. Why are you to advise? If I'm hurt in attempting to enforce this my right, your action becomes constructive assault with deadly weapons. If the things those mules are toting are guns, as they appear to be, civil and criminal both. Why, well, my man, I'll have your hide for a dull mat. Jubal drew back a skinny arm and clenched a fist. Off my property. Hold it, doctor. We'll do it your way. Heinrich had turned red, but he kept his voice under tight control. He offered his identification, which Jubal glanced at, then handed back for Heinrich to show to Anne. He then stated his full name, said that he was a captain of police, Federation Special Service Bureau, and recited his pay number. One by one, the other troopers and the driver went through the rigmarole at Heinrich's frozen-faced orders. When they were done, Jubal said sweetly, And now, Captain, how may I help you? I have a warrant for Gilbert Berquist, which warrant names this property, its buildings, and grounds. Show it to me, then show it to the witness. I will do so. I have another warrant similar to the first for Gillian Boardman. Who? Gillian Boardman. The charge is kidnapping. My goodness. And another for Hector C. Johnson. And one for Valentine Michael Smith. And one for you, Jubal Harshaw. Me. Taxes again? No, accessory to this and that. And material witness on other things. 
Then I'd take you in on my own for obstructing justice if the warrant didn't make it unnecessary. Oh, come, Captain. I've been most cooperative since you identified yourself and started behaving in a legal manner, and I shall continue to be. Of course, I shall still sue you and your immediate superior and the government for your illegal acts before that time, and I'm not waiving any rights or recourses with respect to anything any of you may do hereafter. Hmm. Quite a list of victims. I see why you brought an extra wagon. But, uh, dear me, something odd here. This, uh, Mrs. Bachman? I see that she is charged with kidnapping this Smith fellow, but in this other warrant... He seems to be charged with fleeing custody. I'm confused. It's both. He escaped, and she kidnapped him. Isn't that difficult to manage? Both, I mean. And on what charge was he being held? The warrant does not seem to state. How the devil do I know he escaped? That's all. He's a fugitive. Gracious me, I think I shall have to offer my services as counsel to each of them. Interesting case. If a mistake has been made, or mistakes, it could lead to other matters. Heinrich grinned coldly. You won't find it easy. You'll be in the pokey, too. Oh, not for long, I trust. Jubal raised his voice and turned his head toward the house. I think, if Judge Holland were listening, habeas corpus proceedings for all of us might be rather prompt. And if the Associated Press happened to have a courier car nearby, there would be no time lost in knowing where to serve such writs. Always the shyster, eh, Harshaw? Slander, my dear sir. I take notice. A fat lot of good it will do you. We're alone. Are we? Chapter 15 Valentine Michael Smith swam through murky water to the deepest part, under the diving board, and settled on the bottom. He did not know why his water brother had told him to hide, he did not know he was hiding. Jubal had told him to do this and remain until Jill came for him. That was sufficient. He curled up, let air out of his lungs, swallowed his tongue, rolled his eyes up, slowed his heart, and became effectively dead, save that he was not discorporate. He elected to stretch his time sense until seconds flowed past like hours, as he had much to meditate. He had failed again to achieve the perfect understanding, the mutual merging rapport, the grokking that should exist between Water Brothers. He knew the failure was his, caused by his using wrongly the oddly variable human language, because Jubal had become upset. He knew that his human brothers could suffer intense emotion without damage. Nevertheless, Smith was wistfully sorry to have caused upset in Jubal. It had seemed that he had at last grokked a most difficult human word. He should have known better, because, early in his learnings under his brother Mahmud, he had discovered that long human words rarely changed their meanings. But short words were slippery, changing without pattern. Or so he seemed to grok. Short human words were like trying to lift water with a knife. This had been a very short word. Smith still felt that he grokked rightly the human word, God. Confusion had come from his failure in selecting other words, the concept was so simple, so basic, so necessary, that a nestling could explain it. In Martian, the problem was to find human words that would let him speak rightly, make sure that he patterned them to match in fullness how it would be said in his own people's language. He puzzled over the fact that there should be any difficulty in saying it, even in English, since it was a thing everyone knew, else they could not grok alive. Possibly he should ask the human old ones how to say it, rather than struggle with shifting meanings. If so, he must wait until Jubal arranged it, for he was only an egg. He felt brief regret that he was not privileged to attend discorporation of Brother Art and Brother Dotty. Then he settled down to review Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd edition, published in Springfield, Massachusetts. From a long way off, Smith was roused by uneasy awareness that his water brothers were in trouble. He paused between Sher Butcha and Sherbet to ponder this. Should he leave the water of life and join them to grok and share their trouble? At home there could have been no question. Trouble is shared in joyful closeness. But Jubal had told him to wait. He reviewed Jubal's words, trying them against other human words, making sure that he grokked. No, he had grokked rightly. He must wait until Jill came. Nevertheless, he was so uneasy that he could not go back to his word hunt. 
At last an idea came that was filled with such gay daring that he would have trembled had his body been ready. Jubal had told him to place his body under water and leave it there until Jill came. But had Jubal said that he himself must wait with the body? Smith took a long time to consider this, knowing that slippery English words could lead him into mistakes. He concluded that Jubal had not ordered him to stay with his body, and that left a way out of the wrongness of not sharing his brother's trouble. So Smith decided to take a walk. He was dazed at his own audacity, for while he had done it before, he had never soloed. Always an old one had been with him, watching over him, making sure that his body was safe, keeping him from becoming disoriented, staying with him until he returned to his body. There was no old one to help him now, but Smith was confident that he could do it alone in a fashion that would fill his teacher with pride. So he checked every part of his body, made certain that it would not damage while he was gone, then got cautiously out of it, leaving behind that trifle of himself needed as caretaker. He rose up and stood on the edge of the pool, remembering to behave as if his body were with him as a guard against disorienting, against losing track of pool, body, everything, and wandering off into unknown places where he could not find his way back. Smith looked around. A car was just landing in the garden, and beings under it were complaining of injuries and indignities. Was this the trouble he could feel? Grasses were for walking on. Flowers and bushes were not. This was a wrongness. No, there was more wrongness. A man was stepping out of the car, one foot about to touch the ground, and Jubal was running toward him. Smith could see the anger that Jubal was hurling toward the man, a blast so furious that had one Martian hurled it toward another, both would discorporate. Smith noted it as something to ponder, and if it was a cusp of necessity, decided what he must do to help his brother. Then he looked over the others. Dorcas was climbing out of the pool. She was troubled, but not too much so. Smith could feel her confidence in Jubal. Larry was at the edge and had just gotten out. Drops of water falling from him were in the air. Larry was excited and pleased. His confidence in Jubal was absolute. Miriam was near him. Her mood was midway between those of Dorcas and Larry. Anne was standing nearby, dressed in the long white garment she had had with her all day. Smith could not fully grok her mood. He felt in her the cold, unyielding discipline of an old one. It startled him, as Anne was always soft and gentle and warmly friendly. He saw that she was watching Jubal closely and was ready to help him. And so was Larry. And Dorcas. And Miriam. With a burst of empathy, Smith learned that all these friends were water brothers of Jubal, and therefore of him. This release from blindness shook him so that he almost lost anchorage. Calming himself, he stopped to praise and cherish them all, one by one and together. Jill had one arm over the edge of the pool, and Smith knew that she had been down under checking on his safety. He had been aware of her when she had done it, but now he knew that she had not, alone, been worried about his safety. Jill felt other and greater trouble, trouble that was not relieved by knowing that her charge was safe under the water of life. This troubled him much, and he considered going to her, making her know that he was with her and sharing her trouble. He would have done so, had it not been for a faint feeling of guilt. He was not certain that Jubal wanted him to walk around while his body was in the pool. He compromised by telling himself that he would share their trouble, and let them know that he was present if it became needful. Smith then looked over the man who was stepping out of the air car, felt his emotions, and recoiled from them forced himself to examine him carefully inside and out. In a shaped pocket strapped around his waist, the man was carrying a gun. Smith was almost certain it was a gun. He examined it in detail, comparing it with guns he had seen, checking it against the definition in Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd edition, published in Springfield, Massachusetts. Yes, it was a gun, not alone in shape, but also in wrongness that surrounded and penetrated it. Smith looked down the barrel, saw how it must function, and wrongness stared back at him. Should he turn it and let it go elsewhere, taking its wrongness with it? Do it before the man was fully out of the car? Smith felt that he should. And yet Jubal had once told him not to do this to a gun, until Jubal told him that it was time. He knew now that this was indeed a cusp of necessity, but he resolved to balance on the point of the cusp until he grokked all since it was possible that Jubal, knowing that a cusp was approaching, had sent him underwater to keep him from acting wrongly. He would wait. 
but he would watch this gun. Not being limited to eyes, being able to see all around if needful, he continued to watch gun and man while he went inside the car. More wrongness than he would have believed possible. Other men were in there, all but one crowding toward the door. Their minds smelled like a pack of kaga who had scented an unwary nymph, and each one held in his hands a something having wrongness. As he had told Jubal, Smith knew that shape was never a prime determinant. It was necessary to go beyond shape, to essence, in order to grok. His own people passed through five major shapes, egg, nymph, nestling, adult, and old one which had no shape. Yet the essence of an old one was patterned in the egg. These some things seemed like guns, but Smith did not assume that they were. He examined one most carefully. It was larger than any gun he had ever seen. Its shape was different. Its details were quite different. It was a gun. He examined each of the others just as carefully. They were guns. The one man still seated had strapped to him a small gun. The car had built into it two enormous guns, plus other things which Smith could not grok, but in which he felt wrongness. He considered twisting car, contents, and all, letting it topple away. But in addition to his lifelong inhibition against wasting food, he knew that he did not grok what was happening. Better to move slowly, watch carefully, and help and share at cusp by following Jubal's lead. And if right action was to remain passive, then go back to his body when cusp had passed and discuss it with Jubal later. He went outside the car and watched and listened and waited. The first man to get out talked with Jubal concerning things which Smith could only file without grokking. They were beyond his experience. The other men got out and spread out. Smith spread his attention to watch them all. The car raised, moved backwards, stopped again, which relieved the beings it had sat on. Smith grokked with them, trying to soothe their hurtings. The first man handed papers to Jubal. They were passed to Anne. Smith read them with her. He recognized their word shapings as being concerned with human rituals of healing and balance. But since he had encountered these rituals only in Jubal's law library, he did not try to grok the papers, especially as Jubal seemed untroubled by them. The wrongness was elsewhere. He was delighted to recognize his own human name on two papers. He always got an odd thrill out of reading it, as if he were two places at once, impossible as that was for any but an old one. Jubal and the first man walked toward the pool, with Anne close behind. Smith relaxed his time sense to let them move faster, keeping it stretched just enough so that he could comfortably watch all the men at once. Two men closed in and flanked the group. The first man stopped near Smith's friends by the pool, looked at them, took a picture from his pocket, looked at it, looked at Jill. Smith felt her fear mount, and he became very alert. Jubal had told him, Protect Jill. Don't worry about wasting food. Don't worry about anything else. Protect Jill. He would protect Jill in any case, even at the risk of acting wrongly. But it was good to have Jubal's reassurance. It left his mind undivided and untroubled. When the man pointed at Jill and the two men flanking him hurried toward her with their guns of great wrongness, Smith reached out through his doppelganger and gave them each that tiny twist which causes to topple away. The first man stared at where they had been and reached for his gun, and he was gone too. The other four started to close in. Smith did not want to twist them. He felt that Jubal would be pleased if he simply stopped them. But stopping a thing, even an ashtray, is work, and Smith did not have his body. An old one could have managed it. But Smith did what he could, what he had to do. Four feather touches. They were gone. He felt intense wrongness from the car on the ground and went to it, grokked a quick decision car and pilot were gone. He almost overlooked the car riding cover patrol. Smith started to relax. When suddenly he felt wrongness increase and looked up, the second car was coming in for a landing. Smith stretched time to his limit and went to the car in the air, inspected it carefully, grokked that it was choked with wrongness, tilted it into neverness. Then he returned to the group by the pool. His friend seemed excited. Dorcas was sobbing, and Jill was holding and soothing her. Anne alone seemed untouched by emotions. Smith felt seething around him. But wrongness was gone, all of it, and with it the trouble that had disturbed his meditations. 
Dorcas, he knew, would be healed faster by Jill than by anyone. Jill always grokked a hurting fully and at once. Disturbed by emotions around him, uneasy that he might not have acted in all ways rightly at cusp, or that Jubal might so grok, Smith decided that he was now free to leave. He slipped back into the pool, found his body, grokked that it was as he had left it, slipped it back on. He considered contemplating events at cusp, but they were too new. He was not ready to enfold them, not ready to praise and cherish the men he had been forced to move. Instead, he returned happily to the task he had been on. Sherbet, Sherbetly, Sherbet side. He had reached tin work and was about to consider tiny when he felt Jill approaching. He unswallowed his tongue and made himself ready, knowing that his brother Jill could not remain long underwater without distress. As she touched him, he took her face in his hands and kissed her. It was a thing he had learned quite lately and did not grok perfectly. It had the growing closer of water ceremony, but it had something else too, something he wanted to grok in perfect fullness. Chapter Sixteen. Harshaw did not wait for Jillian to dig her problem child out of the pool. He left orders for Dorcas to be given a sedative and hurried to his study, leaving Anne to explain or not the events of the last ten minutes. Front, he called over his shoulder. Miriam caught up with him. I must be front, she said breathlessly. But boss, what in the girl? Not one word. But boss, zip it! I said. Miriam, a week from now we'll sit down and get Anne to tell us what happened. But right now everybody and his cousins will be phoning, and reporters will crawl out of trees, and I've got to make some calls first. Are you the sort of female who comes unstuck when she's needed? That reminds me, make a note to Doc Dorcas's pay for the time she's been having hysterics. Miriam gasped. Boss, you just dare, and every single one of us will quit. Nonsense. Quit picking on Dorcas. Why, I would have had hysterics myself if she hadn't beaten me to it. She added. I think I'll have hysterics now. Harshaw grinned. You do, and I'll spank you. All right, put Dorcas down for a bonus for hazardous duty. Put all of you down for a bonus. Me especially. I earned it. All right. Who pays your bonus? The taxpayers will find a way to clip. Damn. They had reached the study. The telephone was already demanding attention. He slid into the seat and keyed in. Harshaw speaking. Who the devil are you? Skip it, Doc. A face answered. You haven't frightened me in years. How's everything? Harshaw recognized Thomas McKenzie, production manager in chief for New World Networks. He mellowed slightly. Well enough, Tom, but I'm rushed as can be. So you're rushed. Try my forty-eight hour day. Do you still think you're going to have something for us? I don't mind the equipment. I can overhead that, but I have to pay three crews just to stand by for your signal. I want to do you any favor I can. We've used lots of your script, and we expect to use more in the future. But I wonder what to tell our controller. Harshaw stared. Don't you think that spot coverage was enough? What spot coverage? Shortly, Harshaw knew that New World Networks had seen nothing of recent events at his home. He stalled Mackenzie's questions because he was certain that truthful answers would convince Mackenzie that poor old Harshaw had gone to pieces. Instead, they agreed that if nothing worth picking up happened in twenty-four hours, New World could remove cameras and equipment. As the screen cleared, Harshaw ordered, "Get Larry." Have him fetch that panic button. Anne has it. He made two more calls. By the time Larry arrived, Harshaw knew that no network had been watching when the special service squads attempted to raid his home. It was not necessary to check on the hold messages. Their delivery depended on the same signal that had failed to reach the networks. Larry offered him the panic button, portable radio link. You wanted this, boss? I wanted to sneer at it. Larry, let this be a lesson. Never trust machinery more complicated than a knife and fork. Okay. Anything else? Is there a way to check that dingus without hauling three networks out of bed? Sure. The transceiver they set up down in the shop has a switch for that. Throw the switch, push the panic button, the light comes on. To test on through, you call them right from the transceiver and tell them you want a hot test of the cameras and back to the stations. Suppose the test shows that we aren't getting through. Can you spot what's wrong? Maybe, Larry said doubtfully. If it was just a loose connection, but Duke is the electron pusher. I'm more the intellectual type. I know, son. I'm not bright about practical matters either. Well, do the best you can. Anything else, Jubal? If you see the man who invented the wheel, send him up. Meddler. Jubal considered the possibility that Duke had sabotaged the panic button, but rejected the thought. 
He allowed himself to wonder what had really happened in his garden and how the lad had done it from ten feet underwater. He had no doubt that Mike had been behind those impossible shenanigans. What he had seen the day before in this very room was just as intellectually stupefying, but the emotional impact was not. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 5, Side 1. What he had seen the day before in this very room was just as intellectually stupefying, but the emotional impact was not. A mouse was as much a miracle of biology as was an elephant. Nevertheless, there was a difference. An elephant was bigger. To see an empty carton, just rubbish, disappear in midair implied that a squad car full of men could vanish, but one event kicked your teeth in, the other didn't. Well, he wouldn't waste tears on Cossacks. Jubal conceded that cops qua cops were all right. He had met honest cops, and even a fee-splitting constable did not deserve to be snuffed out. The Coast Guard was an example of what cops ought to be, and frequently were. But to be in the SS, a man had to have larceny in his heart and sadism in his soul, Gestapo, stormtroopers for whatever politico was in power. Chuba longed for the days when a lawyer could cite the Bill of Rights and not have some overriding Federation trickery defeat him. Never mind. What would happen now? Heinrich's force certainly had had radio contact with its base. Ergo, its loss would be noted. More SS troopers would come looking. Already headed this way if that second car had been chopped off in the middle of an action report. Miriam? Yes, boss. I want Mike, Jill, and Ann at once. Then find Larry, in the shop probably. And both of you come back, lock all doors and ground floor windows. More trouble? Get moving, gal. If the apes showed up? No. When they showed up? If their leader chose to break into a locked house, well, he might have to turn Mike loose on them. But this warfare had to stop, which meant that Jubal must get through to the secretary general. How? Call the palace? Heinrich had probably been telling the truth when he said that a renewed attempt would simply be referred to Heinrich or whatever SS boss was warming that chair. Well, it would surprise them to have a man they had sent a squad to arrest, blandly phoning in face to face. He might be able to bull his way to the top. Commandant, what's his name? Chap with a face like a well-fed ferret. Twitchell, the commanding officer of the SS Buckos, would have access to the boss. No good. It would be a waste of breath to tell a man who believes in guns that you've got something better. Twitchell would keep on throwing men and guns till he ran out of both, but he would never admit he couldn't bring in a man whose location was known. Well, when you couldn't use the front door, you slipped in through the back. Elementary politics. Damn it, he needed Ben Caxton. Ben would know who had keys to the back door. But Ben's absence was the reason for this donkey derby. Since he couldn't ask Ben, whom did he know who would know? Hale's half-wit. He'd been talking to one. Jubal turned to the phone and tried to raise Tom McKenzie, running into three layers of interference, all of whom knew him and passed him along. While he was doing this, his staff and the man from Mars came in. They sat down, Miriam stopping to write on a pad. Doors and windows locked. Jubal nodded and wrote below it, Larry, panic button. Then said to the screen, Tom, sorry to bother you again. A pleasure, Jubal. Tom, if you wanted to talk to Secretary General Douglas, how would you go about it? Eh? I'd phone his press secretary, Jim Sanforth. I wouldn't talk to the Secretary General. Jim would handle it. But suppose you wanted to talk to Douglas himself. Why, I'd let Jim arrange it. Be quicker to tell Jim my problem, though. Look, Jubal, the network is useful to the administration, and they know it, but we don't presume on it. Tom, suppose you just had to speak to Douglas in the next ten minutes. Mackenzie's eyebrows went up. Well, if I had to, I would explain to Jim why it was. No. Be reasonable. That's what I can't be. Assume that you had caught Sanforth stealing the spoons, so you couldn't tell him what the emergency was, but you had to speak to Douglas immediately. Mackenzie sighed. I would tell Jim that I had to talk to the boss and that if I wasn't through to him right away, the administration would never get another trace of support from the network. Okay, Tom, do it. Huh? Call the palace on another instrument. 
and be ready to cut me in instantly. I've got to talk to the Secretary General right now. Mackenzie looked pained. Chubal, old friend, meaning you won't. Meaning I can't. You've dreamed up a hypothetical situation in which a, pardon me, major executive of a global network could speak to the Secretary General, but I can't hand this entree to somebody else. Look, Jubal, I respect you. The network would hate to lose you, and we are painfully aware that you won't let us tie you down to a contract. But I can't do it. One does not telephone the world chief of government unless he wants to speak to you. Suppose I sign an exclusive seven-year contract. Mackenzie looked as if his teeth hurt. I still couldn't. I'd lose my job, and you would have to carry out your contract. Jubal considered calling Mike in to pick up and naming him. But Mackenzie's own programs had run the fake Man from Mars interviews, and Mackenzie was either in on the hoax, or he was honest, as Jubal thought, and would not believe that he had been hoaxed. All right, Tom. But you know your way around in the government. Who calls Douglas whenever he likes and gets him? I don't mean Sanforth. No one. Damn it, no man lives in a vacuum. There must be people who can phone him and not get brushed off by a secretary. Some of his cabinet, I suppose. Not all of them. I don't know any of them either. I don't mean politicos. Who can I call him on a private line and invite him to play poker? Hmm, you don't want much, do you? Well, there's Jake Allenby. I've met him. He doesn't like me. I don't like him. He knows it. Douglas doesn't have many intimate friends. His wife rather discourages. Say, Jubal, how do you feel about astrology? Never touch the stuff. Prefer brandy. Well, that's a matter of taste, but... See here, Jubal, if you ever let on I told you this... I'll cut your lying throat. Noted. Agreed. Proceed. Well, Agnes Douglas does touch the stuff, and I know where she gets it. Her astrologer can call Mrs. Douglas any time, and believe you me, Mrs. Douglas has the ear of the Secretary General. You can call her astrologer, and the rest is up to you. I don't recall any astrologers on my Christmas card list, Jubal answered dubiously. What's his name? Her. Her name is Madame Alexandra Vessant. Washington Exchange. That's V-E-S-A-N-T. I've got it, Jubal said happily. Tom, you've done me a world of good. Hope so. Anything for the network? Hold it. Jubal glanced at a note Miriam had placed at his elbow. It read, Larry says the transceiver won't trans. He doesn't know why. Jubal went on. That spot coverage failed through a transceiver failure. I'll send somebody. Thanks. Thanks twice. Jubal switched off, placed the call by name, and instructed the operator to use hush and scramble if the number was equipped for it. It was, not to his surprise. Soon Madame Vassant's dignified features appeared in his screen. He grinned at her and called, Hey, Rube. She looked startled, then stared. Why, Doc Harshaw, you old scoundrel. Lord love you, it's good to see you. Where have you been hiding? Just that, Becky, hiding. The clowns are after me. Becky Veazey answered instantly. What can I do to help? Do you need money? I've got plenty of money, Becky. I'm in much more serious trouble than that. And nobody can help me but the Secretary General himself. I need to talk to him. Right away. She looked blank. That's a tall order, Doc. Becky, I know. I've been trying to get through to him, and I can't. But don't you get mixed up in it. Girl, I'm hotter than a smoky bearing. I took a chance that you might be able to advise me. A phone number maybe where I could reach him. But I don't want you in it personally. You'd get hurt. And I'd never be able to look the professor in the eye. God rest his soul. I know what the professor would want me to do, she said sharply. Knock off the nonsense, Doc. The professor always swore that you were the only sawbones fit to carve people. He never forgot that time in Elkton. Now, Becky, we won't bring that up. I was paid. You saved his life. I did no such thing. It was his will to fight. And your nursing. Nah. Doc, we're wasting time. Just how hot are you? They're throwing the book, and anybody near me will get splashed. There's a warrant out, a Federation warrant, and they know where I am, and I can't run. It will be served any minute, and Mr. Douglas is the only person who can stop it. You'll be sprung. I guarantee that. Becky, I'm sure you would. But it might take a few hours. It's that back room, Becky. I'm too old for a session in the back room. But, oh, goodness, Doc, can't you give me some details? I ought to cast a horoscope, then I'd know what to do. 
You're Mercury, of course, since you're a doctor, but if I knew what house to look in, I could do better. Girl, there isn't time. Jubal thought rapidly. Whom to trust? Becky, just no one could put you in as much trouble as I'm in. Tell me, Doc. I've never taken a powder at a Clem yet, and you know it. All right. So I'm Mercury, but the trouble lies in Mars. She looked at him sharply. How? You've seen the news. The man from Mars is supposed to be in the Andes. Well, he's not. That's just to hoax the yokels. Becky seemed not as startled as Jubal had expected. Where do you figure in this, Doc? Becky, there are people all over this sorry planet who want to lay hands on that boy. They want to use him, make him geek. He's my client and I won't hold still for it, but my only chance is to talk with Mr. Douglas. The man from Mars is your client? You can turn him up? Only to Mr. Douglas. You know how it is, Becky. The mayor can be a good Joe, kind of children and dogs, but he doesn't know everything as town clowns do, especially if they haul a man in and take him into that back room. She nodded. Cops! So I need to dicker with Mr. Douglas before they haul me in. All you want is to talk to him? Yeah. Let me give you my number, and I'll sit here hoping for a call until they pick me up. If you can't swing it, thanks anyway, Becky. I'll know you tried. Don't switch off. Hey? Right? Keep the circuit, Doc. If I have any luck, they can patch through this phone and save time, so hold on. Madame Vesanta left the screen, called Agnes Douglas. She spoke with calm confidence, pointing out that this was the development foretold by the stars, exactly on schedule. Now had come the critical instant when Agnes must guide her husband, using her womanly wit and wisdom to see that he acted wisely and without delay. Agnes, dear, this configuration will not be repeated in a thousand years. Mars, Venus, and Mercury in perfect trine, just as Venus reaches meridian, making Venus dominant. Thus, you see, Allie, what did the stars tell me to do? You know I don't understand the scientific part. This was hardly surprising, since the described relationship did not obtain. Madame Vassant had not had time to compute a horoscope and was improvising. She was untroubled by it. She was speaking a higher truth, giving good advice and helping her friends. To help two friends at once made Becky Vesey especially happy. Dear, you do understand it. You have born talent. Your Venus, as always, and Mars is reinforced, being both your husband and that young man Smith for the duration of this crisis. Mercury is Dr. Harshaw. To offset the imbalance caused by the reinforcement of Mars, Venus must sustain Mercury until the crisis is past. But you have very little time. Venus waxes in influence until reaching Meridian. Only seven minutes from now. After that, your influence will decline. You must act quickly. You should have warned me. My dear, I've been waiting by my phone all day, ready to act instantly. The stars tell us the nature of each crisis. They never tell details. But there is still time. I have Dr. Harsh on the phone. All that is necessary is to bring them face to face before Venus reaches Meridian. Well, all right, Allie. I must take Joseph out of some silly conference. Give me the number of the phone you have this Dr. Rackshaw on, or can you transfer the call? I can switch it here. Just get Mr. Douglas. Hurry, dear. I will. When Agnes Douglas left the screen, Becky went to another phone. Her profession required ample phone service. It was her largest business expense. Humming happily, she called her broker. Chapter 17 As Becky left the screen, Jubal leaned back. Front, he said. Okay, boss, Miriam acknowledged. This is for the Real Experiences group. Specify that the narrator must have a sexy contralto voice. Maybe I should try for it. Not that sexy. Dig out that list of null surnames we got from the Census Bureau. Pick one and put an innocent mammalian first name with it for pen name. A girl's name ending in A, that always suggests a C cup. Huh. And not one of us with a name ending in A. You louse. Flat-chested bunch, aren't you? Angela. Her name is Angela. Title. I married a Martian. Start. All my life, I had longed to become an astronaut. Paragraph. When I was just a tiny thing with freckles on my nose and stars in my eyes, I say box tops just like my brothers, and cried when Mummy wouldn't let me wear my space cadet helmet to bed. Paragraph. In those carefree childhood days, I did not dream to what strange, bittersweet fate my tomboy ambition would... Boss? Yes, Dorcas? Here come two more loads. Hold for continuation. Miriam, sit at the phone. Jubal went to the window, saw two air cars about to land. Larry, bolt this door, and your robe. Jill, stick close to Mike. Mike, do what Jill tells you to do. 
Yes, Jubal, I will do. Jill, don't turn him loose unless you have to, and I'd much rather he snatched guns and not men. Yes, Jubal. This indiscriminate liquidation of cops must stop. Telephone, boss. All of you stay out of pickup. Miriam, note another title. I married a human. Jubal slid into his seat and said, Yes. A bland face looked at him. Dr. Harshaw? Yes. The Secretary General will speak with you. Okay. The screen changed to the tousled image of His Excellency, the Honorable Joseph Edgerton Douglas, Secretary General of the World Federation of Free Nations. Dr. Harshaw, understand you need to speak with me? No, sir. May? Eh? Let me rephrase it, Mr. Secretary. You need to speak with me. Douglas looked surprised, then grinned. Doctor, you have ten seconds to prove that. Very well, sir. I am attorney for the man from Mars. Douglas stopped, looking tousled. Repeat, I am attorney for Valentine Michael Smith. It may help to think of me as de facto ambassador from Mars, in the spirit of the Larkin decision. You must be out of your mind. Nevertheless, I am acting for the man from Mars, and he is prepared to negotiate. The man from Mars is in Ecuador. Please, Mr. Secretary, Smith, the real Valentine Michael Smith, not the one who appeared in newscasts. Escaped from Bethesda Medical Center on Thursday last in company with Nurse Jillian Boardman. He kept his freedom and will continue to keep it. If your staff has told you anything else, then someone has been lying. Douglas looked thoughtful. Someone spoke to him from off screen. At last, he said, Even if what you said were true, Doctor, you can't speak for young Smith. He's a ward of the state. Jubal shook his head. Impossible. The Larkin decision. Now, see here, as a lawyer, I assure you, as a lawyer myself, I must follow my own opinion and protect my client. You are a lawyer? I thought you claimed to be attorney-in-fact rather than counselor. Both. I am an attorney admitted to practice before the high court. Jubal heard a dull boom from below and glanced aside. Larry whispered, The front door, I think, boss. Shall I go look? Jubal shook his head. Mr. Secretary, time is running out. Your men, your SS hooligans, are breaking into my house. Will you abate this nuisance so that we can negotiate? Or shall we fight it out in the high court with all the stink that would ensue? Again, the secretary appeared to consult off screen. Doctor, if special service police are trying to arrest you, it is news to me. I... If you'll listen, you'll hear them tromping up my staircase, sir. Mike, Ann, come here. Jubal shoved his chair back to allow the angle to include them. Mr. Secretary General, the man from Mars. He could not introduce Anne, but she and her white cloak of probity were in view. Douglas stared at Smith. Smith looked back and seemed uneasy. Jubal, just a moment, Mike. Well, Mr. Secretary, your men have broken into my house. I hear them pounding on my study door. Jubal turned his head. Larry, open the door. He put a hand on Mike. Don't get excited, lad. Yes, Jubal. That man, I have known him. And he knows you. Over his shoulder, Jubal called out, Come in, Sergeant. An SS sergeant stood in the doorway, mob gun at ready. He called out, Major, here they are. Douglas said, Let me speak to the officer commanding them, Doctor. Jubal was relieved to see that the Major showed up with his sidearm holstered. Mike had been trembling ever since the sergeant's gun had come into view. Jubal lavished no love on these troopers, but he did not want Smith to display his powers. The Major glanced around. You're Jubal Harshaw? Yes, come here, your boss wants you. None of that, come along. I'm also looking for... Come here. The Secretary General wants a word with you. The SS Major looked startled, came into the study, and in sight of the screen, looked at it, snapped to attention, and saluted. Douglas nodded. Name, rank, and duty... Sir, Major C.D. Block, Special Services Squadron, Cheerio, Enclave Barracks. Tell me what you were doing. Sir, that's rather complicated. I... Then unravel it. Speak up, Major. Yes, sir. I came here pursuant to orders. You see? I don't see. Well, sir, an hour and a half ago, a flying squad was sent here to make several arrests. When we couldn't raise them by radio, I was sent to find them and render assistance. Whose orders? Uh, the Commandant, sir. And did you find them? No, sir. Not a trace. Douglas looked at Harshaw. Counselor, did you see anything of another squad? It's not my duty to keep track of your servants, Mr. Secretary. That is hardly an answer to my question. You are correct, sir. I'm not being interrogated. 
nor will I be other than by due process. I'm acting for my client. I'm not nursemaid to these uniformed, uh, persons. But I suggest, from what I've seen, that they could not find a pig in a bathtub. Hmm. Possibly. Major, round up your men in return. Yes, sir, the Major saluted. Just a moment, Harshaw interrupted. These men broke into my house. I demand to see their warrant. Oh. Major, show him your warrant. Major Block turned red. Sir, the officer ahead of me had the warrants. Douglas stared. Young man, are you telling me that you broke into a citizen's home without a warrant? But, sir, you don't understand. There are warrants. Captain Heinrich has them. Sir. Douglas looked disgusted. Get on back. Place yourself under arrest. I'll see you later. Yes, sir. Hold it, Harshaw demanded. I exercise my right to make citizens arrest. I shall have them placed in our local lockup, armed breaking and entering. Douglas blinked. Is this necessary? I think it is. These fellows seem awfully hard to find. I don't want this one to leave our local jurisdiction. Aside from criminal matters, I haven't had opportunity to assess property damage. You have my assurance, sir, that you will be fully compensated. Thank you, sir. But what is to keep another uniformed joker from coming along later? He wouldn't even need to break down the door. My castle stands violated, open to any intruder, Mr. Secretary. Only the moments of delay afforded by my once stout door kept this scoundrel from dragging me away before I could reach you. And you heard him say that there's another like him at large, with, so he says, warrants. Doctor, I know nothing of any such warrant. Warrants, sir. He said warrants for several arrests. Perhaps a better term would be lettre de cachet. That's a serious imputation. This is a serious matter. Doctor, I know nothing of these warrants, if they exist, but I give you my personal assurance that I will look into it at once, find out why they were issued, and act as the merits may appear. Can I say more? You can say a great deal more, sir. I can reconstruct why those warrants were issued. Someone in your service, in an excess of zeal, caused a pliant judge to issue them, for the purpose of seizing the persons of myself and my guests in order to question us out of your sight. Out of anyone's sight, sir. We will discuss issues with you, but we will not be questioned by such as this. Chubal hooked a thumb at the Major, in some windowless back room. Sir, I hope for justice at your hands, but if those warrants are not cancelled at once, if I'm not assured beyond quibble that the man from Mars, Nurse Boardman, and myself will be undisturbed, free to come and go, then, Jubal shrugged helplessly, I must seek a champion. There are persons and powers outside the administration who hold deep interest in the affairs of the man from Mars. You threaten me. No, sir, I plead with you. We wish to negotiate, but we cannot while being hounded. I beg you, sir, call off your dogs. Douglas glanced aside. Those warrants, if any, will not be served. As soon as I can track them down, they will be cancelled. Thank you, sir. Douglas looked at Major Block. You insist on booking him? Him? Oh, he's merely a fool in uniform. Let's forget damages, too. You and I have serious matters to discuss. You may go, Major. The SS officer saluted and left abruptly. Douglas continued. Counselor. The matters you raise cannot be settled over the telephone. I agree. You and your, uh, client will be my guests at the palace. I'll send my yacht. Can you be ready in an hour? Harshaw shook his head. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We'll sleep here, and when it comes time, I'll dig up a dog sled or something. No need to send your yacht. Mr. Douglas frowned. Come, doctor, as you pointed out, conversations will be quasi-diplomatic. In proffering protocol, I have conceded this. Therefore, I must be allowed to provide official hospitality. Well, sir, my client has had too much official hospitality. He had the devil's own time getting shut of it. Douglas's face became rigid. Sir, are you implying... I'm not implying anything. Smith has been through a lot and is not used to high-level ceremony. He'll sleep sounder here, and so shall I. I'm an old man, sir. I prefer my own bed. I might point out that talks may break down and my client would be forced to look elsewhere, in which case we would find it embarrassing to be guests under your roof. The Secretary General looked grim. Threats again. 
I thought you trusted me, sir. I distinctly heard you say that you were ready to negotiate. I do trust you, sir. As far as I could throw a fit. And we are ready to negotiate. But I use negotiate in its original sense, not in this newfangled meaning of appeasement. However, we will be reasonable. But we can't start talks at once. We're shy of one factor and must wait. How long, I don't know. What do you mean? We expect the administration to be represented by whatever delegation you choose. And we have the same privilege. Surely. But let's keep it small. I shall handle this myself with an assistant or two. The Solicitor General, our experts in space law, to transact business requires a small group. The smaller the better. Most certainly. Our group will be small. Smith, myself. I'll bring a fair witness. Oh, come now. A witness does not hamper. We'll have one or two others, but we lack one man. I have instructions that a fellow named Ben Caxton must be present, and I can't find the beggar. Jubal, having spent hours of maneuvering in order to toss in this one remark, waited. Douglas stared. Ben Caxton? Surely you don't mean that cheap Winchell? The Caxton I refer to has a column with one of the syndicates. Out of the question! Harshaw shook his head. Then that's all, Mr. Secretary. My instructions give me no leeway. I'm sorry to have wasted your time. I beg to be excused. He reached out as if to switch off. Hold it, sir. I'm not through speaking to you. I beg the Secretary General's pardon. We will wait until he excuses us. Yes, yes, never mind. Doctor, do you read the tripe that comes out of this capital labeled news? Good heavens, no. I wish I didn't have to. It's preposterous to talk about having journalists present. We'll see them after everything is settled, but even if we were to admit them, Caxton would not be one. The man is poisonous, a keyhole sniffer of the worst sort, Mr. Secretary. We have no objections to publicity. In fact, we insist on it. Ridiculous, possibly. But I serve my client as I think best. If we reach agreement affecting the man from Mars and the planet, which is his home, I want every person on this planet to know how it was done and what was agreed. Contrarywise, if we fail, people must hear how the talks broke down. There will be no star chamber, Mr. Secretary. Damn it, I wasn't speaking of a star chamber, and you know it. I mean quiet, orderly talks without elbows jostled. Then let the press in, sir, through cameras and microphones, but with elbows outside. Which reminds me, we will be interviewed, my client and I, over the networks later today, and I shall announce that we want public talks. What? You mustn't give out interviews now. Why, that's contrary to the whole spirit of this discussion. I can't see that it is. Are you suggesting that a citizen must have your permission to speak to the press? No, of course not. But I'm afraid it's too late. Arrangements have been made, and the only way you could stop it would be by sending more carloads of thugs. My reason for mentioning it is that you might wish to give out a news release in advance, telling the public that the man from Mars has returned and is vacationing in the Poconos so as to avoid any appearance that the government was taken by surprise. You follow me? I follow you. The Secretary General stared at Harshaw. Please wait. He left the screen. Harshaw motioned Larry to him while his other hand covered the sound pickup. Look, son, he whispered, with that transceiver out, I'm bluffing on a busted flush. I don't know whether he left to issue that release or has gone to set the dogs on us again. You hightail out, get Tom McKenzie on another phone, tell him that if he doesn't get the setup working, he's going to miss the biggest story since the fall of Troy. Then be careful coming home. There may be cops. How do I call McKenzie? Uh, Douglas was back on screen. Speak to Miriam. Dr. Harshaw, I took your suggestion. A release, much as you worded it, plus substantiating details. Douglas smiled in his homespun persona. I added that the administration will discuss interplanetary relations with the man from Mars as soon as he had rested from his trip and would do so publicly. Quite publicly. His smile became chilly, and he stopped looking like good old Joe Douglas. Harshaw grinned in admiration. Why, the old thief had rolled with the punch and turned a defeat into a coup for the administration. That's perfect, Mr. Secretary. We'll back you right down the line. Thank you. Now about this Caxton person. Letting the press in does not apply to him. He can watch it over stereo vision and make up his lies from that, but he will not be present. Then there will be no talks, Mr. Secretary, no matter what you told the press. I don't believe you understand me, Counselor. This man is offensive to me. 
Personal privilege. You are correct, sir. It is a matter of personal privilege. Then we'll say no more about it. You misunderstand me. It is indeed personal privilege, but not yours. Smith's. Eh? You are privileged to select your advisors. Then you can fetch the devil himself and we shall not complain. Smith is privileged to select his advisors and have them present. If Caxton is not present, we will not be there. We will be at some quite different conference, one where you won't be welcome, even if you speak Hindi. Harshaw thought clinically that a man of Douglas's age should not indulge in rage. At last, Douglas spoke to the man from Mars. Mike had stayed on screen as silently and as patiently as the witness. Douglas said, Smith, why do you insist on this ridiculous condition? Harshaw said instantly, Don't answer, Mike. Then to Douglas, Tut, tut, Mr. Secretary, the cannons. You may not inquire why my client has instructed me, and the cannons are violated with exceptional grievance in that my client has but lately learned English and cannot hold his own against you. If you will learn Martian, I may permit you to put the question in his language, but not today. Douglas frowned. I might inquire what cannons you have played fast and loose with, but I haven't time. I have a government to run. I yield. But don't expect me to shake hands with this Caxton. As you wish, sir. Now back to the first point. I haven't been able to find Caxton. Douglas laughed. You insisted on a privilege, one I find offensive. Bring whom you like, but round them up yourself. Reasonable, sir. But would you do the man from Mars a favor? Eh? What favor? Talks will not begin until Caxton is located. That is not subject to argument. But I have not been able to find him. I am merely a private citizen. What do you mean? I spoke disparagingly of the special service squadrons. Check it off to the irk of a man who has had his door broken down. But I know that they can be amazingly efficient, and they have the cooperation of police forces everywhere. Mr. Secretary, if you were to call in your SS Commandant and tell him that you wanted to locate a man at once... Well, sir, it would produce more activity in an hour than I could in a century. Why on earth should I alert police forces everywhere to find one scandal-mongering reporter? Not on Earth, my dear sir, on Mars. I ask you this as a favor to the man from Mars. Well, it's preposterous, but I'll go along. Douglas looked at Mike. As a favor to Smith, I expect similar cooperation when we get down to cases. You have my assurance that it will ease the situation enormously. Well, I can't promise anything. You say the man is missing, he may have fallen in front of a truck, he may be dead. Harshaw looked grave. Let us hope not, for all our sakes. What do you mean? I've tried to point out the possibility to my client, but he won't listen to the idea. Harshaw sighed. A shambles, sir. If we can't find this Caxton, that is what we will have. A shambles. Well, I'll try. Don't expect miracles, Doctor. Not I, sir, my client. He has the Martian viewpoint and does expect miracles. Let's pray for one. You'll hear from me. That's all I can say. Harshaw bowed without getting up. Your servant, sir. As Douglas's image cleared, Jubal stood up and found Jillian's arms around his neck. Oh, Jubal, you were wonderful. We aren't out of the woods, child. But if anything can save Ben, you've just done it. She kissed him. Hey, none of that. I swore off before you were born. Kindly show respect for my years. He kissed her carefully and thoroughly. That's to take away the taste of Douglas. Between kicking him and kissing him, I was getting nauseated. Go smooch Mike. He deserves it for holding still to my lies. Oh, I shall. Jill let go of Harshaw put her arms around the man from Mars. Such wonderful lies, Jubal. She kissed Mike. Jubal watched as Mike initiated a second section of the kiss himself, performing it solemnly, but not quite as a novice. Harshaw awarded him B- minus with A for effort. Son, he said, you amaze me. I would have expected you to curl up in one of your faints. I so did, Mike answered seriously without letting go. On first kissing time. Well, congratulations, Jill. AC or DC? Jubal, you're a tease, but I love you anyhow and refuse to let you get my goat. Mike got a little upset once. 
but no longer, as you can see. Yes, Mike agreed. It is a goodness. For Water Brothers, it is a growing closer. I will show you. He let go of Jill. Jubal put up a palm. No. No? You'd be disappointed, son. It's a growing closer for Water Brothers, only if they are young girls and pretty, such as Jill. My brother Jubal, you speak rightly? I speak very rightly. Kiss girls all you want to. It beats the hell out of card games. Beg pardon? It's a fine way to grow closer. With girls. Hmm. Jubal looked around. I wonder if that first-time phenomenon would repeat. Dorcas, I want your help in a scientific experiment. Boss, I'm not a guinea pig. You go to hell. In due course, I shall. Don't be difficult, girl. Mike has no communicable diseases, or I wouldn't let him use the pool. Which reminds me, Miriam, when Larry gets back, tell him I want the pool cleaned. We're through with murkiness. Well, Dorcas... How do you know it would be our first time? Hmm. There's that. Mike, have you ever kissed Dorcas? No, Jubal. Only today did I learn that Dorcas is my water brother. She is? Yes. Dorcas and Anne and Miriam and Larry. They are your water brothers, my brother Jubal. Mm, yes. Correct in essence. Yes, it is essence, the grokking. Not sharing of water. I speak rightly. Very rightly, Mike. They are your water brothers. Mike paused to think words. In cat and native assemblage, they are my brothers. Mike looked at Dorcas. Four brothers, growing closer is good. Jubal said, Well, Dorcas? Huh? Oh, heavens, boss, you're the world's worst tease. But Mike isn't teasing. He's sweet. She went to him, stood on tiptoes, held up her arms. Kiss me, Mike. Mike did. For some seconds they grew closer. Dorcas fainted. Jubal kept her from falling. Jill had to speak sharply to Mike to keep him from trembling into withdrawal. Dorcas came out of it and assured Mike that she was all right and would happily grow closer again, but needed to catch her breath. Phew! Miriam had watched, round-eyed, I wonder if I dare risk it. Anne said, By seniority, please. Boss, are you through with me as a witness? For the time being. Then hold my cloak. Want to bet on it? Which way? Seven to two, I don't faint. But I wouldn't mind losing. Done. Dollars, not hundreds. Mike, dear, let's grow lots closer. Anne was forced to give up through hypoxia. Mike, with Martian training, could have gone without oxygen much longer. She gasped for air and said, I wasn't set right. Boss, I'm going to give you another chance. She started to offer her face again, but Miriam tapped her shoulder. Out. Don't be so eager. Out, I said. The foot of the line, wench. Oh, well. Anne gave way. Miriam moved in, smiled, and said nothing. They grew closer and continued to grow closer. Front. Miriam looked around. Boss, can't you see I'm busy? All right, get out of the way. I'll answer the phone myself. Honest, I didn't hear it. Obviously. But we've got to pretend to a modicum of dignity. It might be the Secretary General. It was Mackenzie. Jubal, what the devil is going on? Trouble? I got a call from a man who urged me to drop everything and get cracking because you've got something for me. I had ordered a mobile unit to your place. Never got here. I know. They called in after wandering around north of you. Our dispatcher's straight in the mountain. They should be there any moment. I tried to call you. Your circuit was busy. What have I missed? Nothing yet. Damnation. You should have had someone monitor the babble box. Was Douglas committed? Or would a new passel of cops show up? While the kids played post office. Jubal, you're senile. Has there been any special news flash this past hour? Why, no. Oh, one item... The palace announced that the man from Mars had returned and was vacationing in the... Jubal, are you mixed up in that? Just a moment. Mike, come here. And grab your robe. Got it, boss. Miss Mackenzie, meet the man from Mars. Mackenzie's jaw dropped. Hold it. Let me get a camera on this. We'll pick it up off the phone and repeat in stereo as quick as those jokers of mine get there. Jubal, I'm safe on this. You wouldn't? Would I swindle you with a fair witness at my elbow? I'm not forcing this on you. 
We should wait and tie in August and transplant it. Chubal, you can't do this to me. I won't. The agreement with all of you was to monitor the cameras when I signaled and use it if newsworthy. I didn't promise not to give interviews in addition, Jubal added. Not only did you loan equipment, but you've been helpful personally, Tom. I can't express how helpful. You mean, uh, that telephone number? Correct. But no questions about that, Tom. Ask me privately next year. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. You keep your lip buttoned and I'll keep mine. Now don't go away. One more thing. Those messages you're holding, send them back to me. Eh? All right. I've kept them in my desk. You were so fussy, Jubal. I've got a camera on you. Can we start? Shoot. I'm going to do this one myself. Mackenzie turned his face and apparently looked at the camera. Flash News. This is your NWNW reporter on the spot. While it's hot, the man from Mars just phoned and wants to talk to you. Cut. Monitor, insert Flash News acknowledgement to sponsor. Jubal, anything special I should ask? Don't ask about South America. Swimming is your safest subject. You can ask me about his plans. End of cut. Friends, you are now face-to-face -face and voice-to-voice -voice with Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars. As NWNW, always first with a burst, told you earlier, Mr. Smith has just returned from high in the Andes, and we welcome him back. Wave to your friends, Mr. Smith. Wave at the telephone, son. Smile and wave. Thank you, Valentine Michael Smith. We're happy to see you so healthy and tan. I understand you have been gathering strength by learning to swim. Boss, visitors or something. Cut. After the word swim. What the hell, Jubal? I'll see. Jill Ride heard on Mike. It might be general quarters. But it was the NWNW unit landing. And again, rose bushes were damaged. Larry returning from phoning Mackenzie. And Duke returning. Mackenzie decided to finish the telephone interview quickly, since he was now assured of depth and color through his unit. In the meantime, its crew would check equipment on loan to Jubal. Larry and Duke went with them. The interview finished with inanities, Jubal fielding questions Mike failed to understand. Mackenzie signed off with the promise that a color and depth interview would follow. Stay synced with this station. He waited for his technicians to report. Which the crew boss did promptly. Nothing wrong with this field setup, Mr. Mackenzie. Then what was wrong before? The technician glanced at Larry and Duke. It works better with power. The breaker was open at the board. Harshaw stopped to wrangle about whether Duke had or had not told Larry that a circuit breaker must be reset if the equipment was to be used. Jubal did not care who was to blame. It all confirmed his conviction that technology had reached its peak with the Model T Ford and had been growing decadent ever since. They got through the depth and color interview. Mike sent greetings to his friends of the champion, including one to Dr. Mahmood, delivered in throat-rasping Martian. At last, Jubal set the telephone for two hours' refusal, stretched, and felt great weariness. Wondered if he were getting old. Where's dinner? Which one of you wenches was supposed to cook tonight? Gad, this household has fallen into rack and ruin. Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein continued. Cassette 5, Side 2. Where's dinner? Which one of you wenches was supposed to cook tonight? Gad, this household has fallen into rack and ruin. It was my turn tonight, Jill answered. But excuses, always excuses. Boss, Anne interrupted sharply. How do you expect anyone to cook when you've kept us penned up all afternoon? That's the moose's problem, Jubal said dourly. If Armageddon is held on these premises, I expect meals hot and on time right up to the final trump. Furthermore... Furthermore, Anne completed, it is only 7.40 and plenty of time to have dinner by 8, so quit yelping, crybaby. Only 20 minutes of 8? Seems like a week since lunch. You haven't left a civilized amount of time for a pre-dinner drink. Poor you. Somebody give me a drink. Get everybody a drink. Let's skip dinner. I feel like getting as tight as a tent rope in the rain. And how we fix for smorgasbord? Plenty. Why not thaw out 18 or 19 kinds and let everybody eat when it feels like it? What's all the argument? Right away agreed Jill. Anne stopped to kiss him on his bald spot. Boss, you've done nobly. We'll feed you and get you drunk and put you to bed. Wait, Jill, I'll help. I made to help, too, Smith said eagerly. Sure, Mike, you can carry trays. Boss, dinner will be by the pool. It's a hot night. How else? When they left, Jubal said to Duke, Where the hell have you been? Thinking. Doesn't pay. Makes you discontented. Any results? 
Yes, said Duke. I've decided that what Mike eats is his business. Congratulations. A desire not to butt into other people's business is 80% of all human wisdom. You butt into other people's business. Who said I was wise? Jubal, if I offered Mike a glass of water, would he go through that lodge routine? I think he would. Duke, the only human characteristic Mike has is an overwhelming desire to be liked. But I want to make sure you know how serious it is. I accepted water brotherhood with Mike before I understood it, and I've become deeply entangled with its responsibilities. You'll be committing yourself never to lie to him, never to mislead him, to stick by him come what may. Better think about it. I have been thinking about it. Jubal, there's something about Mike that makes you want to care for him. I know. You've probably never encountered honesty before. Innocence. Mike has never tasted the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, so we don't understand what makes him tick. Well, I hope you never regret it. Jubal looked up. I thought you had stopped to distill the stuff. Larry answered. Couldn't find a corkscrew. Machinery again. Duke, you'll find glasses behind the anatomy of melancholy up there. I know where you hide them, and we'll have a quick one before we get down to serious drinking. Duke got glasses, Jubal poured, and raised his own. Here's to alcoholic brotherhood, more suited to the frail human soul than any other sort. Health. Cheers. Jubal poured his down his throat. Ah, he said happily, and belched. Offer some to Mike, Duke, and let him learn how good it is to be human. Makes me feel creative. Front. Why are those girls never around when I need them? Front. I'm front, Miriam answered at the door. But I was saying, to what strange bittersweet fate, my tomboy ambition. I finished that story while you were chatting with the Secretary General. Then you are no longer front. Send it off. Don't you want to read it? Anyhow, I've got to revise it. Kissing Mike gave me new insight. Jubal shuddered. Read it, good God, it's bad enough to write such a thing. And don't consider revising, certainly not to fit the facts. My child, a true confession story should never be tarnished by any taint of truth. Okay, boss. Anne says to come to the pool and have a bite before you eat. Can't think of a better time. Shall we adjourn, gentlemen? The party progressed liquidly, with bits of fish and other Scandinavian comestibles added to taste. At Jubal's invitation, Mike tried brandy. Mike found the result disquieting, so he analyzed his trouble, added oxygen to ethanol in an inner process of reverse fermentation, and converted it to glucose and water. Jubal had been observing the effect of liquor on the man from Mars, saw him become drunk, saw him sober up even more quickly. In an attempt to understand, Jubal urged more brandy on Mike, which he accepted since his water brother offered it. Mike sopped up an extravagant quantity, before Jubal conceded that it was impossible to get him drunk. Such was not the case with Jubal, despite years of pickling. Staying sociable with Mike during the experiment dulled his wits, so when he asked Mike what he had done, Mike thought that he was inquiring about the raid by the SS, concerning which Mike felt latent guilt. He tried to explain, and, if needed, received Jubal's pardon. Jubal interrupted when he realized what the boy was talking about. Son, I don't want to know. You did what was needed, just perfect. But, he blinked owlishly, don't tell me. Don't ever tell anybody. Not, not. Damnedest thing I've seen since my uncle with two heads debated free silver and refuted himself. An explanation would spoil it. I do not grok, nor I, so let's have another drink. Reporters started arriving. Jubal received them with courtesy, invited them to eat, drink, and relax, but refrained from badgering himself or the man from Mars. Those who failed to heed were tossed into the pool. Jubal kept Larry and Duke at flank to administer baptism. While some became angry, others added themselves to the dousing squad with the fanatic enthusiasm of proselytes. Jubal had to stop them from ducking the doyen Lippmann of the New York Times a third time. Late in the evening, Dorcas sought out Jubal and whispered, Telephone, boss. Take a message. You must answer, boss. I'll answer it with an axe. I've been intending to get rid of that iron maiden, and I'm in the mood. Duke, get me an axe. Boss, it's the man you spoke to for a long time this afternoon. Oh. Why didn't you say so? 
Jubal lumbered upstairs, bolted his door, went to the phone. Another of Douglas's acolytes was on screen, but was replaced by Douglas. It took you long enough to answer your phone. It's my phone, Mr. Secretary. Sometimes I don't answer it at all. So it seems. Why didn't you tell me Caxton is an alcoholic? Is he? He certainly is. He's been on a bender. He was sleeping it off in a flea bag in Sonora. I'm glad to hear he's been found. Thank you, sir. He's been picked up for vagrancy. The charge won't be pressed. We are releasing him to you. I'm in your debt, sir. Oh, it's not entirely a favor. I'm having him delivered as he was found, filthy, unshaven, and I understand smelling like a brewery. I want you to see what a tramp he is. Very well, sir. When may I expect him? A courier left Nogales some time ago. At Mach 4, it should be overhead soon. The pilot will deliver him and get a receipt. He shall have it. Now, Counselor, I wash my hands of it. I expect you and your client to appear, whether you bring that drunken libeler or not. Agreed. When? Tomorrow at ten? To a best done quickly. Agreed. Jubal went downstairs and outside. Jill, come here, child. Yes, Jubal. She trotted toward him, a reporter with her. Jubal waved him back. Private, he said firmly. Family matter. Whose family? A death in yours, scat. The newsman grinned and left. Jubal leaned over and said softly, He's safe. Ben? Yes, he'll be here soon. Oh, Jubal! She started to bawl. He took her shoulders. Stop it. Go inside until you get control. Yes, boss. Go cry on your pillow, then wash your face. He went out to the pool. Quiet, everybody. I have an announcement. We've enjoyed having you, but the party is over. Boo! Toss him in the pool. I'm an old man and need my rest, and so does my family. Do cork those bottles. Girls, clear the food away. There was grumbling. The more responsible quieted their colleagues. In ten minutes they were gone. In twenty minutes Caxton arrived. The SS officer commanding the car accepted Harshaw's signature and print on a prepared receipt, left while Jill sobbed on Ben's shoulder. Jubal looked him over. Ben, I hear you've been drunk for a week. Ben cursed while continuing to pat Jill's back. I'm drunk, all right, but haven't had a drink. What happened? I don't know. I don't know. An hour later, Ben's stomach had been pumped. Jubal had given him shots to offset alcohol and barbiturates. He was bathed, shaved, dressed in borrowed clothes, had met the man from Mars, and was sketchily brought up to date while ingesting milk and food. But he was unable to bring them up to date. For Ben, the week had not happened. He had become unconscious in Washington, had been shaken into wakefulness in Mexico. Of course I know what happened. They kept me doped in a dark room and wrung me out. But I can't prove anything. There's the village jefe and the madman of this dive, plus I'm sure other witnesses to swear how this gringo spent his time, and there's nothing I can do about it. Then don't, Jubal advised. Relax and be happy. The hell I will. I'll get that tut tut, Ben, you're alive, which I would have given long odds against. And Douglas is going to do exactly what we want him to, and like it. I want to talk about that. I think... I think you're going to bed with a glass of warm milk to conceal old Doc Harshaw's secret ingredient for secret drinkers. Soon Caxton was snoring. Jubal was heading for bed and encountered Anne in the upper hall. He shook his head tiredly. Quite a day, lass. Yes. I wouldn't have missed it and don't want to repeat it. Go to bed, boss. In a moment. Anne, what's so special about the way that lad kisses? Anne looked dreamy, then dimpled. You should have tried it. I'm too old to change. But I'm interested in everything about the boy. Is this something different? Anne pondered it. Yes. How? Mike gives a kiss his whole attention. Oh, rats, I do myself. Or did. Anne shook her head. No, I've been kissed by men who did a very good job, but they don't give kissing their whole attention. They can't. No matter how hard they try, parts of their minds are on something else. Missing the last bus or their chances of making the gal, or their own techniques in kissing, or maybe worry about jobs or money, or will husband or papa or the neighbors catch on. Mike doesn't have technique. 
But when Mike kisses you, he isn't doing anything else. You're his whole universe. And the moment is eternal because he doesn't have any plans and isn't going anywhere. Just kissing you. She shivered. It's overwhelming. Hmm. Don't hmm at me, you old lecher. You don't understand. No. I'm sorry to say I never will. Well, good night. And by the way, I told Mike to bolt his door. She made a face at him. Spoil sport. He's learning fast enough. Mustn't rush him. Chapter 18 The conference was postponed 24 hours, which gave Caxton time to recuperate, to hear about his missing week, and to grow closer with the man from Mars. For Mike grokked that Jill and Ben were water brothers, consulted Jill, and solemnly offered water to Ben. Ben had been briefed by Jill. It caused him much soul-searching. Ben was bothered by an uneasy feeling. He felt irked at the closeness between Mike and Jill. His bachelor attitudes had been changed by a week of undead oblivion. He proposed to Jill again as soon as he got her alone. Jill looked away. Please, Ben. Why not? I've got a steady job. I'm in good health. Or will be as soon as I get their truth drugs out of my system. And since I haven't, I feel a compulsion to tell the truth. I love you. I want to marry you and rub your poor, tired feet. Am I too old? Or are you planning to marry somebody else? No, neither one. Dear Ben, Ben, I love you. But don't ask me this now. I have responsibilities. He could not budge her. He finally realized that the man from Mars wasn't a rival. He was Jill's patient. And a man who marries a nurse must accept the fact that nurses feel maternal toward their charges. Accept it and like it. For if Jillian had not had the character that made her a nurse, he would not love her. It was not the figure eight in which her pert fanny moved when she walked, nor the lush view from the other direction. He was not the infantile type interested solely in the size of mammary glands. No, it was herself he loved. Since what she was would make it necessary for him to take second place to patients who needed her, then he was bloody be damned not going to be jealous. Mike was a nice kid, as innocent and guileless as Jill had described him. And he wasn't offering Jill a bed of roses. The wife of a newspaper man had things to put up with. He might be gone for weeks at a time, and his hours were always irregular. He wouldn't like it if Jill bitched. But Jill wouldn't. Having reached this summing up, Ben accepted water from Mike wholeheartedly. Jubal needed the extra day to plan. Ben, when you dump this in my lap, I told Jillian that I would not lift a finger to get this boy his so-called rights. I've changed my mind. We're not going to let the government have the swag. Certainly not this administration, nor any. The next will be worse. Ben, you undervalue Joe Douglas. He's a cheap politician with morals to match. Yes, and ignorant to six decimal places but he is also a fairly conscientious world chief, better than we deserve. I would enjoy poker with him. He wouldn't cheat, and he would pay up with a smile. Oh, he's an S.O.B., but that reads swell old boy, too. He's middling decent. Jubal, I'm damned if I understand you. You told me that you'd been fairly certain that Douglas had had me killed. And it wasn't far from it. You juggled eggs to get me out alive, and God knows I'm grateful, but do you expect me to forget that Douglas was behind it? It's none of his doing that I'm alive. He would rather see me dead. I suppose he would. But, yep, just that. Forget it. I'm damned if I will. You'd be silly not to. You can't prove anything. And there's no call to be grateful to me, and I won't let you lay this burden on me. I didn't do it for you. Huh? I did it for a little girl who was about to go charging out and maybe get herself killed. I did it because she was my guest, and I stood in loco parentis. I did it because she was all guts and gallantry, but too ignorant a monkey was such a buzz saw. But you, my cynical and sin-stained chum, know all about buzz saws. If your carelessness causes you to back into one, who am I to tamper with your karma? Hmm. Okay, Jubal, you can go to hell for monkeying with my karma. If I have one, a moot point. The predestinationers and free willers were tied in the fourth quarter, last I heard. Either way, I have no wish to disturb a man sleeping in a gutter. Do-gooding is like treating hemophilia. The real cure is to let hemophiliacs bleed to death before they breed more hemophiliacs. You could sterilize them. You would have me play God? 
but we're off the subject. Douglas didn't try to have you assassinated. Says who? Says the infallible Jubal Harshaw, speaking ex-cathedra from his belly button. Son, if your deputy sheriff beats a prisoner to death, it sweepstakes odds that the county commissioners wouldn't have permitted it had they known. At worst, they shut their eyes afterwards, rather than upset apple carts. Assassination has never been a policy in this country. I'll show you backgrounds of a number of deaths I've looked into. Jubal waved it aside. I said it wasn't a policy. We've always had assassination, from prominent ones like Huey Long to men beaten to death with hardly a page eight story. But it's never been a policy, and the reason you are alive is that it is not Joe Douglas's policy. They snatched you clean, they squeezed you dry, and they could have disposed of you as quietly as flushing a dead mouse down a toilet. But their boss doesn't like them to play that rough, and if he became convinced that they had, it would cost their jobs, if not their necks. Jubal paused for a swig. Those thugs are just a tool. They aren't a Praetorian guard that picks the Caesar. So whom do you want for Caesar? Courthouse Joe, whose indoctrination goes back to when this country was a nation and not a satrapy and a polyglot empire. Douglas, who can't stomach assassination. Or do you want to toss him out? We can, just by double-crossing him. Toss him out and put in a secretary general from a land where life is cheap and assassination a tradition. If you do, Ben. What happens to the next Snoopy newspaper man who walks down a dark alley? Caxton didn't answer. As I said, the SS is just a tool. Men are always for hire who like dirty work. How dirty will that work become if you nudge Douglas out of his majority? Jubal, are you saying I ought not to criticize the administration? Nope. Gadflies are necessary. But it's well to look at the new rascals before you turn your present rascals out. Democracy is a poor system. The only thing that can be said for it is that it's eight times as good as any other method. Its worst fault is that its leaders reflect their constituents, a low level. But what can you expect? So look at Douglas and ponder that, in his ignorant stupidity and self-seeking, he resembles his fellow Americans, but is a notch or two above average. Then look at the man who will replace him if his government topples. There's a little difference. There's always a difference. This is between bad and worse, which is much sharper than that between good and better. Well, what do you want me to do? Nothing, Harshaw answered. I'll run this show myself. I expect you to refrain from chewing out Joe Douglas over this coming settlement. Maybe praise him for statesmanlike restraint. You're making me vomit. Use your hat. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. The first principle in riding a tiger is to hang on tight to its ears. Quit being pompous. What's the deal? Quit being obtuse and listen. Mike has the misfortune to be heir to more wealth than Croesus dreamed of, plus a claim to political power under a politico-judicial precedent unparalleled in jugheadedness since Secretary Fall was convicted of receiving a bribe that Doheny was acquitted of paying. I have no interest in true prince nonsense, nor do I regard that wealth as his. He didn't produce it. Even if he had earned it, property is not the natural and obvious concept that most people think it is. Come again? Ownership is a sophisticated abstraction, a mystical relationship. God knows our legal theorists make this mystery complicated. But I didn't dream how subtle it was until I got the Martian slant. Martians don't own anything, not even their bodies. Wait a minute, Jubal. Even animals have property, and the Martians aren't animals. They're a civilization with cities and all sorts of things. Yes, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. Nobody understands Mia set to us better than a watchdog. But not Martians, unless you regard joint ownership of everything by millions or billions of senior citizens, ghosts to you, my friend, as property. Say, Jubal, how about these old ones? You want the official version? No. Your opinion. I think it is pious poppycock, suitable for enriching lawns. Superstition burned into the boy's brain so early that he stands no chance of breaking loose. Jill talks as if she believed it. You will hear me talk as if I did, too. Ordinary politeness. One of my most valued friends believes in astrology. I would never offend her by telling her what I think. The capacity of humans to believe in what seems to me highly improbable... 
from table tapping to the superiority of their children, has never been plumbed. Faith strikes me as intellectual laziness. But Mike's faith in his old ones is no more irrational than a conviction that the dynamics of the universe can be set aside through prayers for rain. Hmm. Jubal, I confess to a suspicion that immortality is a fact. But I'm glad my grandfather's ghost doesn't boss me. He was a cranky old devil. And so was mine. And so am I. But is there any reason why a citizen's franchise should be voided simply because he is dead? The precinct I was raised in had a large graveyard vote, almost Martian. As may be, our lad Mike can't own anything, because the old ones already own everything. So I have trouble explaining to him that he owns over a million shares of Luna Enterprises, plus the Lyle Drive, plus assorted chattels and securities. It doesn't help that the original owners are dead, and that makes them old ones. Mike would never stick his nose into the business of old ones. Uh, damn it, he's incompetent. Of course. He can't manage property because he doesn't believe in its mystique, any more than I believe in his ghosts. Ben, all that Mike owns is a toothbrush, and he doesn't know he owns that. If you took it, he would assume that the old ones had authorized the change. Jubal shrugged. He is incompetent, so I shan't allow his competency to be tried. For what guardian would be appointed? Huh, Douglas, or one of his stooges. Are you certain, Ben? Consider the makeup of the high court. Might not the appointee be named Savonavong, or Nadi, or Ki? Uh, you could be right in which case the lad might not live long. Or he might live to a ripe age in some pleasant garden, more difficult to escape from than Bethesda Hospital. What do you plan to do? The power the boy nominally owns is too dangerous. So we give it away. How do you give away that much money? You don't. Giving it away would change the balance of power. Any attempt would cause the boy to be examined on his competence. So instead we let the tiger run like hell while hanging on to its ears for dear life. Ben, let me outline what I intend to do. Then you do your damnedest to pick holes in it. Not the legality. Douglas's legal staff will write the double talk and I'll check it. I want you to sniff it for political feasibility. Now, here's what we are going to do. Chapter 19 The Martian diplomatic delegation went to the executive palace the next morning. The unpretentious pretender to the Martian throne, Mike Smith, did not worry about the purpose of the trip. He simply enjoyed it. They rode a chartered flying greyhound. Mike sat in the Astrodome, Chill on one side and Dorcas on his other, and stared and stared as the girls pointed out sights and chattered. The seat was intended for two. A warming growing closer resulted. He sat with an arm around each and looked and listened and tried to grok, and could not have been happier if he had been ten feet underwater. It was his first view of Terran civilization. He had seen nothing in being removed from the champion. He had spent a few minutes in a taxi ten days earlier, but had grokked none of it. Since then his world had been bounded by house and pool, garden and grass and trees. He had not been as far as Jubal's gate. But now he was sophisticated. He understood windows, realized that the bubble surrounding him was for looking out of, and that the sights he saw were cities. He picked out, with the help of the girls, where they were on the map flowing across the lapboard. He had not known until recently that humans knew about maps. It had given him a twinge of happy homesickness, the first time he had grokked a human map. It was static and dead compared with maps used by his people. But it was a map. Even human maps were Martian in essence. He liked them. He saw almost two hundred miles of countryside, most of its sprawling world metropolis, and savored every inch, tried to grok it. He was startled by the size of human cities and their bustling activity, so different from the monastery garden cities of his own people. It seemed to him that a human city must wear out almost at once, so choked with experience that only the strongest old ones could bear to visit its deserted streets and grok in contemplation events and emotions piled layer on endless layer in it. He had visited abandoned cities at home on a few wonderful and dreadful occasions. Then his teachers had stopped it, grokking that he was not strong enough. Questions to Jill and Dorcas enabled him to grok the city's age. It had been founded a little over two Earth centuries ago. Since Earth time units had no favor for him, he converted to Martian years and numbers. Three filled plus three waiting years. Three to the fourth power plus three to the third power equals 108 Martian years. 
terrifying and beautiful. Why, these people must be prepared to abandon the city to its thoughts before it shattered under the strain and became not. Yet, by mere time, the city was only an egg. Mike looked forward to returning to Washington in a century or two to walk its empty streets and try to grow close to its endless pain and beauty, grokking thirstily until he was Washington and the city was himself. If he were strong enough by then, he filed the thought as he must grow and grow and grow before he would be able to praise and cherish the city's mighty anguish. The Greyhound driver swung east in response to a rerouting of unscheduled traffic caused, unknown to Mike, by Mike's presence. And Mike saw the sea. Jill had to tell him that it was water. Dorcas added that it was the Atlantic Ocean and traced the shoreline on the map. Mike had known since he was a nestling that the planet next nearer the sun was almost covered with the water of life, and lately he had learned that these people accepted this richness casually. He had taken the more difficult hurdle of grokking the Martian orthodoxy that water ceremony did not require water. Water was symbol for essence, beautiful, but not indispensable. But Mike discovered that knowing an abstract was not the same as physical reality. The Atlantic filled him with such awe that Jill said sharply, Mike, don't you dare. Mike chopped off his emotion and stored it. Then he stared at water stretching to horizon and tried to measure it until his head was buzzing with threes and powers of threes and superpowers of powers. As they landed on the palace, Jubal called out, Remember, girls, form a square around him and don't be backward about planting a heel or jabbing an elbow. And you'll be cloaked, but that's no reason not to step on a foot if you're crowded. Or is it? Quit fretting, boss. Nobody crowds a witness. And I'm wearing spike heels and way more than you do. Okay, Duke, send Larry back with the bus as soon as possible. I grok it, boss. Quit jittering. I'll jitter as I please. Let's go. Harshaw, the four girls, with Mike and Caxton, got out. The bus took off. The landing flat was not crowded, but it was far from empty. A man stepped forward and said heartily, Dr. Harshaw, I'm Tom Bradley, senior executive assistant to the secretary general. You are to go to Mr. Douglas's office. He will see you before the conference starts. No. Bradley blinked. I don't think you understood. These are instructions from the secretary general. Oh, he said that it was all right for Mr. Smith to come with you. The man from Mars, I mean. No, we're going to the conference room. Have somebody lead the way. In the meantime, I have an errand for you. Miriam, that letter. But to Dr. Harshaw, I said, no. You ought to deliver this to Mr. Douglas at once and fetch his receipt to me. Harshaw signed across the flap of an envelope Miriam handed to him, pressed his thumbprint over the signature, handed it to Bradley. Tell him that he must read this at once, before the meeting. But the Secretary General desires, the Secretary desires to see that letter. Young man, I am endowed with second sight. I prophesy that you won't be here tomorrow if you waste time getting it to him. Bradley said, Jim, take over, and left with the letter. Jubal sighed. He had sweated over that letter. Anne and he had been up most of the night preparing draft after draft. Jubal intended to arrive at an open settlement but he had no intention of taking Douglas by surprise. A man stepped forward in answer to Bradley's order. Jubal sized him up as one of the clever young men on the make who gravitate to those in power and do their dirty work. The man smiled and said, The name is Jim Sanforth, Doctor. I'm the Chief's press secretary. I'll be buffering for you from now on, arranging press interviews and so forth. I'm sorry to say that the conference is not ready. At the last minute, we've had to move to a larger room. It's my thought that it's my thought that we'll go to that conference room right now. Doctor, you don't understand. They are stringing wires and things. The room is swarming with reporters, and very well, we'll chat with them. No, Doctor, I have instructions. Youngster, you can take your instructions, fold them until they're all corners, and shove them in your oubliette. We are here for one purpose, a public conference. If the conference is not ready, we'll see the press in the conference room. But you're keeping the man from Mars standing on a windy roof. Harshaw raised his voice. Is there anyone smart enough to lead us to this conference room? Sanforth swallowed and said, Follow me, doctor. The conference room was alive with newsmen and technicians, but there was a big oval table, chairs, and several smaller tables. Mike was spotted, and Sanforth's protest did not keep the crowd back. 
Mike's flying wedge of Amazons got him to the big table. Jubal sat him against it with Dorcas and Jill flanking him and the fair witness and Miriam seated behind him. Then Jubal made no attempt to fend off questions or pictures. Mike had been told that people would do strange things and Jubal had warned him to take no sudden actions, such as causing persons or things to go away or stop, unless Jill told him to. Mike took the confusion gravely. Jill was holding his hand and her touch reassured him. Jubal wanted pictures, the more the better. As for questions, he did not fear them. A week of talking with Mike had convinced him that no reporter could get anything out of Mike without expert help. Mike's habit of answering literally and stopping would nullify attempts to pump him. Most questions Mike answered with, I do not know, or beg pardon. A Reuters correspondent, anticipating a fight over Mike's status as an heir, tried to sneak in his own test of Mike's competence. Mr. Smith, what do you know about the laws of inheritance? Mike knew that he was having trouble grokking the human concept of property, and in particular the ideas of bequest and inheritance. So he stuck to the book, which Jubal recognized as Eli on Inheritance and Bequest, Chapter 1. Mike recited what he had read with precision and no expression for page after page, while the room settled into silence and his interrogator gulped. Jubal let it go on, until every newsman there knew more than he wanted to know about dower and courtesy, consanguinian and uterine, per stirpes and per capita. At last, Jubal said, That's enough, Mike. Mike looked puzzled. There is more. Later. Does someone have a question on another subject? A reporter for a London Sunday paper jumped in with one close to his employer's pocketbook. Mr. Smith, we understand you like girls. Have you ever kissed a girl? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. How did you like it? Mike hardly hesitated. Kissing girls is a goodness, he explained. It beats the hell out of card games. Their applause frightened him. But he could feel that Jill and Dorcas were not frightened. They were trying to restrain that noisy expression of pleasure which he could not learn. So he calmed his fright and waited. He was saved from further questions and was granted a great joy. He saw a familiar figure entering by a side door. My brother, Dr. Mahmoud. Mike went on in overpowering excitement in Martian. The champion's semantician waved and smiled, answered in the same jarring language while hurrying to Mike. The two continued talking in unhuman symbols, Mike in eager torrent, Mahmoud not as rapidly, with sounds like a rhinoceros ramming a steel shed. The newsmen stood it for some time, those who used sound recording it and writers noting it as color. At last one interrupted. Dr. Mahmoud, what are you saying? Mahmoud answered in clipped Oxonian. For the most part I've been saying, slow down, my dear boy, do, please. And what does he say? The rest is personal, private, of no possible interest. Greetings, you know, old friends. He continued to chat in Martian. Mike was telling his brother all that had happened since he had last seen him so that they might grok closer. But Mike's abstraction of what to tell was Martian in concept, it being concerned primarily with new water brothers and the flavor of each, the gentle water that was chill, the depth of Anne, the strange, not yet fully grokked fact that Jubal tasted now like an egg, then like an old one, but was neither. The ungrokkable vastness of ocean, Mahmoud had less to tell, since less had happened to him by Martian standards. One Dionysian excess, of which he was not proud. One long day spent lying face down in Washington's Suleiman Mosque, the results of which he had not yet grokked and would not discuss. No new water brothers. He stopped Mike presently and offered his hand to Jubal. You're Dr. Harshaw. Valentine Michael thinks he has introduced me, and he has by his rules. Harshaw looked him over as he shook hands. Chap looked like a huntin shootin sportin Britisher from tweedy, expensively casual clothes to clipped grey moustache. But his skin was swarthy, and the genes for that nose came from somewhere near the Levant. Harshaw did not like fakes, and would choose cold corn pone over the most perfect syntho sirloin. But Mike treated him as a friend. So friend he was until proved otherwise. To Mahmoud, Harshaw looked like a museum exhibit of what he thought of as a yank, vulgar, 
dressed too informally for the occasion, loud, probably ignorant, and almost certainly provincial. A professional man, too, which made it worse, as in Dr. Mahmoud's experience, American professional men were undereducated and narrow, mere technicians. He held a vast distaste for all things American. Their incredible polytheistic babble of religions, their cooking, cooking, their manners, their bastard architecture and sickly arts, and their blind, arrogant belief in their superiority long after their sun had set. Their women, their women most of all, their immodest, assertive women with gaunt, starved bodies, which nevertheless reminded him disturbingly of Houris. Four of them crowded around Valentine Michael at a meeting which should be all male. But Valentine Michael offered these people, including these ubiquitous female creatures, offered them proudly and eagerly as his water brothers, thereby laying on Mahmoud an obligation more binding than that owed to the sons of one's father's brother, since Mahmoud understood the Martian term for such accretive relationships from observation of Martians, and did not need to translate it inadequately as catenative assemblage, nor even as things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. He had seen Martians at home. He knew their poverty by earth standards. He had dipped into and had guessed at far more of their cultural wealth, and grokked the supreme value that Martians placed on interpersonal relationships. Well, there was nothing else for it. He had shared water with Valentine Michael, and now he must justify his friend's faith in him. He hoped that these Yanks were not complete bounders. So he smiled warmly. Yes, Valentine Michael has explained to me, most proudly, that you were all in... Mahmoud used one word of Martian. To him. Nay. Eh? What a brotherhood. You understand? I grok it. Mahmoud doubted if Harshaw did, but went on smoothly. Since I am in that relationship to him, I must ask to be considered a member of the family. I know your name, Doctor, and I have guessed that this must be Mr. Caxton. I have seen your face pictured at the head of your column, Mr. Caxton. But let me see if I have the young ladies straight. This must be Anne. Yes, but she's cloaked. Yes, of course, I'll pay my respects to her later. Harshaw introduced him to the others. And Jill startled him by addressing him with the correct honorific for a water brother, pronouncing it three octaves higher than any Martian would talk, but with sore throat purity of accent. It was one of a dozen words she could speak out of a hundred odd that she was beginning to understand, but this one she had down pat because it was used to her and by her many times each day. Dr. Mahmoud's eyes widened. Perhaps these people were not mere uncircumcised barbarians. His young friend did have strong intuition. Instantly he offered Jill the correct honorific in response and bowed over her hand. Jill saw that Mike was delighted. She managed to croak the shortest of nine forms by which a water brother may return the response, although she did not grok it and would not have considered suggesting in English the nearest human biological equivalent, certainly not to a man she had just met. Mahmoud, who did understand it, took its symbolic meaning rather than its humanly impossible literal meaning and spoke rightly in response. Jill had passed her limit. She did not understand his answer and could not reply even in English. But she got an inspiration. At intervals around the table were water pitchers, each with its clump of glasses. She got a pitcher and tumbler, filled the latter. She looked Mahmoud in the eye, said earnestly, Water, our nest is yours. She touched it to her lips and handed it to Mahmoud. He answered in Martian, saw that she did not understand, and translated, Who shares water shares all. He took a sip and started to return it checked himself, and offered Harshaw the glass. Jubal said, I can't speak Martian, son, but thanks for water. May you never be thirsty. He drank a third of it. Ah! He passed it to Ben. Caxton looked at Mahmoud and said soberly, Grow closer. With water of life we grow closer. He sipped it and passed it to Dorcas. In spite of precedents already set, Dorcas hesitated. Dr. Mahmoud, do you know how serious this is to Mike? I do, miss. Well, it's just as serious to us. You understand? You grok? 
I grok its fullness, or I would have refused to drink. All right. May you always drink deep. May our eggs share a nest. Tears started down her cheeks. She drank and passed the glass hastily to Miriam. Miriam whispered, Pull yourself together, kid, then spoke to Mike. With water we welcome our brother, then added to Mahmoud, Nest, water, life. She drank. Our brother. She offered him the glass. Mahmoud drank what was left and spoke, but in Arabic. And if ye mingle your affairs with theirs, then they are your brothers. Amen, Jubal agreed. 